Okay, it is six o'clock. If I could have everybody quiet down. Um, before I read the formal remarks, I just want to welcome all of us back to um, reality and back in person. It is so good to be here. I'm going to ask for a little grace and patience because honestly, I have not chaired in person yet. So I anticipate I will make a few bobbles and a few mistakes. So I pre ask for forgiveness on that count. So, with that, good evening and welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the City of Independence, I welcome each of you in attendance as well as those of you who are watching the meeting on City 7. It is March 22nd, 2022, meeting of the Independence Planning Commission. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our meetings, it is the responsibility of this commission to hold public hearings and make recommendations to the Independence City Council on matters relating to zoning, and land use changes in the city. We also consider and make decisions on plats, special use permits, and other issues, as well as changes in codes, policies that relate to city planning. Our procedure is as follows. Okay. Sorry, I told you I was gonna bobble. Um, you know what, you don't have that first soul sheet up here for me. So, I'm going to welcome you all. We're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we're going to begin by having city take roll. Make sure we are all in attendance. Looks like we are, but let's do it. Commissioner Ferguson? Here. Commissioner Michelle? Here. Commissioner Nesbitt? Here. Commissioner Wiley? Here. Commissioner Young? Here. Commissioner Preston? Here. Chairman McLean? Yes, here. Thank you. Okay. Um, first, when we get to the point where we are presenting our cases, the applicant will be recognized to speak on behalf of their case, followed by anyone in attendance who wishes to speak in favor of the matter. Second, those who are in opposition who have questions regarding the case will be recognized to speak. I might add that if you have not signed up, please see Miranda up front to make sure that that is done. Then, if there is no opposition or questions from the public, the applicant will be allowed a rebuttal period to address those concerns or questions. Once the applicant is finished, the chair will declare the public hearing portion of the case closed and further comment from the public will not be recognized. At this point, the commissioners will have the opportunity to discuss the merits with each other. During this discussion, the commission reserves the right to ask questions of all parties involved. Finally, the commission will render a decision on the case. Because this is the only public hearing of the cases on the agenda tonight, all those who wish to speak will be heard. All comments and questions should be addressed to the chair, not directly to the applicant or the staff. The chair also recognizes the statements be kept brief and on point. And if that statement has already been made by a previous speaker, please do not repeat it. It simply indicate your agreement on the matter. Um, in addition to that, tonight, when we get to the North Point cases, because there are so many voices and we do want to hear everyone, we're going to, re to ask you to keep it to five minutes. And so the staff is gonna help me time that so I don't get lost in what you're saying, because sometimes I get lost in hearing and, and forget time. So they're going to time that for me. To expedite tonight's meeting, the chair asks that everyone who wishes to testify or believes that they might testify, please stand now and be sworn in. Those standing, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the whole truth before this commission? If so, please answer, I do. I do. 
Thank you. You may be seated. Okay. First item on our agenda is the consent agenda for the minutes. Does anybody have any changes? Or I would entertain a motion. Madam Chair. Commissioner Preston. Madam Chair. So moved. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Commissioner Wiley. The consent agenda has been moved and seconded. May we have a roll? <coughs> Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner M Mitchell? Michelle, yes. I'm sorry. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. And Chair McLean? Yes. Minutes have been approved. Thank you. Our next items, we have three cases that have been continued. So if I would love to have a motion to put all three together, if possible. It is case 22-125-04, rezoning PUD of 2351 South Hayden Street. Case 22-400-03, short-term rental. Case 22-400-04, Zero four, another short-term rental, and they have requested that these be continued until April 22nd, 2022. I would entertain April 12th. April, I'm so sorry. April 12th, 2022. Madam Chair. Commissioner Preston. I move as so stated. Second. Second. Commissioner Michelle. And we're ready for the vote. <clears throat> Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Chair McLean? Yes. The cases to be continued have been approved as one. Okay. Our first case for tonight is case number 22-150-02, Comprehensive Plan Amendment, Salem Drive and US 24 Highway. Staff, will you give us a report, please? Yes, uh, McBee Construction, uh, in conjunction with their uh, rezoning, which is the next case on the agenda, seeks to annex, excuse me, seeks to amend the comprehensive plan for some property that's on the north side 24 highway, just east, excuse me, just west of Salem, um, in the northwest, excuse me, northeast part of the city. You can see from the uh, uh, vicinity map its location it's that little bump out there that uh, was annexed in the city a number of years ago this is the current plan it shows that the site is owned uh, or is uh, designated for commercial uses because it was annexed into the city with the idea that they would have a, a grocery store and some other uh, retail uses there that never came to fruition um, so it's just been sitting since then uh, they seek to do a, a residential project at this location, so the uh, comprehensive plan will be changed from uh, commercial to neighborhood residential. You can see that by the uh, yellow area the, there versus the red area that's in this map. Uh, just south of this site is the Quick Trip, if you're familiar with that. Uh, on the, I guess it would be sort of the east corner, is another convenience store. <clears throat> that's in the county, uh, properties to the north and to the west are also in the county, which are residential uses. And this is their uh, preliminary development plan for their uh, upcoming action, uh, which is the next case. And uh, really, that's all we have at this point. There's really no history because it's only been in the city a few years. So it's only been comprehensive plan, so to speak, for just one, one uh, designation in that time period. In that time frame. Would the applicant like to come forward and talk about the project? Hi. Hi. Can you please state your name and address? Ashley Smith, 1203 East US 24 Highway, Independence, Missouri, 64050. Thank you. And I would just like to state that we do agree with this comprehensive plan. Okay. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions? Okay.
Is there anyone in, is there anyone you, else you would, you you're can fine. Sit. You can sit down. Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this project? Is there anyone who would, would oppose this project? Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Commissioners, do you have any questions for city? Oh, I'm so sorry. Are you sworn in? No. Ma'am, you need to come up to the podium. I'm so sorry. I retract that. I did not see you. No, no, no. Do you need her to sign it? Good. Um, Sandra Hall. And my address is 2022 Grove Circle, Independence, Missouri, 64058. Thank you. Thank you. And I live in the housing development right adjoining this. And, um, you know, they're wanting to put in, they call them townhomes, but they're basically duplexes. Ma Madam Chairman, this is about a comp plan change. Oh, I'm sorry. She's not uh, here about that. She's here oh. about the next case, which is the actual development project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Almost there, not quite. Okay, so I'm going to ask again just to make sure. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak for this project? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak against this project? Okay, the public hearing portion of this is really closed. <laughs> is there any questions or I would entertain a motion? Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Preston. It appears this matter is rather straightforward. Therefore, I'll move that in the matter of case number 22-150-02, comprehensive plan amendment be approved as presented. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. Okay, we are ready for a vote. <clears throat> Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Chair McLean? Yes. Case number 22-150-02 has passed. Thank you. Case 22-125-01, rezoning for Salem Drive and US 24 Highway, request by McBee Construction. Would the applicant like to come? I'm sorry, staff report. Yeah, I need a minute here to change case. Okay. Sorry, I got excited. You all are very quiet for a large crowd. I'm very impressed. I really am. I have six kids and they're not this quiet. Yes, McBee Construction seeks rezoning and preliminary development plan approval for some uh, property that's, again, north of uh, 24 Highway, uh, just uh, west of Salem Avenue, as you can see from the, photo from, the air from the vicinity map, its location. This is the aerial photograph that shows the, the site. Uh, that is Quick Trip just immediately south of the road there. On the bottom of the screen, there is a uh, convenience store there on the, I guess it's sort of the east corner of the property. Uh, this site's been vacant. Part of it's uh, been uh, uh, farmed or cropped in the past. There's a single family homes around the, the west side and the north side and also the east side. Uh, there's some typical commercial uses along 24 Highway. Uh, this is the... Uh, area again that was going to be a, a supermarket among some other real, real retail uses in, uh, a few years ago. It never occurred. Um, the properties that surrounded on the three sides, north, west, and uh, east, are in the county. Uh, the city has uh, discussed this case with the county uh, public works department. They've provided some information about their, uh, 
their feelings on improvements to Salem Road. <clears throat> this is the surrounding zonings. Again, you can see the parts that are not colored are in the, uh, are in the uh, just natural photographs. Uh, they're not in the city, so they're not, uh, there's not, no zoning for them. Um, again, this is the sort of the purplish uh, pink there is actually C2 zoning. To the south is uh, C1, and immediately, well, sort of to the southeast is C1, and then directly to the south is uh, the Quick Trip, which is uh, C2 also. This is a comprehensive plan as it was before you just voted to recommend it be amended. Uh, again, that was for a commercial use. This is the preliminary plat for the, for the project. You can see it has one road connection onto Salem Drive in the northeast corner of the site. It's a loop drive, comes in, circles, and goes back out. Really, with this preliminary plat, there's only two lots, the outside lot that encircles the, uh, uh, the loop road and then the inside lot, which is lot two, that includes all the properties that will be inside of the road. <clears throat> There's two uh, detention basins that are planned in the northwest corner and then also in the center of the site. This is the development plan. These are all duplex units, uh, basically uh, covering all the uh, all fronting onto the interior roads. There's no uh, duplexes that front onto Salem. And the, uh, on the south is uh, Old Salem, old, excuse me, Old Lexington Road, which is in the process of being vacated. Uh, you can see from the pictures in a little bit here that you can see why it was vacated. This is the landscape plan. Again, it's a pretty basic uh, trees, street trees and some uh, buffering along the... Uh, West property line, I believe. Okay, this is the rendering of the duplex proposed by the applicant. Uh, it's a two-story, single-car garage. Uh, the photograph on the right is actually the uh, artificial stone, a rock. I'm not sure what the term is exactly they plan to use. It's a kind of a gray color uh, that will also match the color of the building itself. And this uh, rock will uh, go along, will go on the sides of the unit, right around the garage, up to the uh, up to the roofs. This is the way that these uh, buildings are shaped, as far as uh, the elevations. This one's not correct in respect that it doesn't have the rock shown on it, but the other other elevations are correct. Okay, here we're looking south down Old Lexington Road. Uh, it's been neglected for years. Um, I think that's why the city didn't annex it in when they annexed this uh, property where the grocery store was going to be and left that piece out. It's going to be annexed in and then vacated. We're in the process of doing that right now. I understand in, in years past they've had some trouble with the truckers parking up and down this road, as you can see that one. They just sleep there or whatever overnight or leave the truck there. And uh, it, it, three times I've been out there, there's been trucks there twice and once not. <clears throat> Here on Old Lexington, we are looking back to the west at the Quick Trip, which sits up on a higher elevation. Um, probably familiar with that. And then here we're on Old Lexington again. We're looking due east towards... Salem, which is off in the distance there. Um, right now, like I said, it's uh, basically an open field. Uh, the part that's on the furthest away that's sort of on the right side of the field, which is green, uh, that has been cropped in years gone by, but not this year so far. Here we're looking to the, uh, I guess it would be the northeast. All the directions are a little bit off here because they're sideways at uh, single-family homes that back up to this site that are in the county. Okay, here we're on Salem Drive, which is on the other side of the project. Uh, looking back towards Quick Trip, as you can see off there in the distance along with that truck, uh, again, this is the area that was uh, cropped or used for hay production in the past. This is the piece that, this is the road 
way that's directly across from the site. Uh, basically, we're standing in the middle of the right-of-way where the, the new street will come from Salem to be a loop road to come out. It's designed to tee out into this, into this uh, across from the street here. Here we're looking to the south, uh, uh, up, excuse me, looking north up Salem Drive. You can see the residential structures there on the left, single-family homes. And there's also some single-family homes to the right. Further down this road, there's a, there's a number of duplexes here as well. Here we're looking uh, south down Salem Drive. Uh, that's 24 Highway. Off in the distance, there's a traffic light there. Another convenience store that was uh, uh, here right here on this corner has been there many years. And this is on 24 Highway, looking at the convenience store, the app, uh, applicant's property is to the left. Uh, you can see that where that uh, Salem comes out at the light down there. Uh, it's pretty typical for the uh, ground to hear it. It's uh, kind of brushy along the roads and then harvested in parts of it. Okay, staff does recommend approval of this uh, rezoning and preliminary development plan with the following conditions. <clears throat> the properties must be properly platted, excuse me, replatted through the vinyl plat process in conjunction with approval of the engineering plans for public improvements. Two is the front setbacks of the building shall utilize varying setbacks of 20, 25, and 30 feet with a maximum of three buildings in a row using not uh, maximum of three buildings in a row using the same setback. All set max must be shown on the final development plan. Number three is the map maximum rear setbacks for buildings around the perimeter property shall be 20 feet. There's no required setbacks for buildings interior to the circle drive. The rear building line must be eliminated. The minimum distance between buildings shall be at least 12 feet. In addition to the walking trail on the south part of the site, provide another project amenity such as a picnic area or, or dog park amenities. The applicant must work with the city and Jackson County to ensure that the existing stormwater management system, including detention basins, meet both entities' requirements. Number three, excuse me, number six is between buildings 17 and 18. Provide a small pull-in parking lot for three or four spaces to be used for temporary parking to reduce parking on the streets. Seven is with the final development plan, provide a tree preservation landscape plan for the project showing new plantings and how the existing tree lines along the north and east sides of the site um, will be retained or improved. A landscape feature must be added around the central detention basin show on the plans and then the street names and addresses will be assigned during the final development stage. All done? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, would the applicant please come forward? If you'd state Good your evening. name and address, please. Uh, Stephen McBee, 1203 US 24 Highway, 64050. There you go. Got it? You want me to repeat it? Um, yes, please. Okay, it's Steve McBee, 1203 US 24 Highway, uh, 64050, Independence, Missouri. Thank you. You bet. Um, tell us anything you would like us to know about the project, and then um, we'll ask your questions. Yeah, so first off, it's a... Uh, it's gonna be a, a private development that is retained by us, a maintenance-free community. We're doing that, so my partner and I, who is also here, we're doing that so that we can, you know, I, I have rentals and independence, as everybody knows, it's no secrets. Well, when you have single family residents and you have the, the tenants take care of the lawn themselves, you get some really well-maintained people and you get people that won't even mow their own lawn and you know henceforth I'm in code compliance because they won't mow their own lawn so we decided on this project and another project that we're looking at that since we're long-term owners that we want to do all the maintenance maintenance provided we can keep the property values uh, up 
you know, keep the properties up, take care of all the maintenance, mowing, everything. So we, were, we met with the city, we met with the fire department, we had really good collaboration with both. Uh, actually took the, uh, the fire department, they wanted to, we were gonna keep the other road open just for access and they're the ones that recommended they would like that shut down since there's only 39 units that they would rather not see a through road where people flying through the neighborhood. So as we put our walking trail, our green space and everything, that the kids would be, you know, they could play, they could still walk the quick trip or a little general if they like, but that we wouldn't have a high flow traffic trying to cut through the neighborhood. So henceforth why we have the circle drive and uh, and then we're gonna, as you, you've seen earlier where the, the semis park, it's pretty much public parking. There's a lot of trash dumped all the time. You go out there today, there's tons of mattresses, couches. It ends up being a dump site because it's a dead end road. Anybody can pull down there. Um, so that being eliminated, I thought was a great idea from the fire department. And then as we met with the city and, and worked with them, uh, you know, adding, it adds green space there as well. So I thought that was a, a good decision on their behalf as well. So, um, you know, we're using uh, like 65% masonry product on the front, along with some vinyl siding, very modern looking, well kept, color coordinated, uh, lots of curb appeal, very aesthetically pleasing, so to speak. So it, it'll be a very nice addition when, you know, our crews mow it, they, they handle everything. Obviously, it'll be, and it's already annexed now by the city, so the roads will be taken care of by, you know, snow removal, et cetera. But as far as all the properties, everything will be included with with our rents, that way we can, you know, for future tenants, we can upkeep values and, and not be, you know, one good, one bad, or three good and one bad, you know, spoils the whole deal. So that's kind of our um, our business model, our business plan that we are gonna do here in, in another location and super excited about it. We have a, a very good um, rental management company that we own that's not, we don't outsource everything we do, we do ourselves. so it's all in-house. I'm from Independence. Um, most people know, but so um, at any rate, we're, we're here, we're local. Um, both myself and my partner own construction companies. There's, we, you know, there's nothing that we can't, we don't do uh, as far as scope of work that we can't handle on our own. So it, it makes it a very good project when they're not out of state owners that, you know, you try to call three different corporate numbers, you never get a live person or live body. We're, we, we drive by there every day, we're there all the time. So it's something that we would be active active participation in the ownership. Thank you. That was very, very comprehensive. That was good. Um, okay, we will. Question. Sure. It, it appears that you intend to retain ownership and these would be rental units. That is correct. What would be the impediments to you deciding to liquidate ownership and begin selling? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we don't have any, we want to grow our portfolio. And, and, and forgive me, the reason for that question was exactly what you presented, yeah. the retention of So we're standards. local. We both have young men or young children, not young, but young men that are going to hopefully be involved in the, they are involved now in the businesses and will continue to be. So we have a succession plan, so to speak, both of us. And so we want to have long-term ownership and build our, um, our portfolios in this area, you know, Independence Blue Springs area, because our businesses are all local as well. So that way, you know, instead of trying to go to some other city or, you know, where we're, we're subbing everything out, we can handle the work ourselves and manage these, so. But this is a highly sought after property. Market values of escalating. Tremendous. What's the impediment to selling? or begin selling? Well, I, I guess the point we, I, I could say is that I own a lot of properties now and I get about 17 phone calls a day and I haven't sold any of them. So uh, my plan is uh, um, long-term retention and, and not that I ever plan on retiring, I enjoy work, but if that day ever comes, I mean, you know, to continue to own those properties here local where I live so that, you know, for, you know, both to pass on to the next generation as well as have retirement funds. I've not looked at the plottage but is each building on its own plot or is it still one large parcel of land with buildings? I think we talked about individualizing those lots, those tracks, correct? No, it's not shown that way. It's not shown that way. So yeah, so the answer to that question would be, oh, my apologies, I didn't know that is that, yeah, it's one large plot. Okay. Yeah. I think that answers my okay. 
substantial bit of my question. Thank you. Appreciate the questions. As a follow-on follow to your question, if you were to liquidate, you would have to liquidate the property at mass. It would not be, you couldn't, you know, Without changing off. something else, that would be, yes, for sure, because if the deed of trust is that way, it would be an all or nothing, which would be to the advantage of future owners, if there was future owners, that they would do the same business model. They would have one organization would buy them all, not be able to segment them off. Okay. I've got some more questions, yeah. Madam Chair, if I could continue. Sure. Um, and some of this might be a little bit for uh, city staff as well. Um, the report, <coughs> uh, the staff report says that there is, should be landscape feature around the central detention basin. Um, there's nothing mentioned for any sort of landscaping abutting the, the one that is to, let me get my bearings here, to, large, to the northeast, nor, northwest, um, which does have visibility to the central roadway. Is there a reason why we're not doing any sort of landscaping or screening of that basin on the northwest? If that was uh, omitted, that was omitted by air, well, you could make that uh, a part of your recommendation, okay. add that into your recommendation. Okay. Um, the other thing that was mentioned as part of the conditions of the, um, the approval, recommended approval, would be uh, another amenity, have you, has your group thought any further about what that amenity might be and where it might be located? Yeah, so it would be, so yes, it would be uh, toward the center and like with the dry detention basin where we would incorporate, obviously with the walking trail, like a dog, a dog park area, uh, like a gr more green space that would be uh, picnic tables, kind of a, a playground type area, uh, if you will, that has a dog park. In the middle. Yeah. Okay. And then... I'd have to look at this because we, once this annex passed, we were talking about the green space between us and Quick Trip. Mm -hmm. You know, that road would be removed, so it would no longer be a dump site. How we would handle that as far as that green space. That's not the green space you're talking about, though. That's, that's No, that's south. not what we're talking about. But out upon annexation, which got approved tonight, and the road will be removed, then we'll, we'll look at that space and see what. Will that road be part of your property, or is that something you would have to obtain? Well, after the city annexes it and it's vacated, they will obtain the north part, and basically the Quick Trip will obtain the south part. Okay. Which obviously Quick Trip is a rock star neighbor. I mean, they, yeah. they take very well, you know, good care of that. So. Speaking of the amenity space within the, the middle uh, detention area, that, that large green space, um, your walking trail and the sidewalk system does not already extend back there. Would it be your intention to extend that as part of the amenity? for access between? I think we were going to make sure the annex got through tonight and look at how we were going to tie everything out. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of synergy with us and the city and working together. We're open to input and how, you know, we want to be a good neighbor. And so um, how that works and how that ties out will be, you know, moving forward from here. We'll come up with a comprehensive plan to to make those, you know, meet everything and, and make every, you know, kind of work with the team to figure that out. Okay. So the, the commission will have an opportunity then to, will we see the final? No, final actually plan? the com commission does not see the final development plan. Okay. Can we, could we make a stipulation that any amenity space would have proper access given to it? Sure. Yeah. You could make that part of your motion. Okay. Um, you mentioned you will be self-performing the facility that is or the, the maintenance aspect maintenance provided aspect um where are you where's your offices located how how quickly could you respond if there was a so we're right on 24 highway 1203 24 highway and then uh, my partner is just off of blue mills road i won't i mean he his his business is part of his residence so i won't tell his address just in case he's got any fans so and then you, you also mentioned rental management is done in-house. Correct. You've got, you got a, group, a separate group, but it's still part of your overall company. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, the last question I think I have is, have you done this before? Is this a, a model that you've executed on before, either in Independence or elsewhere? No. 
I have not. Um, I, I've had a lot of different real estate as far as uh, multifamily assets. Uh, at one time, we had 15 multifamily assets all over from St. Louis to Kansas City. Um, but as uh, rental properties here in Independence were mostly single family or duplexes that, you know, they come up for sale, buy them. So they were one-offs, so to speak. And so dealing with all the experience and problems we've dealt with in the past. That's why we decided that we wanted to be in control of maintenance and control control our own neighborhood so we can keep the property values up. Obviously, you know, you have a, a very aesthetically pleasing project. You get better tenants. They have better jobs. They, you don't have to collect rent as bad, you know, all those things, you know, go together. Is there, so that's kind of what we looked at on, on these projects of how we could, you know, make it a cleaner, better long-term project. Understood. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Any other questions before we ask um, the general public? I have a few questions. Uh, Steve, you got a uh, price of 1400 a month, what you guys estimating for rental? Yeah, so that was going to be, we had looked at that, and I seen that on there, and that was actually on, it's probably, I was talking to another gentleman here tonight, but, it's, it's depending on like how the how they lay out a two bedroom to three bedroom unit, they would run between seven seventy five and twelve hundred. So, oh, you're yeah. gonna go down. You're gonna go down. Yeah, we're gonna go down. Yeah. I, I just because fourteen seemed low to me for a three bedroom place. No, I mean if you look at the comps in that area, I mean I have a lot of of, of rental properties in that mm -hmm. even area on Eighteenth Street. Um, actually, uh, yeah. So we, I mean, we're, I know what that brings but yeah so i mean depending on you know where where we're included and so every, we utilities are uh individual to each townhome each unit okay. so they will pay all their own utilities um, we looked at even including utilities because we're building the building envelope so energy efficient you, you know we were talking about well we, if we can put in programmable thermostats we could control all that and include the utilities but we, I've, we've, I've seen that, we've done some research on it and people were really upset when they couldn't, if they're cold in the winter and they want their heat to 75 instead of 72, it won't go above 72. So we just thought, you know what, let them, let's, let's put, you know, individual gas, water, sewer, you know, to every unit and let them pay their own utilities. That way we're not trying to manage that as well. So that. Okay. Well, that's fine with me. Uh, my other question is probably gonna be to the staff uh, how wide are the streets? I can't read them. They're too small for re me to read. Are they? Will they accommodate parking on both sides of the street with well, a fire truck to go between them? It's a typical residential street of 28 feet back to back of curb. Okay. Um, we encouraged them or made a condition of approval to put some additional parking spaces there because we know sometimes these uh, places they have a lot of visitors and they get cars on the street a lot. Well, but, yeah, we've never had any issues with the fire department saying that, I mean, just like any other residential streets in the city, that's a typical se uh, section. Well, I've been to a couple of these places like these want to build, and they're parking on both sides of the street, and I can barely get my truck through them trying to get a fire truck through. That's why I want to make sure the street's going to be wide enough. Even if we got to have another two feet added, it might be better. I mean, that's something I would like to have recommended, that the street be wide enough for two cars parked on it, even two full-size trucks, plus the fire truck to go between, because I think that's going to become a problem in this type of area. Because I have seen it, and I have been through several of them around this area. So I'd recommend that, our, that we adjust the streets to be a little wider. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, the fire department has been involved in this, in this development and the things that you guys have already been discussing, has that been brought up or a concern? Not that I recall. Thank you. Do we have any other duplex areas like this that's a circle drive around it? It's one way in, one way out? Okay, sir. Okay. It's not, we have to stay with the protocol, please. I, I, off okay. the cuff, I just can't think of any. It doesn't mean they don't exist. I just don't know. Okay. Well, that's a question I have. Good questions. Okay, let's do this. Let's um, go to public opinion. And so you can sit down, and then I'll call you back up if we need answers to questions. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you. Okay. 
Is there anyone who is in favor of this case? I'm going to take my time so I don't miss anybody. Is there anyone who is opposed to this case? Okay, you come up first. Since I messed you up last time, please state your name and address again. Um, Sandra Hall, and um, I live at 2022 Grove Circle, Independence, Missouri, 64058. I am in the zip code, besides, you know, the 64050 is not in our area there. Um, my problem is, is there's 39 dwellings, which then calculates into 78 individual homes then, or, you know, places for people to live. Um, that's 78 extra cars if only one person in that house drives. Most people are going to have to be younger that live in these because they, all the bedrooms are upstairs. There's no bedroom downstairs, so people... You know, I'm getting to the age. I don't like running up and down steps to go to bed. So, you know, there's no basements there that's just going to be, you know, younger people. So if you calculate two homes, two people working in a home, that's 156 extra cars coming onto our Salem Drive that there's only right there at that stoplight. That is not a very big, you know, in the mornings and evenings, that's a lot of traffic for all of us trying to get to work in the mornings. Yeah, besides all the children, the extra kids, it's gonna be right there. That's not a very big area. And I wish I would have brought pictures of the duplexes that are around. The, there's duplexes, that first road to the north of this location is all duplexes right there. You drive down that road, there's probably four or five cars per, per unit. There's on the street, like you said, they're, they're everywhere and it looks horrible. The right beside Quick Trip, that's nothing but duplexes, and it looks terrible. We just, my home is $320,000. I would like my property value to, con, to keep up there. Well, one day I might wanna move. I, I don't want to keep lowering my property value. And if they do, only rent for 700 to 1200, and I don't mean this in a rude way, my neighbors rent next door, and their rent is $1,600 a month. So now you're checking out. Uh, it's just not what I think we need. If they were individual homes, and they were going to sell them and add to our property value, I'd be all for it. Um, I appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I know you've seen some of us scribbling. We have pads of paper up here, so what we try to do is formulate the question, no, you're fine, okay. to formulate the questions for you so that we can ask the proper department or the city or have the applicant back up, come back up and answer your questions. So if you see us scribbling, that is what we're doing. Okay, is there anybody else who would like to speak? In opposition, okay. You're next. Who is? Ladies first. Ladies first, you're correct. I apologize, I'm at that awkward stage where I can't see far and I can't see close. It's terrible. It's really annoying. My name, Jennifer Burke, oh, sorry. Jennifer Burke, 1916 North Concord Road, Independence, Missouri, 64058. Thank you. Um, I also live in Salem East. Um, there are several of us here that are opposed to this. Most of us probably will not talk. Um, we're, as she said, the traffic, property value, um, too many houses for the location, the size of the lot. We want to know how the county and the city is going to work. Say if they call 911, county going to respond or is the city? Um, as well as the children's safety along that 24 highway, if they back up against it, there's nothing. I mean, if a fence, hopefully we'll keep the kids out of the... Um, highway as well as the drainage area that they have going. Um, with, with no basements, I was wondering if there was going to be a tornado shelter for these people if something was to happen. Um, and then, if it's possible, can I ask all those in, opposed to it to stand so you guys can see how many are opposed? No, it's all right there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, next. Excuse me, my name is Mike Pollard. Um, I live at 1817 North Dover Street in Salem East Subdivision. My home, um, I've lived there for about 35 years. I'm a lifelong resident of the Independence area. Um, I look at this as, as a, a good and bad proposal. The, the good part that I see is they're, they're going to get rid of that street that's always been a problem since we moved in there 35 years ago. Um, it's always been abused. It's, it's been everything that they've described it as. I'm in favor of, of the, the master plan of going to residential. I'm not at all in favor of the proposal that they've made for a number of reasons. Um, my background and education is that of an architect and urban planner. Uh, the term highest and best use is often thrown around a lot in commission meetings. Um, the, the, those, that's a relative term that sometimes means different thing to the developer than it means to the residents of the area. In this case, I think the highest and best use for their bottom line is as what is proposed. That's not, I don't think you'll find a resident in that area that supports this proposal. You know, this land was annexed <clears throat> um, with the city support for a price chopper going in there. Uh, I was in support of that because I thought, not all the residents were, but I thought that would add value to our home and add convenience to our neighborhood. Um, that didn't happen, not just because the developer just upped and walked away. You know, it got caught up in a lot of things going on within the city. The city initially supported that. And then when Cosentino's made noise about pulling out, then it, at least my perception is it got very political and the city of Independence reversed its position on supporting that. And so the city withdrew their support for that. So we, the residents of Salem East, were left with an adjoining property that we had no control over that we were up to the whim of whoever came in and bought it. Now, there have been a lot of talks about what could go in there, what could not go in there. I'm 100% in favor of residential. I'm 100% opposed to what they uh, have proposed. If you look in the neighborhood, the predominance, the highest and best use of that whole area, there's one block that's got duplexes on it. It's the most unattractive, the most abused, and if you check the, the police records, it's the most it's where most of the calls in the whole Salem East subdivision go is that 18th stretch of 18th Terrace. Um, you know, they talk about their high quality materials, but, you know, I'm an architect. I think of high quality materials as not being vinyl siding and fake stone. That's not what I uh, call quality materials. Um, I, I think th if they wanted to go in, if they wanted to own it, and I'm not convinced that they are in it for the long term. And there's nothing that stops them from parceling these as individual parcels, even though it's platted as one plat now. There's nothing that stops them from doing that without replatting the property and then just selling them it off. He even spoke about rental properties that they used to own. You know, I don't envision this as a long-term commitment. I envision it as something that's going to benefit them, and then when it's gone, then those of us that have lived, you know, I've lived there 35 years, those of us that have invested in those homes, it's going to affect all of our property values, whether it's maintained as a one, one parcel or not. It, it's going to be rental properties. It's single single car garage. There are not really too many upscale attached living units that are single car garage. They're all double car garage. They all have, you know, um, they all have something that attracts people that are, a, a, you know, willing to invest a little bit more. <clears throat> so I, I can't think of a single reason that I would support this, uh, but I can think of a lot of reasons to not support it. I, I won't go into the traffic issues. I agree with what's been said before but it will do nothing but hurt the value of the property owners 
to the west, to the east, and to the south, or to the north, excuse me. Um, and, you know, it's just a fact that renters don't care as much about keeping things up as what homeowners do. And if you drive around that area and you look at the single-family dwellings all, all around, you know, I'm not going to say without exception they're all maintained, but they're all maintained much better than what that row of duplexes is. So um, I, I just don't think it's going to benefit anybody except them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who is opposed to this project? Is there anyone here who would like to speak for this project? All right, seeing none, I'm going to use the gavel for the first time. It scares me to death as much as it scares everybody else. I'm going to close this portion of the public meeting. That was a baby tap, I know. I told you. <laughs> Scary. Um, so, commissioners, if you have any questions uh, of the applicant or the city. Yeah, the applicant usually gets opportunity for rebuttal. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I told you. My other bobble. Thank you. First of all, I want to say that I certainly appreciate all their concerns and they definitely have value and, and I'm going to take that under consideration. But I would like to say that if, if you would, uh, you. if you would, I, and I appreciate uh, the gentleman's skill set and uh, knowledge of architecture and, and mat building materials, but I would say that if you would, you know, I would, I would disagree that this will actually increase the property value. As you look at the, that location that's set there flighted for so long with the, the trash and everything that gets put there, the piles of brush, everything, and then you take a development like ours that would, the product that we're putting in there, um, and, and by all means, uh, I want to tread lightly as I, I want to be careful. Am I, am I trying to belittle anyone or say anything I'm saying from apples to apples perspective? You could drive through that all the, the whole Salem East neighborhood, even the the newer there's a newer area in the back, and I would say that you could liken our product of material, building material and construction, to or better. I would also disagree that when he's talking about a single car garage on any kind of townhome, I mean you could do studies from from across the nation on single car garage and square footage and places for that. Um, we, you know, we are on the high end of all of that. So I understand um, their concerns on that uh, as far, but I will say that we are, these things are beautiful. I mean, you cut to the chase. I mean, if you go look at the colors of the grays, the modern, the, the, the brick, the, you know, I know he said he don't like the fake stone, but to get the colors and the texture and everything to match like it does, they look great. And we're not just putting up you know, vinyl siding duplexes. These these look like townhomes that you would see uh, in the nicest areas in Nashville, or and so on and so forth. Um, so that that would be my rebuttal to the uh, to talking about the actually aesthetics or cosmetic of the uh, building. And then, as far as traffic flow, we went through the traffic. I mean, we could have tried to squeeze more units in. We we back we we. Worked with the city, uh, like I said, lots of synergy there. We, we went down to the units instead of trying to get the maximum out, trying to apply for like a PUD where we could have no setbacks. We followed every recommendation on the city. And then as far as traffic coming in and out of Salem Drive, you know, there were some concerns about that, and I appreciate those concerns. So the line of sight, you can see when you're pulling out of our neighborhood, like MoDOT has a, a, a minimum line of sight, say of like 485 feet, where you can see a thousand or 1500 feet down to the north and then you see all the way to the stoplight to the right. So it's not like there's a curve coming in to where they make that entrance. And so I just wanted to address that as well, that those concerns have been uh, discussed, talked about, and on, on it with the entirety of everybody, just so everyone knows. But again, I appreciate the comments and concerns that they have. So thank okay. you. You can stay up here because I'm sure we have questions. Question. Commissioner Michelle. Um, and some of this will be for you and some of this will be for city staff. Um, first one for city staff, um, previous projects that we've looked at, 
even in my short time on the commission, um, have uh, a request has been made by the city that the materials and the color palettes are different from unit to unit. Is that a is that something that's been discussed, or would be that be a benefit? Uh, you could make that part of your recommendation. I, I don't know that we discussed it, but uh, you could. Uh, we did come up with the thing with the altering setbacks, mm -hmm. uh, fashioned after another project here in town. But uh, we didn't do anything about the, uh, you know, changing colors every other building or anything like that. Is that something that you would be open to, or does that ruin your economy of scale? In I'm sorry. Can you uh, repeat that would question? Would you be open to changing the color palette between units to something that? Provide a little more visual variety. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure we would. Um, any, I, I mean, yeah, we kind of like the whole since it's one unit, we like that. But I mean, it it the cost is the same. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, you know, so I I would be open to that for sure. If, I don't know, I don't know that that's maybe something we could discuss as a commission um, when, during that part um, <clears throat> to address the question on the amount of traffic and amount of cars. Um, I, could, I can see that with 78 units, there could be 156 cars associated with this development. Has, is, is there a threshold that the city looks at for traffic study being required? Well, uh, this particular case, uh, because the traffic comes out onto Salem, which is in the county, we talked to them, we sent this project over to them. They responded with what they wanted, where the driveway, where the street was going to line up with the other street. Uh, site distance, uh, site triangles, so forth, they didn't say anything about a traffic study. So we did not request so, one. So since it's county county road, they've got jurisdiction. That is correct. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I believe the answer is straightforward. 911 was mentioned. I'm assuming since this is city property. That sure, you would. Uh, they'd the answer a, a police or fire call here just like they would a quick trip or okay. anything else there. Um, and this was a comment I also I had for you. There was a question about tornado shelter and safety. Now, the staff report says these are slab on grade with a single garage. That is correct. The, the plans in, in this package shows an unfinished basement. Is What is your intent? Yes, they were slab on grade. Okay. There was a lot of different dirt fill out there in the way we thought that, you know, um, that would be conducive to that. Dirt and excavation would be slab on grade. Is there any concerns from the city's standpoint? Well, we have other projects around the city that don't have basements. Uh, in the only place that I, I can recall that we do require there be a storm shelter or whatever, that sort of thing is in mobile home parks. Otherwise, we don't require them in subdivisions of any sort. Thank you for that clarification. And then th this is also for city staff. Um, being that we, this is a, par a parcel that's between um, single-family residential, by and large, and commercial corridor, um, is there any benefit as far as from a planning standpoint that the city sees as having a, a slightly higher density development here as a buffer to that single-family? Is, is, is that come into your thinking at all? Well, you see that uh, a lot of times where there'll be... Uh, you know, uh, businesses along a corridor, and then right behind them is apartments, and then it goes to single family. This is a little bit different, but uh, yeah, you could look at that as a kind of a segue between commercial and 24 highway and the residential properties to the north. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all I have, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Preston. Madam Chair. Yes. Staff. Did we have a similar size parcel with a similar number of units anywhere in the city? Uh, that's a tough one. I don't know that I can answer that right off the cuff. I'm sorry. I have to do a little research on it. There's probably similar projects. I, I just can't think of any right now. I'm sorry. Nothing. Nothing comes to mind. Brian, can you think of anything? Well, uh, Brian mentioned Country Middle South, which is on Lee Summer Road, right on our southern limits. I think the density is a little less there, but the concept is sort of the same, you know, uh, complete maintenance of the, of the surrounding ground, but the units in Country Meadows are actually owned by the people that are buying the units. Uh, they can't do that here because the units are not divided off into individual 
But, and Country Middle is actually a, a bigger than this project and designed differently. So, nothing I could think of right offhand, no, I'm sorry. Perhaps I'm missing it, but that community area, playground, swings, whatever, where, where is it? Is it in here? Am I just missing it? It's just, that's the detention basin. It would go in the dry detention. Yeah, they're going to use that part. They're going to, to use the dry out. detention. That's not uncommon because a lot of baseball fields, soccer fields, things like that are built in floodplain areas. Because they figure there's not going to be anybody out there when it's raining or in flooding, but right. otherwise it's usually nice and flat and uh, available for use. So okay. it's that's not that unusual. Okay. Madam Chair, you're back. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, would it be feasible if you guys would put two car parking driveways wide? Is that I think something? that uh, we could look at anything to look at that. Um, I mean, I'm just trying to get the cars off the street. Right. I know that's going to be a problem. I, I, I can tell you that for sure. How would that work with the green space, Stuart? I guess uh, to answer that question, like with that, the yard wise, is that going to leave? Well, I think uh, the, the 12 feet between buildings is really not that much different from a residential area of single family right. where we have five feet to side property lines. So here we actually have 12 feet instead of 10 feet behind single family homes. So I think the driveways could be widened to accommodate a double car. Uh, you wouldn't project beyond, the, I don't think you'd project beyond the uh, sides of the building. So it could be possible. Right. I was just trying to think aesthetically. I want some green in front of the port, like on the sides. I mean, so we could widen that. I just wanted to see grass, not all concrete right to the building. I think that makes it look more. I, that's just my personal opinion. We could. Steve, I see that, but I was looking at your drawing here. You put them on the sides where you have the, because if not, they're going to be driving on the grass because they're going to be parking there so people can get in and out because that is going to happen. I know that's how. Yeah, we could certainly look at that. I mean, I'm not. So is it not? I'm not the concrete guy, so my partner is, so he can handle that. Is it not basically a two-car? Because I'm looking at the picture, so you could park inside. Is there enough room on the outside to get another car? Yes, it side? is two-car. If you parked one in the garage, you'd have one. Yeah, so there, there's two-car parking at every location. One in the garage, one in the drive. So, Thank you. Yeah. So if you went to, if you went to Excuse two-car. Excuse me. Excuse me. Stay quiet, children. Gavel. Stay quiet. Gavel. Quiet, please. Um, so the downside would be adding adding two car driveway, two car capacity driveway per unit would add some get some cars off the street potentially, but is also going to, to your point, feel like the entire development is paved. Well, when you're looking at the front from the curb appeal from from the elevation, you're going to be mm -hmm. looking. It's going to be concrete essentially as wide as the, the unit itself. As wide as the units. Yeah, so like the green space in the middle. How far is the distance on the, uh, off there from, to the front of the building, to the front of the garage door from there? It's going to vary based on your setback. Because yeah, I'm just, you know, obviously you're not going to get two crew cab trucks in the driveway, no. but if you had two small cars, you know, you'd have, you, is there enough for two? Um, Mr. Walquist, would you uh, identify yourself, please? Robert Walquist with Quist Engineering. Uh, An address, please. 821 uh, Northeast Columbus, Lee Summit, Missouri. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the units are actually like 30 feet off the actual curb, so they have plenty of room for a car. Now, what we could do is maybe come in, because the city has a requirement you can't go more than so many feet uh, wide on the curb cut itself. So we could come in and then have a uh, auxiliary parking on the side, like a 10 foot stall on the side. But I would suggest maybe every other unit, you know, like every building, like every other one, just have a requirement instead of every one. Because sometimes as they're going around a cul-de-sac or something, you can't get those in um, on all of those units. But that would be a compromise, at least then 50% of them would have an auxiliary parking stall for, you know, and then if we could eliminate the 
uh, parking lot that Stewart, I think that would help. Because they're gonna, I mean, theoretically, they'll probably park a quick trip if it's uh, so Be sure to speak in the mic. Oh, sorry. So that would presumably increase rental rates for those that do have additional parking. Um, but maybe. Yeah. That's for him to decide. So essentially what you'd be asking for is that we would be able to fit three, maybe four cars per unit because the garage is already there to, to hold a unit. Then you have a 30 foot driveway, which any crew cab can, you know, you know, one ton truck would fit in if you had a smaller car. So if we put that in, that'd be basically three parking spots per unit, not counting the additional parking spots we were going to put in to help with the city up here between units 17 and 18 because we were going to fit, you know, so like if there was overflow parking, we were going to make all those parking spots as well just to help alleviate what his concerns are. So I just, I just want to be clear on what I think there may be so little bit of confusion on how many, how many vehicles can park at each, at each unit right now at each townhome. How many parking spots did you say? I'm sorry. Well, currently, as designed and as we're trying to uh, work through this evening, there are, there are two, one of those being the garage and the second being a 30-foot driveway, which is more than even, like, we, like on our setbacks, we're even two feet further than single-family residential. So we've already shrunk that down Steve, to accommodate. What's the size of the garage? I think it's 24 foot. So a normal car. It wouldn't be a truck garage. So, it, yeah. Ceiling, seven foot ceiling? Uh, so it'd be a uh, seven, six, seven, six. seven six garage door. So eight foot ceiling, seven. Actually, it's going to be eight foot six. Give me a nod if I'm right. If I'm not. No. I, sure yeah, I think the garage five. doors are seven six, but I don't want to be held accountable like this is. I, I'm not, I don't have the drawings in, in front of me. This is follow on question to Commissioner oh. Nesbitt. Let's go back to the street. The okay. width of the street is what? Well, if it's a typical residential street, it would be 28 feet back to back of curb. 28 feet curb to curb? Back of the curb to back of the curb. And if you look at this drawing up there, where the, the word cul-de-sac keeps getting thrown out, and I just want some clarification, this is not tight at all like a cul-de-sac. I mean, there's cul-de-sacs all over every neighborhood. And, I mean, when you look at ours, as we were working with the fire department, I mean, they were, and I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn or on their behalf, but they were, this, this is what they wanted. We gave them what they wanted. Um, if you look over here, like, on the, the size of, uh, well, lots two, between like lots one, two, and 25, and you look at the gaps on that turn, I mean, they're, they're huge. So they were talking in our, when we were designing this out with, with Robert, we were accommodating everything the fire department wanted and said to make sure that, you know, when we got to tonight, we, we had done what they had asked and, and was working with them. Sorry, studying. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes. Uh, for the applicant, did you engage in any community meetings with any, yes, any of the neighborhood? Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah. So we had one on this particular project. I was out of town, but um, this, my, the staff attended and, uh, yeah, visited with everybody. That's all right. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. I've got a question for our resident architect, uh, Commissioner Michelle. <laughs> I gave you, yes, go ahead. Tell, tell me. You put me on the spot. Yes, I intend. <laughs> what would you do to improve this? M Mr. Preston, if you could speak in the microphone, please. Commissioner Michelle, what would you do to improve this project? Correction. What flaws do you see in this project? I think it's probably, if you look at a normal residential development, you have a variety of styles, sizes, shapes of homes that adds to the, the character of a neighborhood. And this is pretty homogenous. 
Um, I understand the economy of scale and doing multifamily uh, residential development. Um, that's something you, there's, there's only so much you can do. You're not going to build 38 unique homes uh, here or townhomes. Um, but I think that adding some, some variety to the styling of the home and the colors that are used could make it feel more like a traditional neighborhood than, than a, you know, cookie cutter approach to the same unit over and over and over again. What concerns do you have relative to density? I, I think the density between, and I take the same approach, speaking personally, looking at moving from- No, this is professional, Commissioner. Personal professional view. Moving from higher density to a lower density use commercial single family homes. Transitionally, single family homes would not traditionally want to have a large development next to them like a commercial development. So stepping back from commercial to higher density multifamily, you know, residential to single family homes is a good, good concept in my mind. Thank you, sir. You bet. I think in reference to that, we would, I mean, obviously we've been super accommodating and willing to do even another step. And I think that, you know, the colors is not a big deal if we wanted to work at something. I mean, I definitely want modern earth tone. I don't want no, you know, vibrant that's a uh, uh, eight year fad and then is gone. Uh, you know, we like brick on the front. I mean, it's timeless product, the best exterior masonry product, brick, um, you know, so, but I think uh, we could very easily, uh, change some of the uh, curb, you know, the, the, from the uh, curb appeal and like add different eyebrows, change up some state where they don't look the same from the front. Um, you know, I mean, I'm more than willing to accommodate your recommendation on that. If, if we need some, you know, every, you know, three different plans that have different, you know, again, you know, we can change that up if something that would. I uh, must confess there's a, Subdivision not far from my back fence. I don't think the name of it I'll mention, but it's Hidden Valley Subdivision for the most part. Uh, I think there's a great variation in style, but all of the houses are the same navy gray. Right. And, and it's not despicable, to be perfectly honest. Well, you know? yeah. To be, yeah. <laughs> not despicable. No, I actually like it because I think when somebody comes in, I mean, it's not like we're, when you're doing single family, everybody gets their choice of what they want, but we want them to know this is our one community. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having similar likeness in, in each property, show, you know, and as far as maintenance and, and everything, I, I think it, they look better instead of kind of like, you know, hodgepodge kind of thrown, you know, where it's put together aesthetically pleasing that it really looks good. Personal opinion. Last question, I, I promise. Um, I, I, I was writing notes, so I may have missed it. What was the rental rates you were looking at? Well, I've been corrected, and I again, I stand corrected a lot anymore. But uh, so yeah, so it is 1,400. That's the market rate. Right. So. Uh, okay. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners? So we can let them sit down, and we can discuss. Okay. We can discuss amongst ourselves. I think that um, if we Thank you. want to do some recommendations, we got some work to do. Yeah. And Miranda, you better get your fingers ready. Uh, Madam Chair. Chair, I was just going to say I haven't kept track of the recommendations. Madam Chair, uh, as the commissioners were speaking, I was taking notes on that. I have some suggestions based on the comments that I heard this evening. Uh, so if the commission would like to hear those, you could decide to approve those in block or separately uh, if you prefer. Uh, based on uh, comments that I heard, uh, I believe that there would potentially be the need to add to recommendation number four uh, the phrase with dedicated access at the end of that sentence. I believe that was the, the comment was uh, dedicated access to the amenities. The second one was adding to number seven, uh, where uh, in the last sentence where it reads, a landscape feature must be added around the central detention basin show, shown on the plans. It should read, 
the central detention, central and northwest detention basins shown on the plans. And then the third that I heard would be adding a new recommendation number nine to modify the color palette and accoutrements to create visual distinction uh, in the final development plan. Well said, I feel like applauding. Thank you. Yeah. It saved that was better us. better than what I wrote down. It <laughs> saves us some very embarrassing wordsmithing, so. Thank you very much. So is. Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah. Then on um, six, could we eliminate six and say that they add a third car parking to every unit? To every unit or every building or every other building well, or. I wonder if it's possible to, and I guess I would ask um, Commissioner Michelle about this also, um, or the city, not that he's the, the end all be all, but um, if it wouldn't be advisable to keep the, the parking between buildings 17 and 18 for um, guests or what have you, and then go to um, the every other or everyone. I don't even know if that's, possible. Yeah, Madam that Chair, would, I might yeah. rec recommend that uh, in that circumstance, it sounds like uh, the the parking might be need to be discussed separately amongst the commission so you can reach a, a decision on that. You could either vote on the others first or you could wait till you have the parking uh, portion of it decided and then you could vote on all four changes. Yeah, I agree because I wouldn't accept that parking change with every unit. So As, you want to separate it out? Yes, please. Is everybody in agreement on that? Would we be comfortable with uh, the recommendations of Commissioner Nesbitt that there's sufficiency of double parking at each unit? I, I just think there's merit in his proposal. Not to not go along with that, but let's just stay where uh, Commissioner Nesbitt is. And, and keep it all together? And keep it together. Uh, we have to, because we need to move along. But I, I think there's just great merit in, in recognizing that double park, parking on both sides of the street with somebody parking the way I do, which is, I'm just not going to confess it, but it's awful parking. Well, you got eight feet, eight feet, 16 feet, you're 20, it gives 12 feet. A fire truck is probably 12 feet wide. Yeah, because I'm going to park two feet off the curb on both sides of the street. So that's what I'm saying. It's going to be even for trash trucks to go through there. It'd be hard. That's what I'm saying. That's why they need to have additional parking on. Because you say two cars per family, you got a three bedroom house, you're going to have kids there. Now you're going to have three cars. And most of the time, you're not going to be able to afford that, so they're going to have three people living in there, three, three different adults, and they ain't got three cars. Commissioner Nesbitt, I agree with this is this is high density. And is there a way that we can possibly move to parking on one side of the street? Well, actually, the Planning Commission, I believe, could make a recommendation that the, that the uh, Public Works or Municipal Services look at that, I guess. Consider. Could review that possibility. So are we comfortable S with... Are we all in agreement on that, or do we need to separate it out and discuss? Yes, we can do it. That we can do the double parking, mm -hmm. but with the recommendation that the city looks at the. So we're not saying adding a third stall. We're saying going to one. Yeah, Sorry, going, going to. Worse, then they won't be able to park. Whatever <laughs> Commissioner Nesbitt said. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, sorry, I, I feel like I'm new. Are we in full blown discussion mode here? Yes. yes. Okay. So we would only be taking a guess that the fire department has a problem with the layout because no one's asked them other than the city and the applicant. Let's, Madam, would we, can may we invite back the architect for? Yes. Come back up, please. Yeah, Robert Walquist. Um, those streets are. I have to lean down a little bit. Um, those streets are 28 foot. So if you have each car's say eight foot. 10 foot, they park on the edge. You have a lot of room left for 
driving. That's, you know, 14, 15 feet, so. No, you got 8, 8, 16, you got 28, it takes 12 feet. 12 feet, yeah. Yeah, 12 feet. Well, right. I mean, that traffic's going to have to skew. But that's if they park on both sides, correct? Right. That's if they park on both sides, but that's where you have a plan right now. That's right. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Add the third car. And what we were recommending is, is the client was saying we could take a little bit out of that detention basin to the north and maybe put stalls there instead. What about the people who live way up there today? They're not going to come all the way, okay. all the way down here. I think he's, I'm sorry, it needs to be three cars at each place. I've seen this place, I've been to them, I've drove to them. It's terrible. Right. Well, George with the fire department had, well, but I, I understand. I understand. He's thinking there's nobody on the street. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there an appetite for. A certain percentage, or does everybody feel strongly that it needs to be every unit has three stalls? Could we do a percentage of it and then limit parking onto a one side of the road only, not both sides of the road? Would there be a, a happy medium here? Because I can see a, a, a detriment to adding more paving at the street front to each unit. Let's get the applicant to come back and see what he would propose for us. Okay. I would also suggest that you use double wide versus number of stalls, but you could because you could put three double cars wide. in yeah. a single lane mm -hmm. versus double wide that would be two lanes. That's I think that's what you want. Double yeah, wide. that makes more sense. And Auxiliary parking, I think, is this. Is I was just going to suggest that obviously the uh, the one way ha having the only one side one side of the street parking, great idea. We'd be all for that, but the parking lot sparking spaces that we were putting between 17 and 18 we could also put between 25 and 1 then we could go around the corner by the dry detention basin over on the uh, lot uh, between 7 and 8 so that we have parking on both sides so I think if we took extra additional parking there for guests besides the other so we'd have three different additional parking spaces plus only have parking on one side of the street that may because the 28 foot street is what's in every street in independence missouri that's the standard street so that would help alleviate a lot of that i think if if they would uh, agree to that on a you're good with double parking parking one side of the street and additional parking spaces per as you stated Right, so we already put in, what, what number is that, Stuart, about the additional spark Between parking? 17 and 18, three to four cars. I think you're, uh, I think it's you know, three, say four cars. Yes, yeah, I was but I mean on the, so we could add like six cars by lot one, and then uh, by the lot one detention basin. <coughs> so we're getting it on both sides. Yeah, uh, as you look at the uh, the preliminary drawing on the the two units that are on each side of the uh, the detention, the northwest detention basin, that's unit seven uh, A and B, and then you've got the basin, and then it's unit eight A and B, and I think they're talking about adding additional parking on the southern end of that basin between those two buildings. I see it. And how many cars do you think? How many I'm sorry, how many cars? Six is that what you said? How many cars? Six. Six in that one spot. And then four in the other one. What about between one and then? We're still talking about side by side parking. Double park, yeah. As, as full paved or as an full auxiliary paved. pull off? Well, no, we would have to do the narrow pull off. Yeah, they don't, and they don't then. Allow you to But it's still double parking once you own to yeah, it. Once you get off, right. Yeah, once you cross over into private property, you're off the right of way. Mm -hmm. Then, then the, your driveway uh, expansion usually comes out then. Yeah, approach. it's commonly referred to as an apron. Apron. Okay. I think we, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. I think we can do this. Okay. So, since you were wonderful at rewording mm -hmm. those. How do you feel about number seven? I'm, I'm sorry, number six. S 
Do you Madam give Chair, you I would like to ask a just a point of clarification from the applicant to make sure that I understand what they are thinking and to make sure that that, that is in accordance with what the commission is thinking. Okay, applicant, will you My ahead? understanding of, of what I heard there is that we would do aprons at every unit no, I think the understanding was we were going to add the additional parking and then do a uh, parking on one side of the street only. Right. Yeah, we would do, we would add the additional parking spots everywhere he could fit them in, which we don't know the total number yet, but it could be 12 to 14 by the time we're done. And then have one way, uh, one side of the street. I keep saying one way, but one side of the street. Right. So, and it would, it would be spread around the neighborhood for additional overflow. So then every unit has the ability to park two cars. Yes, right? every unit has the ability to park. One side of the street, and then there's an additional 10 spots. Well, let me clarify. He's not saying double wide. He's saying one in front of the other, not yes. side by side. Yes. Correct. One garage and one Correct. I'm not sure I... Everybody good? So now that we worked out parking, we can discuss that there wasn't a single neighbor that was in favor of this idea. So. Yeah, we have to clarify that. I think there had a lot of the, the I don't know. Uh, as it's MoDOT's right, excuse me, this Jackson County's right away, we followed what they wanted to, we added into this list what they wanted as far as street improvements, sidewalks, and so forth, but we, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, do a, a, they didn't, they, didn't, they had, uh, no, no, they were only involved in the street, uh, improvements along, uh, Salem Drive. Okay, any more discussion, any more questions, or I will entertain a motion. I wanted to clarify, was one of the added conditions going to be the uh, variation in, you know, color and or fenestration, or was what were we, That's just, nine. that was number nine. Right, right. I, I mean, they were yeah. suggested, but nothing's been determined or voted on at this point. Right. I can re I, I will go back through what I had said previously. Yes, I do I apologize. I do want to make sure that I do understand the parking at this point. I believe what has been resolved is that it would be between buildings one and twenty five, comma, eight and nine, comma, and seventeen and eighteen, comma, provide and then on with what number six said. So instead of one pull-out parking that was originally designed for here, they would be putting them in these in this triangulated area. So that's the additional parking. Was there a decision on parking on one side of the street? We're going to check so that. Can that be part of is our it, recommendation? Is it a recommendation? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we can make it part of the recommendation. Yeah. So is that the commission's wish on the parking to have additional parking and parking on one side of the street as determined by city staff? Are we good? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. I'm going to add that. Okay. I would entertain a motion. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Commissioner yeah. Michelle. In the case of 22-125-01, rezoning of C2 General Commercial to R12 PUD two-family residential, plan unit development and approval of preliminary development plan for McBee Acres, I would recommend uh, moving for approval um, 
with the stipulations as made by staff and amended and as recited by the city attorney during this meeting. Well done. Is there a second? Second, Madam Chair. Thank you. Staff, we're ready for a vote. Well Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? No. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Chair McLean? Yes. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Um, we wish you luck and neighbors, thank you for coming and we appreciate your opinions and your voice, so thank you. Okay, we have our next case is 22-200-03 special use permit for 909 West Waldo Avenue by Spencer Rosenbaum to operate a bed and breakfast. Staff, do you have a report? Okay, um, this is uh, case 22 203 uh, Rosenbaum bed and breakfast a special use permit um, we're looking at the vicinity map here so we're talking about a block and a half two blocks north of Truman Road off of a river at the southeast corner of River and Waldo and so you can see the surrounding zoning here. We've got um, R6 single family zoning in all directions. Um, a single family uses surrounding as well as a, a church school use um, to the east. Uh, comprehensive plan here. Um, Bruce, I'm uh, sorry, can I interrupt you for a minute? Is there anyone who can go out the hall and silence them just a, a little bit or ask? <laughs> it's hard to hear you up here. I don't know if anybody else is having that problem, but it's really hard to hear. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. And the comprehensive plan here shows our um, two, two kinds of uh, residential uses, um, an urban um, residential use that's um, centered around the square and then the uh, residential neighborhood um, use that's um, predominant throughout most of the city. Um, this is an aerial photograph of the house at the corner and then the uh, church school parking lot um, behind the property to the east as well as a, a neighbor to the south along river. So this is a, a drawing of the property. Um, so we're... We're still having a little bit of trouble hearing you. If you could speak more in the mic, maybe. Your mic oh, on. Okay. You, you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, we're, we're looking at the layout of the house, um, oriented toward the Waldo Avenue there on the north. and. And the two different driveway driveways that provide access to the property. Um, the proposed uh, bed and breakfast property contains a 3,044 uh, square foot historic home. It was Harry Truman's boyhood home. The house is a five bedroom, three bath home, uh, two bedrooms and a bathroom will be used um, by the guests of this bed and breakfast. Uh, the property has one paved uh, driveway off of River Boulevard and another gravel one off Waldo. And so um, the, the um, south one would be adequate for the um, requirements of a bed and breakfast. 
Um, and then they both lead to a garage that's at the southeast corner of the property that can easily support um, the parking for uh, four paying customers and the residents themselves. Uh, the existing gravel drive along the eastern property line wouldn't, again, would not be used um, for guest parking. Uh, this business will likely be advertised on the city's tourism site as well as VRBO websites. Uh, VRBO guests are vetted and uh, the owner has the right to deny um, stay for any reason. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, before all bookings, occupants will be notified of house rules and consequences of breaking those rules. Uh, the property will meet all um, applicable permitting, or m will need to meet all applicable permitting, and, and it will need to meet the fire and safety, uh, life safety inspection requirements. Um, and the applicant is indicated that um, he will have a trash service collection as well. Um, so we'll go through um, the pictures real fast and then I'll go through the recommendations. Um, so this is looking directly south at the property from Waldo. So uh, with river to our right. And <clears throat> this is looking up the street, up Waldo to the east with the church school property um, there on the south side of the street. This is the neighbor directly to the north across the street. And um, this is the T intersection with um, River. <clears throat> and you can see the historic marker there for the Truman Boyhood home. And then this is looking north up River. And then south down River. And then uh, from the corner uh, toward the house. And this is looking at the west side of the house uh, from River. And uh, the south driveway looking back toward the church property. Um, staff recommends approval of this application with the following reasons or conditions. Uh, number one, the bed and breakfast shall obtain a business license in accordance with all city code and comply with section 5.01.004, uh, Article 1, Chapter 5 of the city code. The, the business license number shall be um, listed in all advertisements and on, and on online platforms. Um, the business um, must comply with all safety and other standards required by section 14, 420 of the city code. A reduced uh, um, pressure zone um, backflow device will be required to be installed on the building's water service line just inside the building before any T's and Y's. This will provide the adequate backflow protection for the building. Number five, once the backflow prevention device is installed, the Independence Water Department will need to send a current test form 2022 for the backflow device to show that it has passed and is working properly. So again, um, we recommend approval based upon the following conditions, and I'm ready to take any questions you may have about this project. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have any questions of Stuart? Uh, I mean, sorry. <laughs> hey, Brian, why does it have to have a backflow put in? Do they have underground sprinklers or something? Or anybody else? I'm... Uh, it's residential, correct? Right now. <laughs> so it is residential, but as a bed and breakfast, it's considered more of a commercial, and all commercials do require a backflow device. Any other questions before we bring the applicant up? Okay, will the applicant please come forward and state your name and your address. Yes, hi, I'm Spencer Rosenbaum. The address is uh, 909 West Waldo, um, here in Independence. Thank you. Um, tell us anything you would like us to know about the project and... Um, well, we... Uh, a lot of people come from out of state and they come and take photographs and 
the sign behind you, um, Madam Chair, the a Great American Story. Harry is is one of those main chapters of this town's history, and uh, you know it's 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 a home that has pipes that break, two of them two of them this winter, and and other big maintenance things that go along with that. Um, but it's a it's a delightful home, and uh, people people like to come and see it, and uh, so there's an attraction. So I. I've, we would hope that the that the city would approve it, and uh, happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Commissioner. Do you have any questions? Okay. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, so you you live in the property. And, yes, sir. Um, you know this is not a a short term rental. This is you're not going to operate this as a bread and back bread and <laughs> bed and <laughs> breakfast. Um, so you'll be preparing meals and providing other services, or no? No. Um, under the city's regulations, it's simply the terminology used. Uh, I think more common terminology would be sort of your uh, Air Airbnb-style situation with a couple of spare bedrooms that are available. Okay. I'm just getting hung up on the naming then. Yes, there will be no food served. So we're really see. looking more at just like a typical Airbnb or mm -hmm. that sort of a short-term rental. Um, yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, yes, it would, um, be, it would be delightful to have it expand so that they're able to prepare their own foods um, at some point. Um, but it's it's a couple of spare bedrooms available, and we wanted to go by the book, receive approvals to 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 share the Airbnb space that's available. Okay. Will will the private the bedrooms that are available will they be separated in any way from your part of the home, or is it just it's wide open? Uh, there is a separation. It's I, I would call it semi semi private. So separate entrances, um, but connected, connectable, connected with doors currently. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's all I had, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes. I, that is a very important question. So then why are we calling it a bed and breakfast and not a, Airbnb. not a short term rental? It's the way our ordinance is written. We make the distinction between a bed and breakfast and a short term rental based upon whether you Re reside in the home or not as your domicile. That's interesting. So, because I would like to remind us that we've dealt with the short term rental and the person wanted to live, was living there currently. And we denied that because it was an extremely uncomfortable uh, idea. Now, we, now we had a, another one where they were living there, but they weren't living there at the same time that was actually passed um, about a year ago. But he maybe. would be, but he would be living there. Not, not all the time. You just can't be living there when someone's, a guest is occupying it in the case of the short term rental. Mm. So you can stay there when they're not there. Interesting. Go ahead. So, Madam, Madam Chair, just just to address some of these things that I've, I've been educated with, with Brian and to repeat. Um, so there are two processes to be able to be approved for an Airbnb under the current city ordinances. And the, 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 the big difference is whether or not you're staying there. So at this time, we currently live there. And um, if you don't live there, the other process, which is an easier process, if you don't live there where you're renting out the full space, um, that's another approval bill, uh, approval process as well. So, so we're so looking at this as a short term or a bed and breakfast. It's bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfast. So bed, yes, yep. Madam, Madam Chair McLean. Which means, your, it, which means it's a special use permit. Got it. Okay. And a question for the applicant: Is your ultimate goal not to live there then, uh, eventually, or uh, so? It, you know, when you have a historic home, Madam Chair, people people presume that the property is tax abated, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, given benefits and so forth. In this case, of course, well, I won't say of course because I didn't, you know, whenever you see a historic home, you say, oh, well, you know, they've, they've got all this, you know, benefits coming their way. So um, I've already forgotten the question that was proposed by, by <coughs> Commissioner Young, but... Will you, can I ask, Madam Chair, just to have the repetition of the exact question that was proposed? I apologize. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so I was just asking. Oh, right, the futurity. Yes, 
we would hope to be able to open the doors wide um, as circumstances allow. As I said, the, the two permits, the one that we're doing is the harder permit, because assuming approvals come through you all, um, the, the other, we have to go before um, city council as well. So it's a harder process to do what is called by the city ordinance uh, Airbnb, excuse me, a bed and breakfast. It's kind of a misnomer in this instance, but in any case, the difference is that we currently do live there. We would be delighted, um, as circumstances allowed, to, to open the doors much wider in the future and have the easier permit and have uh, have it not be a semi-private situation, but be a, be you know fully private for for guests. But this is the permit that we're requesting at this time to go by the book and be able to uh, open the doors to, to these spare bedrooms that are available with, with their own private entrances. Okay. With the hope that you'll approve. Thank you. Okay. I will have you sit and we'll bring um, anybody who would like to speak in favor of this application. Is there anyone who would like to oppose this application? Okay. Hearing none, commissioners, do you have any other thoughts, concerns, questions for the city, or are we ready for a vote? I mean, a motion. I mean, think you need to close the public hearing. Yeah. Oh, the gavel. All right. I'm closing the public hearing. Now, commissioners, any discussion? Questions? Madam Chair. Yes. This is a beautiful home. I, I think uh, this application will permit this resident the additional income that it may continue to be a beautiful home. And if there are no further comment by other commissioners, I will move for, I'll make a motion. Is everyone okay? Okay. In the matter of case number 22-200-03, special use permit, at 909 West Waldo Avenue in the request for approval to operate a bed and breakfast, I move for approval. With recommendations. With the stipulations as so stated by staff. I second. Commissioner Ferguson. Uh, Wiley, sorry. I gotcha. Okay, we are ready for a vote. Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? Yes. Uh, Chairman McLean? Yes. <laughs> Congratulations, and we wish you best of luck. Thank you. Okay. I have a special request. Can we take a bathroom break? <laughs> yeah. Can we move for a 10 minute break? Is that too long? Oh, the chair declares a 10 minute break. <laughs> I didn't know I could do that. Yeah, you can do that. Cool. Maybe we have to have a 10 minute break. Good piece of work. Okay. Thank you. Is everybody in the spot they want to be in? Okay. Um, I'm going to remind everybody, because I know that this is an important project and everybody wants to be heard, so we're going to do five minute, um, a, a person can talk for five minutes. It will be timed and they'll let me know when you're close so that I can let you know when you're close. Um, I want to remind you that when you get up to talk, the most efficient thing to do is if you agree with who talked before, you just simply state that you agree rather than repeating what was said. It will save you time, everybody time, and we are listening. Like I said, we have our pads of paper and our pen, and we are going to write down your questions, your concerns, and we will ask the applicant and the city the appropriate questions so that we can try to answer them tonight. So with that, um, we are ready to get back started at 8.02. Okay. Our first case is 
22-15001, Comprehensive Plan Amendment, Little Blue Parkway, M78 Highway, request by North Point Development to amend the future land use plan for certain lands adjoining the Little Blue Parkway and M78 Highway. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, this is an application by uh, North Point Development for a comprehensive plan amendment for basically the uh, west side of the Little Blue Valley, west of the uh, Little Blue uh, River. Um, for the purposes of this application, we're going to say the Little Blue Valley is, in, is encompassed by 24 Highway in the north, 39th Street on the south, M7 Highway on the east, and Jackson Drive on the west. The applicants of properties... Uh, that they're requesting the change don't include all of that land, just small portions of it. Uh, as you can see from this vicinity map, it, the oval shows a pretty large area, again, because it's sort of stretched out over a, actually several miles, so to speak. It, the, the oval is very big, but that's not uh, really the area. It's only a portion of that. <clears throat> this is the aerial photograph. Obviously, the uh, Little Blue Parkway is very distinctive through the middle of the slide. Uh, you've got Truman Road that goes east-west here. Uh, you've got uh, 78 Highway that goes uh, diagonals to the north-east. And then at the very bottom of the slide, you have uh, Artie Mize Road, which is really the bottom of this uh, project. A, a point made in the... Uh, 1968 comprehensive plan was that the city had very little industrial development, with most of it being along Truban Road and an area north of East 23rd Street and east of Chrysler, which is more or less the Agco plant area. The document further stated that the civ that civic leaders had long envisioned the Little Blue Valley for industrial development. This is the uh, page from the uh, in the uh, introduction page from that plan. Uh, this is the dedication page that was uh, uh, to Harry Truman, more or less, for the plan. Okay, the, the new plan, was, there was another new plan created in 1993. It also points out that the completion of the Little Blue Parkway would open up the valley to industrial development and have a great Im economic impact upon the city in eastern Jackson County. And that is a quote from the plan that's on the screen. Basically, it says opening the valley to industrial development will have a great impact on the city in eastern Jackson County. The level terrain of the Little Blue Valley provides the most desirable landforms for large industrial sites anywhere in the metropolitan area. The favorable vertical grades of the valley will accommodate development of arterial street system, ideally suited for heavy commercial and industrial truck traffic. Industrial development and an associated increase in jobs are of vital importance to Eastern Jackson County as well as the entire metropolitan area. Okay, so in uh, 1999, uh, the uh, there was another there was a developer that came in and uh, basically had a uh, excuse me I take that back I'm skipping over uh, in May of 1999 the uh, City Council adopted the Little Blue Comprehensive Plan Amendment. The document uh, reviewed all aspects of the development in the Little Blue River Valley from land use to transportation, public services, education, availability, and recreational sites, along with the, with the possible alignment alternatives for the Little Blue Parkway. From this data, three alternatives were developed. The final plan, which is shown on the screen here, showed the alignment of Little Blue Parkway pretty much as it appears today with areas of mixed use or open space industrial reserve along much of its frontage. In 2000, a developer, 2007, a developer sought to create the Harmony in the Little Blue Valley project, which includes a portion of the property encompassed by this amendment request, and this is all west of the Little Blue River. Um, <clears throat> the plan had more of an office retail mixed with residential uses slant than the previous plans. Some 15 years after the adoption, only the new town of Harmony residential subdivision east of the river, north of Truman Road, was developed. No significant revisions were made to the Little Blue River Valley with the recent adoption of the 20, 20, excuse me, 2040 plan. 
this is. <clears throat> uh, this current proposal seeks to amend four areas in the, in the rear, and excuse me, in the West Alley to coincide to coincide with the applicant's rezoning proposal. As shown on this slide, the uh, basically it would be areas. Uh, it's the red area, which is B. The green area, C. The uh, D, which is the purplish pink, and then E, which would be the the north one. The area B, which is on the south, is uh, a little over nine, excuse me, 95 acres, and is currently designated for a residential neighborhood. That would be amended to business park. Area C, which is the green outline, uh, it's about 99 acres. It is designated for mixed use now, and that would be changed to industrial. And the pink area, or the pink purplish area, contains a little over 81 acres. It's designated now for mixed use. It would be changed to business park. And then the blue, which is at the very top of the screen, uh, is designated for mixed use residential neighborhood. That would be changed to industrial. And that uh, one north is 394 acres. And uh, the pink one is a little over 81 acres. This is the comprehensive plan that is shown now. You can see much of the area that is sought to use by the applicant is a mixed use, which is in the middle. It's kind of that kind of dirty brown color there in the middle with the applicant sites uh, outlined. Whoops. And that's the end of my presentation for this Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Thank you. Okay, do you, do commissioners have any questions of staff? Okay. I do. Hey, Stuart, um, what, what made us go through and change this plan from this? It's just the people buying it? <coughs> it's not us, right? Uh, that's right, the, in order for the applicant to uh, do what he seeks to do is necessary to make these changes. The staff, it is not. A, this is not a staff-driven so staff application. Not it then. Well, staff is recommending, and I'm sorry, I should have added that okay. to the end of it. My apologies. I mean, because I mean, it looks like to me we're supposed. To, I mean, we didn't get your map. I mean, we got. We didn't get the map of what it is right now in our packet, so I didn't know what was residential, what was just like what you I'm said. I'm sorry. Like trying to take quite a bit of residential away from this area. Uh, I'm probably not the best one that can answer that. Uh, Rick, I believe you're... This particular area, a lot of what the housing study did talk about was redevelopment of um, some of the existing housing kind of in the west of the city. This is an area that could grow, um, and that was um, outlined in the housing study as uh, possible areas for, like, single-family growth, just based on... Um, some of the existing areas. So that's what our study was, that we need to grow out there housing instead of industrial, but that was in the comprehensive plan, that's what the housing uh, plan said. Well, understand, it didn't really, it, the housing I study didn't look at industrial or any type of rezoning of any particular properties. It just looked at where some of the housing trends were happening, and um, basically recommended the type of different housing units and the number of units that would be proposed over uh, a future time frame. And so um, it was not just in this eastern part of the city, it was also southern part of the city and western part of the cities as well. Okay, well, I'm just saying that this, uh, my opinion is, is that we already recommended that this should be residential. And now somebody wants to come in here and change to industrial when our comprehensive plan said that it should be residential. and. I mean, that's why I just kind of disagree what's happening here in that aspect of it. So that's why I'm just saying we're going against what we've had studies done, the mayor had the study done, and that's going against it. So I'm just putting my opinion out there. Okay, let's bring the applicant up. 
And if you'll give your name and your address, please. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name's Chris Chancellor with North Point Development. Yeah, you taller people are gonna have to move the mic. Uh, Chris Chancellor with North Point Development. Uh, offices at 4825 Northwest 41st Street, Riverside, Missouri, 64150. Thank you. Um, so as the applicant, uh, you know, we're uh, supportive of uh, staff's recommendation for approval, obviously. Um, but I would just add that, you know, what we're really seeking here is to take the comp plan, the future land use plan designation, uh, back to what it was in 1968 and 1993 and really, so, um, you know, conform it back to even the zoning that was in place all the way up until 2007. So, um, you know, the, uh, the property was rezoned and changed to mixed use. Um, and, I, and I would argue in these specific areas that you see on the plan in front of you, um, that going to business park and industrial zoning, those are actually not taking a lot of the residential single family out. Um, that that's really largely a C2 PUD area that we're taking back to, uh, to industrial. Um, and that was the prior zoning in 2007. Um, prior to the, to, uh, the landowner at the time, um, you know, coming forward to the city and suggesting an alternative land use, um, which uh, this planning commission or a planning commission and, and the city council agreed with at that time based upon the, the landowner's, uh, you know, directive, right? So, um, you know, I would, I would just encourage you to uh, hear the full presentation uh, about the rezoning effort and those cases rather than, um, you know, cl be, uh, uh, you know, in, in short, uh, you know, to, not focus solely just on the uh, future land use designation since it is in conformance with uh, prior zoning districts. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Question. What was inviting about independence and this particular parcel that made it suitable for an entity such as yours? Yeah, I, I would say that what's inviting about independence, there's a couple of things. One, it's location to a logistics corridor, so it's proximity to 435 and I-70. Um, in addition, that it's got a significant employee labor pool for prospective tenants. So when we look at, if we look at that, tenants look at that and, they, and um, we project in this particular project, and you'll, we'll get to that in my presentation during the rezoning case. Um, but we project, you know, approximately 5,000 jobs created uh, in, in this development over the next decade or so. Um, so when we look at uh, labor pool, we look at uh, those people who are unemployed, but more so underemployed, people who are working a part-time job or two part-time jobs uh, that can trade up into a full-time job with benefits. So, you know, starting, job, starting salaries in a job like this, um, probably anywhere between $17, $18 an hour uh, with benefits. And so, you know, when you look at that, you say, you know, oh, that's a $17 an hour job. But I would argue to someone who's making $12 an hour uh, job or a part-time job, that's a meaningful increase in wage. And so these are meaningful jobs to the people who live within your city. Um, so those folks that, you know, are further west, uh, you know, in, in other areas that, uh, that, you know, we believe will travel, you know, back to the east uh, approximately 10, 15, 20 minutes away uh, to, to work at a, in a project like this. We, we know this because those folks are leaving the City of Independence today and they're traveling north on 291 Highway to our project on 210 Highway. Uh, and, you know, the preponderance, uh, you know, a large proportion of uh, applicants that are tenant C there are largely from people with independence addresses. So, you know, we subscribe that, you know, there's approximately 14, 15,000 people that are underemployed that would benefit from a job like this that are within the city of uh, city limits of independence. Um, and so, you know, that's why this site is important. Uh, that's, that's our view of it. I would also argue that, you know, this site has, has been here for 
uh, 15 years with no meaningful development activity as a single family or commercial use. And, you know, large amounts of it are in the floodplain, which, you know, renders it somewhat difficult to develop a single family. Uh, and so, you know, a development like this, um, you know, can utilize areas like that, uh, you know, in, in some of the floodplain areas and, you know, and handle some of the environmental uh, issues that I'm sure we're going to hear about tonight much better than, you know, some other commercial uses and, and uh, single family, multifamily residential. I don't know whether you intentionally, I don't know whether you intentionally or not, but you did disclose that you already have a presence here. So you're not a stranger to the culture and what we have in mind for what is acceptable. Yeah, so, you know, when we talk about our presence here, we, we uh, our address is here in the Kansas City metro area. Um, we're not an out-of-town uh, developer that comes in and, and you know, tries to, uh, you know, tell you what we think from out of town two states away. Um, you know, we're, we're proud that we come from this area. And um, this company is 10 years old and was started here in the Kansas City metro area. We have a number of employees that live within the city limits of Independence, Missouri. So, um, you know, the, when we say it's in our backyard, it truly really is in our backyard as well. Thank you. Chairman, I have another question. Sure. Okay, you say you're, you lived in this backyard here. How many different areas? I know you got one up in Liberty. Where else you got them? Yeah, um, so we have multiple projects across the metro area. So we actually have um, one on 291 and 210 highway uh, and one in Liberty that we're, is under construction right now. We have a second in Liberty that uh, we just recently got approvals for. Uh, so we'll start construction on that here uh, later this year. Um, and then we have multiple projects, you know, uh, some uh, along I-49 uh, and uh, 71 Highway. So, you know, one of the most notable projects, we're redeveloping the old Bannister Federal Complex. Um, so that's gotten off to a successful start. It was, a, you know, a large brownfield opportunity for us. Um, you know, not many people from out of town would have invested in that site. Um, you know, we, we invested in that, uh, put our capital in, um, because largely because we understand the meaning of that to that neighborhood and to the city of Kansas City. Uh, so, you know, that's just one example. Um, and, and I would say that project got its approvals, you know, about 18 months ago. Uh, we're already starting, you know, our fourth uh, building there. So, you know, four out of seven. So it's, you know, uh, the time is right in, in terms of, you know, the, the uh, amount of industrial tenants that are in the market, specifically this market, looking for uh, space. Okay, so you're saying industrial. Basically, you're just talking about putting up the warehouses, storage warehouses, is that correct? Um, largely, they're uh, used as warehouses, yes. Yeah, storage warehouses. So they employ somewhere between 10 to 20 people per warehouse probably to no um you know we'll get into this in in my presentation on the rezoning case but um you I'm know sorry we, i'm just i mean it's all going to come out there but i'm just trying before we vote on this one yeah why absolutely shouldn't we ask questions like this because you're saying five thousand people i can't see five thousand employees down here if you got an industrial park where they have about 20 or 30 people per place and you only have four of them that's not that's not a thousand people that's yeah. not five thousand people Right. So Absolutely. I'm just asking that question. Sure. No, I understand. So, you know, when you look at the park, we project essentially, um, you know, a, a one for every, you know, 2,000 square feet. So um, that's pretty consistent with, uh, you know, just kind of our platform across the country. So we have 122 million square feet in our portfolio. We employ currently about, uh, our tenants employ currently about 78,000 people in those buildings. So that actually comes out to, if you, you know, run the math on 10 million square feet here, is really about 6,400 jobs. Wow, okay. um, you know, our, our projection is, you so know. So it, it's proven fact that. then, that, that's why I'm wanting to know. Because right. I, I don't know the facts. I'm just wanting to ask you if you knew the facts. Yeah. <laughs> so, I know some of them. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, that's part of your job. You should know the facts. I mean, it should be true facts. If I wanted to, I guess I can go look them up. That's what I'm saying. So I don't yeah, want you feeding something that's not fact. So, Absolutely. Okay. I'll give you the example of, um, 
you know, a, a tenant, uh, Chewy.com, just uh, opened their facility. I in saw Belton. one out there yeah. in Belton, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, that's that's probably about 1,700 to 2,000 jobs in, in that facility. In that facility. one building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they wow. run, you know, that's multiple. A lot of, that's a lot in that one building, I would think. Okay. They, they run multiple shifts there, um, you know, and so that's, you know, that's a good example of one that has a higher employment base, mm -hmm. um, but then we have others that, you know, in 400,000 square feet, um, you know, would would probably have, you know, closer to, um, you know, like 800 jobs or something like that, right? So, I mean, it, the average, I would tell you, uh, across our portfolio is is pretty consistent to that, you know, 0.5 or, you know, uh, two jobs, uh, one per 2,000, excuse me. Okay. My next other question is going to be uh, rented out, how's their space? Are you 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80? I'm sure you're not 100% rented. So what's your average right now? Yeah, so our average changes on a daily basis, but I would tell you that any of this, um, you know, we are north of 85% on any space that can be uh, moved into in the, in the metro area today. Um, so obviously we have a lot of buildings that are finishing up construction. We don't have tenants in them, uh, but very commonly, uh, especially in this environment, those buildings are pre-leased. Um, I, I'm sure we're going to hear about it tonight that we don't know who those tenants are going to be in our buildings mm -hmm. um, and, and spot on. We have not gone out and advertised this to tenants. We simply, as a, from well, a I reputation perspective. Well, I hope you haven't advertised to tenants, not unless you knew somebody big enough, a big corporate like Amazon or something, but that would be going in there. But I don't think, I think Amazon's set around this area itself. But. Yeah, it it's really comes down to a reputational issue for us. So, you know, we don't go out and, and you know, we want to sell with certainty, right? And we're obviously here tonight uh, for a comp plan and rezoning cases. Um, so until we get through uh, those approvals, which we hope we gain uh, over this next month or so, that we would not be able to go out and sell with certainty that you know, we could in fact deliver a building for a specific tenant. Okay. Um, I would tell you that 20 million square feet is what we've developed in Kansas City metro area over the last decade. 17 to 18 million of that was built speculatively. And so, it's just a fact of the state of the economy that we're in today and how long it takes to build these buildings. If you do not have product in place, you're not going to get a tenant. And so we can sit and wait for build the suits. We won't get a tenant. So we have to build something. And what we build suits 90% of the tenants in the marketplace. So those tenants, um, when they come to town, they're picking. They're picking between Missouri and Kansas. They're picking between you know, Independence and Belton, they're picking, you know, so they drive around and they look and they say, well, I can get into this building, you know, our competition in Kansas, I can get in there in three months, it's going to take you 12 months to build your building. So we'll never win without right. building speculative. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Yeah. Are you on? Now you're off. Now you're on. Now you're off. Go ahead. Just for the, for the record, the, the role of the Planning Commission is to help guide land use and development within the city. We also consider how new developments will affect citizens and business owners in the immediate vicinity and citywide. Now, questions beyond the scope, that scope, should be directed to the relevant bodies. The final decision on all of these questions will be made by the city council. And I yield back, Madam Chair. That's a good reminder. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? So we want to focus on the fact that this is um, future land use plan that we're voting on. And then we'll have the next three items to look at and get in the, get in the details and the weeds. I have a question for the staff. Sure. Do we have a list of the owners? I mean, you used to put down owner. Do we not know who exactly owns these? Or is that, what, is that a deal? Is it a corporation? Uh, Off-site banks? What? Well, uh, actually, there's... Uh, 
I believe the, the southernmost piece is owned by, two pieces actually is owned by two local gentlemen. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the rest of the property is owned by uh, Little Blue Valley Development or Little Blue Valley. Do we have the names of them people or can we not have them? Well, one of them is here tonight, I can tell you that. He can speak to his own property that he owns. And uh, the Little Blue Valley uh, Development Corporation or whatever the title is, is actually uh, uh, a sub, uh, subsidiary of the Community of Christ Church, I believe. So the church owns that property? They, they own uh, several parcels in, in this application tonight. Okay, so, so the church owns that. Uh, but who's the name? Do we, can we not get the names out there? Is that something we can't have? Well, one of the, I can tell you, one of the, uh, the southern owners of the, of the very southern piece is owned by uh, Randall Pratt. And okay. he is here somewhere tonight. Okay. And I, I can't speak for the other, it's, it's some farm corporation, and he can probably elaborate on that when he speaks. Okay, well, i just like to know, I mean, because I want to make sure they're approving it and all that, too. I mean, I'm guessing they're approving it. Yeah, they signed a contract to, to do this, so they would uh, have approved okay. it. Okay, just want to make sure. Okay. Um, any more discussion? Um, thank you. Is there anyone, and remember this one, you've got uh, four in front of you, so you might want to consider which one you want to stand and talk about. So this one is Comprehensive Plan Amendment to the Little Blue Parkway M78 Highway, um, a request to amend the future land use. Then we're going to go to the rezoning part. So, is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor of this? State your name and address, please. My name is Daniel O'Neill, and I live at 2700 Coachman in Independence. And I've resided in Independence for 65 years. So, I think I'm a citizen. <laughs> I would like to speak in favor of this uh, development for several reasons, which I will elaborate on. Number one, uh, North Point is a local company. They're out of Riverside, Missouri, and we have many examples of their developments that we can go visit that are local. They're the largest industrial property owner in the United States. They're widely recognized for their high quality of construction and ongoing operations. And they have sites in Belton and Riverside, and Madam the other Chair. ones were mentioned earlier. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Madam Chair, if I might, uh, while I appreciate the, uh, the speaker's comments, it, he's making comments that are specific to the company, which would deal with the rezoning. It does okay. not deal with the comp plan change. So again, as, as the chair focused, is initially the discussion is about whether this property should be shifting from uh, residential to business park in area B, whether it should be shifting from mixed use to industrial in C, mixed use to business park in D, and mixed use and residential uh, neighborhood to industrial in E for the long-term uh, betterment of the, of the city. Okay. It does not deal specifically with any the development reason. itself. It's simply just whether we, whether this, whether the commission believes that moving these mixed use and business park uh, future plans towards industrial and business park, I'm sorry, residential and mixed use over to business park and industrial is the proper direction that the, that the city should be going for a development standard. Okay. I would speak in favor of what he said. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any further comment to this specific case? My name is Randall Pratt. My address is 214 South Spring Street, Independence, Missouri, 64050. Uh, planning for the future of independence goes deep in our family roots. My wife's great, great, great grandfather is named Jacob Gregg. He did the first census in Jackson County that determined there were enough people to form a county. 
And after it was formed, he laid out the streets of independence in 1827. And I'm pleased to claim that tradition in our family as well. My own personal involvement with the city's planning began about 21 years ago. I was a consultant in the process of helping plan the Little Blue Valley. Just two years before then, we had completed the Little Blue Valley Comprehensive Plan Amendment, a hefty book. And I would like to point out that our comprehensive plan is not one sheet of paper with colors on it. It is a very extensive document that talks about the goals, the challenges, the strategies, and the hopes of a community on what to do with 48% of the land mass of independence. The subtitle for this comprehensive plan amendment is an economic development strategy for Eastern independence. I say that to be clear that our discussion today is not about whether there should be development in Little Blue Valley. Our discussion today is are we achieving the goals that we have collectively come to a consensus with for over 23 years. This has been the dream of our community for 23 years. We've built consensus, we've had citizen involvement, and just because the bit of color on the areas that we're discussing tonight is different than what we might want it to be, the goals, the principles, the hopes that are reflected in this document are very much about economic development. More specifically, in my work in 2007 and 2008, in that time period, in the rezoning of 2,800 acres that occurred, we did extensive planning about what might happen. This was the preliminary development plan approved by the Planning Commission at that time. There's lots of colors. Red is commercial, retail. There's other colors, orange for multifamily. And then for yellow, there would be single family residential. Mr. Chancellor mentioned that there's very little single family that's being replaced. That's absolutely true. Out of more than 800 acres, that's the portion that's being discussed right now, there were only 47 acres of single family residential. The vast majority was retail. Over 4 million square feet of retail was planned. And I think there would be consensus in this room that with internet shopping, that will no longer happen. The planning commission hearing that we had shortly before this when we were considering a small number of duplexes with a lack of support a lack of concern, or significant concerns with that. Just to note, over 4,000 apartments are currently approved for this area. That's what could be built today, is over 4,000 apartments, because it's in a mixed-use area with commercial, retail, multifamily, all together. And what we are asking, what the developer's asking for, is also mixed use. So when you look at the colors, back to the comprehensive plan, the colors that are there are not yellow for single family residential. The colors are there for mixed use. And even the comprehensive plan that was adopted in 1999 didn't say that it was single family for the mass, vast majority of this. It was mixed use. And when we have a business park with a variety of building types and sizes, and uh, the presentation to be more on human scale, that is certainly mixed use. And the business park request for the, re for the, re the change of the comprehensive plan very much is in keeping with that. There's some larger buildings than we might have expected at one time. But even the plan from uh, 2007 absolutely contemplated hundreds of thousands of square feet of business park space within this comprehensive plan and within this rezoning. I just want to point that out as for purposes of history, since I like history and how we plan for independence, that we have to be careful and understand that what the history is and what it's brought it to is you mixed have one use. More minute. So for that purpose, uh, if I only have one chance to speak, I also want to speak briefly about the Van Trust Project. I was one of the leading opponents of that. They'd come to me first asking if I would sell the land that I had on the east side of Little Blue Valley, and I turned them down. I could have made a lot of money by saying yes, but I said no, because that was definitely an industrial park with large buildings right next to the parkway without a mixture of uses and sizes. That project was for very, very large buildings directly adjacent to neighborhoods like Castle Woods and Prairie Landings. In fact, there's a 25-foot setback from people's backyards. What's being proposed today is over a mile away from those spots in Castle Woods. And it's a very different presentation, as you'll see in the plans. There's a sensitivity to design, to approach. It's five minutes. I'll be quiet. So sorry. Thank you. Is there another speaker for this particular land use? Good evening. Good evening. 
My name is Steve Maurer, 1100 Main Street, Kansas City, Missouri. I am the chairman of the Independence Economic Development Council, and I would request that you consider allowing the applicant, North Point, to provide all of their information to you because the comprehensive plan change is tied into their rezoning requests, and you're only seeing a small part, and there's pieces that have been thrown at you that don't fit in because you don't have the whole picture on top for the puzzle. And so I suggest you hear this and then hear the rest of their presentation because I have for you written from 148 members um, a written request that you approve the comprehensive plan change and the rezoning. I have letters from every aspect of our community, from the uh, Fort Osage School District, from the Metropolitan Community College, from the Independence Medical Center, from, every, from the Independence Square Association, all across our community, all saying, please do the comprehensive plan change, please rezone to adopt, the, to allow North Point, because this is our project. Now, I know I'm supposed to just stick on the comprehensive plan, so I will say this. I've been involved in independence for over 30 years. When I was a very young lawyer representing the city of independence, I had an opportunity to get on a bus in the late 1990s. And on that bus were the pillars of our community like Ron Stewart, Don Rimmel, Susie Block, Larry Blick, Paul Weston, the list went on. We rode that bus to Jefferson City for the single purpose of lobbying MoDOT to allow the construction of exit ramps and entrance ramps on what was then called the Celsa Bridge, to, al to allow for the Celsa Bridge to actually become the Little Blue Valley Parkway entrance onto I-70. And we put everything we had and every vote we could muster to get MoDOT to agree to do that, and they did. <coughs> And the vision then was that we were gonna make that parkway the industrial development corridor for independence. We were gonna build that road so that up by Lake City is where our new industrial job growth would go. So that our children could actually live and work in independence. So that the, the excellent school districts that we have would have a place for their kids to graduate and then go to work. And that was the vision 30 years ago and it's finally coming to fruition. Now you heard about the 2007 change. That was a good idea, I guess, but it failed. It's been 15 years and nothing happened. The market forces are very clear. You're not gonna get that type of retail mixed use development up there. What you need is what the vision always was and should be, which is industrial development, which will then bring jobs. The housing study commissioner that you mentioned, the housing study, we, we helped do it at the Independence Economic Development Council. It is not calling for housing in the valley, single family residential. That is not what the housing study is about. In fact, what the housing study points out most importantly is you have to have the job growth in independence to drive the need for people to live here. Where the growth is going is where the jobs are. And this is our opportunity. And if you give North Point a chance, what you're going to hear is the thing that blew away the Independence Economic Development Council, blew away the Chamber of Commerce and every and every person that's heard it, and that is the number one reason why they like independence is because of the available job growth. We have the workers that are already traveling to Belton to their facility, to Liberty for their facility, and they will stay here. And even though it may be a harder push to build in the valley, which is miles from the interstate, and it may be a harder push to develop in what is partially floodplain, they're willing to put their own billion dollars into this plan to help our community grow. And this is the transformative opportunity for us. So I strongly request that you consider everything at once, but certainly don't get sidetracked with the comprehensive plan so that you never even get to the really good stuff about the redevelopment. Thank you. Thank you. May we see those letters? Is oh, that? Absolutely. Okay.
next person to speak in favor of the comprehensive plan. Thank you. And Madam Chair, <laughs> thank you. If I am not on this pertinent topic, if my comments are, please stop me at any time. Okay. First, right. can you give your name and address? I will. I will. Thank you. My name is Lynn Baker. I live at 19116 East 19th Street Court South. Yes, that's an Independence <laughs> address for sure. Independence, Missouri, 64057. Thank you. I live very near the proposed development. I wanted to talk to you because I represent uh, the academies of the Independent School District. I've been a professional educator in Independence since 1971. Um, but currently I'm representing the academies in our school district. And our academies are producing outstanding students. We don't have the number of jobs for our students. We need them to stay in independence. They are ready to go to work. There's a technical school at Fort Osage I'm well acquainted with. And I know Blue Springs is also building a career technical center. We have students ready to go to work through these fabulous programs. And we need to provide them the opportunities here. Secondly, if I am reading our local newspaper correctly, if we do not obtain more commercial business groups contributing to the price structure of this city, the prices for the ordinary homeowner are going to rise. And so um, we need to take that in consideration. The third thing is, Unfortunately, I came to the city, I fell in love with the city. As I said, I am not from here. We are looked at as a second or third class city. I see my students going to Lee Summit and Blue Springs. That breaks my heart. I want us to have the facilities, the jobs, the abilities for our kids to stay here in independence. I will probably be long gone, and that's okay, when this is completed. I want the future of independence to be secured for the children of this fabulous community. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Reminder, we are still on the comprehensive plan amendment, um, not the rezoning. Anybody who would like to speak in favor of the comprehensive plan? State your name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Patrick Campbell. I live at 18117 East Fall Drive, Independence, Missouri. Um, lifelong resident, third generation here in Independence. My father sat on this planning commission. I sat on it for over 20 years. Um, your job is tough. I, I've sat where you are. You've got a tough job tonight. I understand that. Um, I haven't been here to speak since I've left the commission. Uh, probably, I don't know, how long has it been? Three, four years? But I felt, <laughs> I felt like that this was worth coming out to speak for this evening. Um, to give you some idea, uh, I work at Blue Ridge Bank and Trust. When Blue Ridge Bank built their current building at 4200 Little Blue Parkway, it was anticipated when they built this that the Little Blue Parkway would be industrial. That's what they envisioned. That's why they built the location they did. That's why they went with everyone else to Jefferson City to get the ramps made, to have the streets made. And the streets were made particularly for industrial. So that's why they went there. So Blue Ridge Bank, myself, uh, we are we are for this project. We would love to see this comprehensive plan amended uh, so that you can move forward with the rezoning. And to me, it's kind of, I don't know if you're doing the cart before the horse, but if you don't pass the comprehensive plan, then I don't know what happens to your rezoning. So uh, I'm, I'm siding with Steve Maurer here uh, another an attorney which is hard for me to do but I will <laughs> um, that I think you need to consider the whole package because one without the other doesn't make a lot of sense so I'll answer any questions you have um, but other than that thank you 
Let me ask a quick question. I just need help or ad ad advice. Are we separating all of these out? Yes, I'm going to ask counsel. You, you could hear, you can have the public hearing for all of the items and you can defer a vote until the end and then you, could, you can vote on them individually at the end. You don't have to necessarily vote after each one. Each one. Okay. So you could have the public hearing for each of these, reserve that, that vote till later. Okay, so it still helps us to hear the fors and against for each item just to keep it clear in our minds. Certainly. Okay with everybody? Yes. yes. Okay. So next, speaking in approval. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Delator, and despite uh, the accent seeming otherwise, I'm actually, uh, I have been a resident of Independence. My business has been in Independence. I'm currently uh, a resident of Lee Summit, uh, 4238, Northeast Edmondson Court in Lee Thank Summit. You. What was your first name again? I'm so sorry. Mark Delator. Thank you. Yes. So much has been said by the very eloquent speeches um, that uh, preceded me, but I'm a single family residential real estate developer. And it's interesting um, and, and a point worth making that I'm currently uh, developing in the city of Independence. Um, this planning commission, we came before you guys very recently with the help of Stuart. Um, my company, SBD Capital Development, is currently uh, building 13 fourplex units um, on the town, we're calling them the townhomes of Harvard, right by the Sterling Acres subdivision at Sheely and uh, Sterling Avenue. So thank you for your support there. Um, very much in favor of this development because it's pro-housing. The one thing that I think sometimes gets put aside is that jobs have to come before the housing. Everyone wants the housing project for the tax base, but these gentlemen here are bringing jobs to this area, um, quite substantially, um, I might add, and the housing base that will allow us single family and multifamily developers to come in and deliver the housing that the city is needing and wanting, it has to have the jobs before we can come there. I drive frequently down with my daughter to a volleyball all the way to Gardner, Kansas, and I see the cities of Olathe and Gardner that are doing similar projects with massive warehouses right on 35 going south. And you know that they're bringing jobs because subsequently we see the restaurants and the retail and the housing developments that are there to come in and support those developments. A city like Raytown, on the contrary, completely built out around because they have nowhere to grow. They have no more land. They're completely landlocked by other cities. The blessing that the city of Independence has is the land. You guys have the opportunity here tonight to expand the base, expand the tax base, bring jobs, and keep the people from driving up north, from driving to Gardner, to driving to Grandview, where the jobs currently are. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Sorry, your name and address, please. So Gary Jones, 5352. South Davidson Court, Independence, 640055. I don't belong to any organization. I'm not an attorney or a banker. I'm just a guy watching what's going on out in Independence. You might People, need to move towards your mic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Years ago on 40 Highway, they built a Best Buy, which was, for those who are not old enough, was about, two, about a block east of, of uh, hy -Vee. Now it's a church and a storage facility. I used to live in their backyard. I used to have 10 acres of soybean fields, and now we're going to build a building, and 100 feet away from my house was a big, tall building. That was fun. We had two problems. The trash truck at 6 o'clock in the morning and spotlights on the outside of the building. We called the city. No more trash pickups before 7, and they changed the lights. When I sold my house, it sold at a good amount of money for the right price. There was no, there was no big problem with trucks. There's no problem with valuations of the house. Then I moved over to Whispering Meadows, which is right behind, or just west of Bass Pro. And I was the landscape chairman for the HOA there at Whispering Meadows when they were going through that construction project. Recall right behind um, Hobby Lobby, there's a big cliff that was blown out while the houses were there. It took about 30 feet of, of rock with explosives and not one house received any damage. 
the developers worked with the city, the city worked with the HOA, and it all worked out fine. We asked for a wall, they put an eight foot wall on top of that cliff. There was no problems, there was no trucks, and unfortunately the depression of, or recession of 2007, 2008, wiped out the people coming in and were gonna backfill that, that space, but the values were there. There was no problems because of that development. We hear of a lot of potential problems, whomever builds out the Syria in the Valley. So my experience has been living in the backyard of two projects here at Independence, there has not been a problem. Jobs, taxes, new money coming in. That project is gonna bring a lot of vendors, a lot of visitors. They're gonna need a place to live, to stay on a short-term basis, hotels. They're gonna be eating. You'll have truckers come in. They wanna have some place to live, to stay the night, eat in restaurants. Everybody talks about the, the $18 an hour jobs. You gotta have a manager, an owner, 75, 80, $9,000 a year, a supervisor, $50,000 a year. I mean, it's not just the low-level people working there. Do some quick math. At $20 an hour with 4,000 jobs, that works out to $166 million a year in payroll. $166 million. That's at $20 an hour worth 4,000 people. Change the numbers how you want to change them. You want to go 3,000 jobs. You want to go $25 an hour. It's a lot of money coming into our area. Is it all going to be an independence? No. Some people come from Liberty and uh, Grain Valley and Lisa, but a lot of that money is going to be coming into our area. And I don't think we can afford to look at that piggy bank and say, oh, there are going to be too many trucks, too much noise. We want to have some houses. $166 million in payroll. Any question? I'm glad to answer. We will, we've written down our questions if we have. Thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> I have lots of people signed up. Yeah, um, so I want to make sure. I was going to call them in order that they were signed, that you were all signed up, but because we need you to specifically talk about the land use first, and then we'll move to the next part. Kind of think about that, and I won't call this in order, but we will make sure everybody gets heard. So. Thank you, and your name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Jason Snodgrass. I'm the superintendent of schools of the Fort Osage School District. I'm representing the Fort Osage School District tonight. Um, 2101 North Twyman Road, Independence, Missouri, 64058. Um, I have been superintendent of schools at Fort Osage School District for seven years. This is the first time that I've been to a planning commission meeting. This is the first time any project that has come before this board um, and ultimately City Council, the Fort Osage School District, by unanimous vote, 7-0, passed a resolution in support of this. The reason that we're support of this, and the reason I've been sitting here this evening along with other folks who have already spoken, is I'm very passionate about this. I'm very passionate about this because I'm passionate about students. I'm passionate about education. Um, we have a goal in our community not only Fort Osage School District, but I can also certainly speak for the other school districts in the area to prepare students for life after high school, to prepare them for the workforce, to pre prepare them. Currently, Fort Osage School District is the largest, the largest area, the largest school district in Jackson, Jackson County by area. There's no, not a larger school district by area in Jackson County. However, our assessed valuation is one of the lowest. The reason for that is it's um, in large part agricultural. And we're proud of that. We're proud of who we are at Fort Osage. However, the revenue, the revenue, it takes money. We are not judged by our bank account, but we are a business as well. And we do have to pay our bills. And we have to recruit and retain effective and quality staff. We have to uh, put safe buses on the road. We have to pay our bills to be effective in order to uh, properly support the students and staff of our school district. Currently, the land in Fort Osage School District that we're talking about, we have received $3,250 of revenue each year. If this is built based on the proposal by North Point, 
in 33 years, over 33 years, we will um, receive over $32 million. That's just Fort Osage School District. That's not any other entity we're talking about tonight. That's a game changer for our school district. That's a game changer in order to recruit and retain staff. Beyond the money piece of this, beyond that is the job creation we've talked about. Beyond that is the partnerships that we believe we can form and create with North Point in regard to opportunities for students to do internships in these spaces. We have been in conversation with them already about one of the first buildings that would go up near um, or closer south um, down Little Blue, um, which would actually be located in the Blue Springs School District. We would partner with them to have space for us to have educational programming in that space. That's a game changer for us as well. And you say, well, why would Fort Osage want to be further south? Because we would be able to go closer to where the business industry partners are located. And that's something very appealing to us. I know there's been, there are several other folks to uh, speak tonight, but I just encourage you uh, to listen to these, um, these people who are also passionate uh, to, that are here and remember our history and not only that but more importantly remember where we're headed it's my goal to prepare our students for a brighter future and I truly believe this could help that opportunity thank you thank you is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor okay come on up name and address please Blake Roberson, uh, 4925 uh, South Conway Court, Independence 64055. And I'm here tonight to speak as a, well, two different things. Number one, uh, by uh, admitting this to you, I am a member of the uh, Council for Economic Development. Uh, but I want to speak to you tonight as a small business owner. Uh, we haven't heard from anybody else tonight, but I have a uh, small business have for 40 years on 40 Highway. Seven people work for me. And uh, I have a lot of small business uh, friends and independents. We are counting on you to continue to let independents grow and to not throw away this opportunity because it may not pass this way again. We need small business to grow, and to do that, we need this industrial park, we need this development, and I also speak to you as a school board member for the Independent School District. All seven members of the Independent School Board want this to proceed. We need this to proceed. We ask you as a school district to honor what uh, our friend over here said about the academies. We have a governor of Missouri that came to Van Horn, spent a lot of time at Van Horn talking to the welding class about how he was a welder and how far he has come and what he did with those skills. And we need the jobs of carpenters and electricians and welders and all sorts of different skills. So with that said, I don't want to take any more time, but I ask for your support tonight to pass this important point for North Point. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eric Ashbaugh. I reside at 1512 South Lee Summit Road. My dad used to say to me, I don't have a lot of dogs in this fight, and I don't particularly have many dogs in this fight. The dog I do have in the fight is that I care about independence. I've only lived here for nearly 40 years. And I say that because many in the people in this city have lived here all their lives. And so I'm a relative newcomer, I suppose, but I have chosen to live here. And I would say it's a nice place to raise a family. It's a good community, a community that deserves to be taken care of. So I hope the years I've spent among the folks here in Independence and the time I've spent serving on the Parks Board and the time I've spent on the Planning Commission on the other side of that bench will uh, allow me to have some privilege so that when I say what I, what I believe 
uh, it'll have some credence. And I didn't come here today to browbeat anybody into my way of thinking with a lot of facts, supp suppositions, and promises. I just want to remind us of a few things that we need to keep in mind as we go forward considering tonight's zoning developments. A lot of folks are uh, disturbed that this area is going to lose its, its beauty. Well, I love nature, and you might say I love it so much that I spend nearly every day working in it. I run a small landscape business, and I do it not because I want to be rich. So believe me when it says it pains me to know in some ways that this little blue valley may not be the way it has been in the past. When I was a teen growing up in Austin, Texas, we lived in a neighborhood, a small middle-class neighborhood, and at the end of our dead-end street, there was a 100-acre field. And that field was kind of a common field, but three weeks out of the year, the blue bonnets would bloom, and it was fantastic. It was awesome and everybody loved that field. But one day, a bank came in and they built a building. A building that had six drive through lanes. I mean, what's this about? This was something new. Uh, people would say, I'm gonna spend my gas money sitting in this drive through lane, I'm just gonna walk inside. I mean, gas is 30 cents a gallon now. It's so incredibly high. And this was back, in the 70s. So, but that bank came and they built it and everybody loved it. Because before you had to go downtown to go to the bank. There wasn't a bank close by, but now there was. And all the neighbors decided, hey, we're gonna support this bank. Well, there was a, an intersection across that field. And when that bank came in, it opened up to development. And by and by, that field was not a field any longer. It was a lot of concrete and asphalt. So when folks hear this about industrial and commercial development, they get worried. But let me tell you, sitting in that chair, as I have in the past, and having developers come and say what they want to do and what they promise they'll do, we had to sit there and hope that they would. Because we didn't have the zoning. The zoning wasn't in our favor. Now we have a chance to make the zoning complete and appropriate and attract folks like North Point who in their preliminary plans show a lot of attention to the landscape, show a lot of green space, show an intelligent water mitigation plan, not like Van Trust was. This is different and we need that zoning to be approved so that when the inevitable development comes in, that we have a quality company to give us, the folks of independence, what we deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I think um, maybe we will go ahead and take anyone who is opposed to this. Is that all right? Yes, to the comp plan and then we can move on into the rezoning and start all over. So if there's anybody who is opposed to the comprehensive plan, um, please come on up. Okay, seeing none. So I'm gonna declare this, sorry, I need help with this. I don't see anybody. So close the public hearing of this, correct? This will be closing the public hearing for the comprehensive plan amendment. All right, hang on, I get to bang the gavel. Okay, closed, the public hearing is closed. Commissioners, do you have any questions for the applicant? 
for the city? Or would the applicant like to come up and respond to any of the favorable <coughs> positions? Commissioners? M Madam Chair, again, if the commission, well, I apologize. G proceed with the comp plan. I think we can, I, I'll come back around to your question earlier on the rezoning to maybe make that more efficient, so. Okay. So we, now, should, we should proceed with the comp plan vote because if you are, depending on what your decision is, then that, as some of the speakers alluded to, that does open the door to the rezoning discussion. Correct, right, okay. So, if there's not any discussion, I would entertain a motion. Madam Chair. Commissioner Preston. In the matter of case number 22-150, Dash zero one comprehensive plan amendment for Little Blue Valley. I enthusiastically move for approval. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Commissioner Ferguson. Okay, um, we are ready for a vote. <clears throat> Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Michelle. Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt. Yes. Commissioner Wiley. Yes. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Chairman McLean? Yes. Um, just put that away. Madam hey, Chair, as, as you are ready to introduce the uh, the next item, okay. what I might recommend to the, to the commission, if, if uh, you all please, we could have staff go ahead and present all three of the rezoning staff reports. We could have the applicant come and speak to all three of those, and then you could open the comments for and against all three of them. Obviously, we do need to kind of look at those individually if there are any questions with respect to that, but um, we, can, we can do all of those at once because they're all rezonings and they would all follow the same procedure. That would be fantastic. That's the way we have designed. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I would just for to be formal, our next cases are 22-100-03, rezoning of Little Blue Parkway, M78 Highway, case number 22-125-02, rezoning of 2226 Artie Mize Road, and approximately 2411 South Little Blue Parkway. Case number 22-12503, rezoning of East Truman Road, M78 Highway, and Little Blue Parkway. Okay. Staff, we are ready. Yes, this is an application by North Point Development for uh, various projects along the uh, Little Blue Parkway, RD Mize, Truman Road, 78 Highway Corridor <clears throat> you, in the Little Blue Valley. Uh, the vicinity map again shows the general location. It doesn't include all the areas. It includes a little more of the areas that needed in some places and not enough in others. Um, again, this is the aerial photograph that, uh, again, that shows the Little Blue Parkway as it runs through the middle of the site. It's the kind of the wider, whiter uh, thoroughfare that goes to the middle, north to south. And then the other streets are around it and noted, as noted on the plan. This is the surrounding zoning of the uh, properties. You can see the green area means uh, our agriculture, RA zone properties. Uh, the yellow is generally some form of residential or multifamily. The purple is uh, industrial type zoning and the red or sort of reddish is, is actually mixed use in, in this case. These colors don't turn out very well on the screen, I'm afraid. And this is the comprehensive plan that you just voted to uh, recommend revisions for. <clears throat> okay, this is the uh, overall plan for the project. Uh, again, extends from Little Blue, excuse me, uh, Jackson Drive. Artie Mize Road on the very south, uh, which is at Artie Mize and uh, Little Blue Parkway, there is actually a uh, an oxbow or a, a rainbow, uh, what used to be part of the Little Blue River before it, uh, you know, the channel was rerouted on the very south end there at that northeast corner. And then it falls the Little Blue Parkway along uh, the east side of Little Blue Parkway 
And then as it gets up closer to Truman Road, it's actually on both sides of the, on both sides of uh, the Little Blue Parkway. And then it, it crosses over Truman Road and, and then uh, it, there's the larger industrial piece that's on the northeast corner of uh, Little Blue Parkway and 78 Highway. First, we'll touch on the industrial parts. <clears throat> they are encircled in, uh, in these red ovals. These are the two pieces that will be zoned I-1 industrial. Uh, the uh, total is 493 acres for both pieces combined. The south piece, which is the obviously the littler one, which is south of the Truman Road and uh, I guess you could say southeast of uh, 78 Highway, is uh, about 99 acres. The north piece, which is the larger one, uh, north of uh, 78 Highway is uh, about uh, 395 acres. Uh, this uh, this uh, is not a site plan as such. This is just for rezoning and two industrial for both these properties. They have provided these uh, sketch plans, you could call it, these uh, conceptual ideas on what they would do on those locations. Um, the other parts, of the, the actual site plans that involve the BP zone properties, which is to the south and east of this. Uh, so we've got uh, the properties uh, mostly uh, along 78 Highway on the south and north, and uh, you also have Bly Road, which runs through the middle of the site, which is about right here, and comes down and feeds into 78 Highway, which goes down into the Little Blue Parkway. Down here for this lower one, this is uh, also would be accessing Little Blue Parkway on existing curb cuts. Uh, this up here, there's not going to be any curb cuts for the Little Blue Parkway north of uh, 78 Highway here. They'll all access, yeah, uh, access 78, not Little Blue Parkway. Okay, we'll just go on to the next slide, which is actually, uh, <clears throat> I call it the Southern Business Park PUD area. This is again, that has the small oxbow or the, uh, the uh, I don't know, some, it's, it's a little lake sometimes and other times it's more like a wetland. Anyway, the southern piece that's more triangular in shape that uh, was recently amended. Their first plan actually included the land all the way down to Artie Mize, but they uh, amended the plan, I believe, based upon some uh, uh, of the meetings, responses they had at some of the meetings with the neighborhood. So they took out the Horseshoe Lake and, and, and they also inserted a stream that, uh, that flows through the middle of the site, which is this line right here. Um, all the buildings in the in this uh, project are uh, accessed by internal systems of driveway with, with uh, limited access to necessary road and uh, the Little Blue Parkway. Uh, parking encircles most of the buildings, the loading docks for the three larger buildings, which would be here and the other one there. Oops. Uh, or on the back of the building. Several landscape open space are placed around the property uh, with landscape berms along the east property line. Relocated stream and its buffer corridor now bifurcate the site. Uh, this site actually has a, a number, is more really more oriented to uh, retail commercial uses. You can see there's a number of small buildings along the Yellow Blue Parkway. Uh, I think they... The idea was this larger building ah, here would be a potential supermarket. These other buildings would be more retail uh, oriented in design. Uh, the little there's a convenience store type of building here, uh, drive-through restaurants and a sit-down restaurants down here. So the uh, the comments that relate to this portion of the project are more retail, commercial oriented, not so much industrial, because again, they only have these two small buildings, two smaller buildings on the back of the site, with most of the rest of the site being uh, more of a commercial slant. Okay, the north portion of the, uh, of the two sites 
is uh, scheduled, their drawing show is scheduled for two 298 square thousand square foot buildings, which are these two here. And they're also inter, uh, for wet warehouse distributions and then two smaller warehouses out closer to the street, to the Little Blue Parkway. And it also includes a drive-in restaurant, which is up here on this end, I believe. Uh, again, this is also served by internal driveways that access Necessary Road and the Little Blue Parkway. And after I go through these, I'll, I'll end with the recommendations for each of the three. <clears throat> okay, this is the, uh, the northern BP area. Call it the 78 Highway area. There's actually three little pieces to this. We have the west site, which is the, obviously further on the west on the left, and then the north site and the south site. In relationship, in comparison to these uh, ones that are to the south, these are more warehouse service type uses and not so much retail, commercial, restaurant, office type uses. The west site, which is the one that's furthest to the left, is designed for 290,000 square foot warehouse distribution in the middle of the lot with three smaller commercial office buildings fronting onto the Little Blue Parkway here. Um, the north site, which is this one over here that's, that's uh, obviously on the north, it has no industrial warehouse component but is a small commercial office focus. And uh, they plan for up to eight building sites are proposed here with two of those being drive-through facilities. Perhaps a bank, drive through and a convenience store as well. Uh, one access will serve this property with uh, access being on the Truman Road. There's also the showing a uh, convenience store. It will have its own driveway onto, <clears throat> onto Truman Road as well. The south site, which is the smallest one of the three, um, features only four commercial office buildings served by a single drive from Truman Road connecting to a central parking lot. The, the only other features are a large floodplain mitigation area, which is this area south here, and a small parking lot for a trailhead parking, which is here, that will connect up to the Little Blue Park, Little Blue Trail, which is just to the east of this site. I'll go through the uh, pictures here. Oh, excuse me, this is the building elevations for their uh, warehouse buildings. Um, they can elaborate on this one during their presentation, but you can see it's mostly uh, two-story, story-and-a-half type of structures, uh, tilt-up concrete, I would think, tent pretented potentially, uh, mostly brown, earth-tone colors with a mixture of uh, building height and uh, windows, doorways, loading docks. Uh, that type of thing. Okay, <clears throat> I can tell you about these pictures now. They're, if you've been out to this area, that a lot of these pictures are going to look alike because most of the areas are just open ground of uh, farmlands. Okay, here we're, we're uh, going north on the Little Blue Parkway. There is a, uh, a walking trail sidewalk on this side, on the uh, right side of the Little Blue, which would be the east side, Little Blue Parkway. <clears throat> Here we're on Necessary Road, which is on the east side of the southern portion of the uh, site. That is the uh, football uh, facility on the right, the Pop Warner uh, program. Here is the, f the sign, obviously, for the Pop Warner uh, facility. And here we're looking south on the Necessary Road. Again, this will be the area that will be more retail, commercial, restaurant, office type of than the other areas. Okay, here we're um, looking at, uh, we're on the parkway going north, I believe. This is a, a field, a farm field. There's a lot of those out there. This is another farm field. I think we're looking to the, uh, to the southwest, I think, here. Uh, here we're on uh, the Little Blue Parkway, I believe. We're looking west at the city power plant. You can see the smokestacks and all the other issues. And then uh, I think that's the school, uh, little uh, college thing and they're off to the left. Here we're looking north up uh, Little Blue Parkway. 
Uh, I think we're looking to the southwest more so on this one. Again, more uh, farm fields. Here we're looking south at the intersection of uh, the Parkway and Truman Road. You can see the stoplights off in the distance. Uh, uh, west is to, the, is to the right. That's a sign uh, down there for the uh, new town in Harmony. It says, go this way on uh, Truman Road. Uh, this is another field. I believe this is north of uh, 78 Highway. Here we're also looking at a, another field that's uh, somewhat north of 78 Highway. This is just north of, uh, yeah, just north of uh, 78 there. Here we're looking up Bly Road to the north. Again, you've got farm fields on both sides of the road here. It's on this lower part. And then... Uh, I believe we're on Bly here looking down toward uh, the southeast at uh, 78 Highway. And uh, there's another shot to the south along the parkway, and that's another sign for uh, another sign for a new town and uh, an another area of uh, farmland. Okay, like I said, there's a lot of these pictures. I kind of lose track of where I took these as well. And another... Uh, another farm field. <clears throat> okay, um, now I can go back through. Well, before I go to the uh, go to the uh, recommendations or the uh, final part, is there any questions on anything that you've seen to this part? Anything you'd like to see again, or any questions? Commissioners. Okay, okay. We'll start off with the uh, I one industrial zoning, which are those two pieces that we looked at earlier, early on. A staff does recommend approval of these parcels to be rezoned to I-1 industrial. Okay, now going to the, uh, these pieces, which is a South uh, Business Park PUD area. Staff does recommend approval of these as well with the following conditions. Retail businesses in this business park shall, shall, have, shall not have restrictions on the, minim, on the maximum building size However, the development site shall meet the BP PUD Florida area ratio for the site. The permissible uses for this property include all BP PUD uses permitted by right plus the grocery store and businesses with drive through facilities. The, the development must follow section 14302 of the UDO for BP and PUD districts. Three is the design guidelines attached to the staff report shall apply to all construction within e uh, Eastgate Commerce Center, which is the entire project. Then restaurant pa parkings established at one space per three seats. Individual buildings containing retail and offices uses shall, be, shall provide parking for at least one space per 500 square feet. For warehouse manufacturing, the parking ratio shall be one per 1,000 square feet. Provide a copy, a draft copy of the covenants and restrictions with the first final development plan. In lieu of curb and gutter along necessary road, asphalt resurfacing of the existing roadway is required along with applicable striping. Number seven is each new drive or access locations for this development plan will need to be evaluated and approved or denied based on its own merit and the traffic impact study updated accordingly. And then the current stream buffers and the new proposed stream buffers shall be more clearly indicated on the proposed plan. Any questions on that uh, case or any of those conditions? Any questions, commissioners? So you say, so you say they're, they're gonna put in new roadway and redo the road and put curbs in, or oh. we are? Well, no, they, the applicant would be responsible for all that. The city would not be involved in and any of that. that's a necessary road? That's a necessary road. As you can see here on this uh, line, it's, it's this road here. Right. You want uh, me to go back to the pictures? Or no, anything? no, I saw okay. the pictures, but I just want to make okay. sure because, I mean, we're talking about quite a bit more traffic on there. I think right now there's probably a ballpark or something that's there, I think, on the back side of it. Yeah, it has that football facility there. Right. And so, but I, I don't remember. I don't know if they had curbs there. I was looking. No, they don't. Yeah, so 
that have to have curbs and drains? How about drains and stuff like that? There is uh, some areas along the, the east side of Nessus, excuse me, the west side of Necessary, there is a, some significant drainage ditches that will have to be improved. Right. I mean, it looks like to me he's going to have to do all kinds of drains because, I mean, he's got all kinds of little lakes and everything for water to run into, I'm guessing. That's right. That's right. They can address that part when, they, when we get to that. Okay. Okay, I'll go on to the uh, 78 Highway one, which is this one. <clears throat> The west site, um, well, excuse me, sorry. Okay, retail buildings in this business park phase shall not have restrictions on the maximum building size. However, the development site shall, be, shall meet BPPUD floor to area ratio for the site, entire site, not just per building. The permissible uses for this property includes all PUD uses permitted by right, plus businesses with drive through facilities, whether those be banks, drive through restaurants. The development must follow Section 14302 of the UDO for the BPPUD district. The design guidelines attached to the staff report shall apply to all construction within the Eastgate Commerce Center. Again, the parking, uh, restaurant parking is established at one space per three seats. Individual buildings containing retail and offices shall be Provide at least one space per 500 square feet for warehouse and manufacturing. The parking ratio shall be one per thousand square feet. Provide a draft copy of the covenants restrictions for the first with the first development plan. Any uh, any future improvements to Truman Road will be in accordance with relevant development agreement agreement between the city and the developer. And each drive or access location for this development plan will need to be evaluated and approved or denied based upon its own merits and the traffic impact study updated accordingly. And then the stream buffer and new proposed stream buffers shall be more clearly indicated on the plan. See, with these PUDs, you, could, you have the, the option to uh, create additional, provide for additional uses that are not normally allowed in a PUD, such as a grocery store or drive through restaurant, things like that. That's why they're noted as conditions in here uh, because that gives us the PUD designation, gives us the flexibility to provide additional uses and also changes to the parking ratios and so forth based upon their experience in, in building these type of buildings. And uh, as you know from your uh, information, a, a Traffic study was uh, provided and reviewed by staff, along with a drainage study. I mean, Rick, did you have uh, any review comments that you'd like to make on either one of those? Um, I would just add that um, part of the traffic study that you guys have a copy of, um, you do have just the um, verbiage portion of it, the traffic studies itself. There's actually two of them traffic impact study, and then there's also a corridor study. That's a supplemental. Um, you, you, like I said, you don't have the full thing because it's over 500 pages, um, and it does have a lot of the turning movements um, associated with it. The um, stormwater plan that was provided is um, also this, the uh, summary portion of that that's um, a rather large document, so we didn't include that portion. It is still available for your um, if you would like to see those, we do have those available. Thank you. Hey, Rick, on that, is Truman Road state or is that ours down there? Uh, Truman Road is ours. Truman Road is ours. So are they going to do anything, repaving or curbs, anything there? So when, when looking at Truman Road, um, we have to be make sure that we're aware that this is actually a phase project. So when you look at phase one of this, which is um, just several of the buildings on that BP portion, um, and then you get into phase two, phase three, and phase four, when you actually get into the, um, I believe it's probably the third or fourth phase, is when we start looking at um, the requirements for Truman Road to be improved. Um, part of that, because right now it's, it, it'll have to have um, like five lanes eventually when we get to that portion. Uh, but understand, again, that's when we start looking at the full build-out um, as you get to phase four. Okay. 
Any other questions from commissioners before we? I've got a Go ahead. Just a point of clarification here for city staff. Um, one of the conditions, on, well, on several of these is <coughs> that each new drive or access location for this development plan will need to be evaluated and approved or denied on its own merits and the traffic impact study updated accordingly. Um, with any large development, I understand that traffic is going to be a concern and this traffic study is preliminary um, because this is just a concept at this point. So just to clarify for um, the commission and, and the public that are here today, my understanding is that as the plans become more real, as projects become more real, as we know the uses and tenants, they will be required to update the traffic study um, so that we are assured as a community that traffic is not going to be adversely impacted. They're going to make necessary adjustments to, uh, to allow that not to happen. That is correct, Commissioner. Uh, as you mentioned, this is a preliminary site plan and a preliminary uh, traffic study. Um, as the development, when they actually get, if they get approval for this and move forward, that's when we'll actually start to see the actual uses for it. That will determine the actual type of traffic, traffic number, type of vehicles. Um, yet that's why the applicant is aware that this study is going to have to be updated. It will, um, that will also determine the access points off of Little Blue or any of the other uh, side roads as well. Um, each one has to be looked at when they start getting closer to a completed project and a final site plan. Uh, that will all go through our engineering plan review process and um, they will look at those updated traffic numbers based on those particular uses. So the applicant is aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions before we bring the applicant up? Okay. Will the applicant come up and I guess again state your name and address? Yeah, good evening. Uh, still Chris Chancellor with North Point Development. Uh, <laughs> offices at 4825 Northwest 41st Street, uh, Riverside, Missouri, 64150. So I know there's quite a few people that want to speak about the project, so I will try to go through our presentation uh, as quickly as possible, but just to, um, you know, kind of start over in, in terms of who North Point is. So um, we are a 10-year-old company uh, founded uh, here in the Kansas City area. Um, so if you look on the, on the uh, left side of the uh, slide that we have up, um, we have uh, 78,000 people, I mentioned this earlier, 78,000 people uh, go to work in one of our buildings. So we own 122 million square feet across the country from coast to coast. Um, that, you know, the reason why that's important <clears throat> is because, you know, I won't uh, name specific competition, but our business model is very different than, um, you know, other folks that develop industrial real estate. So, you know, our model is a hold model. So we build these buildings and we hold them long term. And so why that's important, we'll get to in the, in the later part of uh, this presentation, but you know, we have an investment that we make. Um, we're not looking for a quick out. So long term, these buildings are built durable. Uh, they're built to be the buildings of the future. Um, so we talk about clear heights later. Uh, we build clear heights that are you know, higher than most people are gonna build today because those buildings have to stand the test of time, not just for the tenant today for this seven or 10 year period, but for the tenant after that and the tenant after that. So we intend to hold these buildings long term for, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, also, you can see here, uh, you know, one of the things we're most proud of is the charitable contribution. So we really are a community partner. When we invest in a community with our money, uh, and here we're talking about, you know, generally about a, a billion dollars worth of investment that we're making capital investment to this project over the next 10 to 12 years. Um, I, you know, I, I say that and then I have to sit and think about a billion dollar capital investment. So I guess it doesn't really matter where you're from, Kansas City or New York or California, a billion dollars is a lot of money. And when we look at this site and we say, you know, why is this important for us? You know, we'll talk about why, you know, we talked about a little bit about the jobs 
um, and the available uh, pool of prospective employees for tenants, um, the access to, to I-70 and 435, um, all of those things uh, make this an absolute uh, you know, win for, for both, I think, the City of Independence and for North Point. Um, so some of those tenants you can see uh, down at the bottom, um, those are some of our current tenants in our buildings across that 122 million square feet. Uh, so those are not, I would say, you know, tenants that we say are going to be in these buildings, but those are our current tenants. And logically, uh, what happens across, you know, from, you know, east coast to west coast, we develop a building, uh, some tenant goes into it, uh, we have a great relationship with them. Um, they look for the next building in the next market, and they say, y "You're a great landlord." Um, you know, we have a you know, our motto is kind of go beyond the contract. Um, you know, we have a really, really solid relationship with not just the tenants, but the communities that we invest in as well. And so, we want to be a good neighbor, and we want to be a good partner. And um, that's important because those tenants will come back time and time again. We see that, you know. Um, so I referenced Chewy.com uh, earlier in Belton. That, that largely Chewy came here um, largely because we had space available and they were familiar with us and we had developed their building uh, many times across the country. So, you know, that's the type of relationship that we have and we maintain with, with our uh, tenants, which I think ultimately will play out well here when, when we talk about um, some of the building uh, opportunities that we have in, in the, uh, on this site. Uh, we were named best place to work nine years in a row, so that's something that, you know, we really is very meaningful to us. Um, and, you know, and so I think really, um, you know, as being named the number one developer uh, over the past five years, uh, you know, we, we hold the most square footage uh, short of Amazon, right? Amazon holds uh, the, the most square footage uh, in the country, industrial space right now. Uh, we're second to that. Uh, so we have a track record of success. And that's why we believe uh, very strongly about this project location and its ability to be successful long term. <clears throat> so, you know, why this location? Uh, we talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, this location is, you can see uh, Eastgate Commerce Center labeled in orange on the, on the right side of the map. Um, I think I, you know, referenced this a little bit about the projects that we have in the metro area. Uh, you can see all the labels. We have a lot of current projects all over the metro area, but the, the gaping hole really was um, Eastern Jackson County for us. And so when we, we started to look at Eastern Jackson County, uh, mainly because of, as I referenced earlier, that labor that we noticed at Northland Park, um, which you can see on the map is at 210 and 291 Highway. Um, and we, we knew that about 75% of those applicants that come into those, the, take those tenant jobs in that park uh, were, were coming from the city of Independence, as I described earlier, coming up uh, 291 Highway to 210. Um, and then as uh, Liberty Commerce Center, which is really kind of our replacement park to, uh, to Northland Park, um, so just to the north of Northland Park, you can see Liberty Commerce Center. But again, um, a number of tenants going into that space right now, into that park, um, and a, a fair number of those, the laborers coming from Independence. And so uh, maybe we were a little slow to acknowledge that. Uh, and so as we look at Eastern Jackson County, we say, well, well, wait a minute. We know that folks who work in buildings like this don't want to drive 45, 50 minutes, 55 minutes to get to work. Generally, tenants know that the ideal drive time for them is 20 to 25 minutes. So we look at a 25 minute drive time around locations and we say, hey, that has great access to an employment base. And that's really what drew our attention to Eastgate Commerce Center and to this specific location, as I described before, access to 15,000 underemployed folks that could work here to fill 5,000 jobs. So when we look at tenants that say, you know, when a tenant, prospective tenant comes in, they need to hire 1,000 people or 500 people, they're looking for a three times multiplier generally. So they say, 
you know, well, I need to hire 500 people. I need at least 1,500 applicants because I know over time, you know, there's attrition and things like that. So when we look at this, we long term want to hire for our tenants 5,000 projected jobs, but we have a labor pool of 15,000 just within the city of Independence. That's not counting the areas that we would look at in Blue Springs. They're also within, you know, that 20 minute drive time that we described, which is another two or 3,000. So, you know, it's, it's a significant uh, value for a tenant to come in and say that they have that access uh, to, uh, to that workforce. <clears throat> so, you know, we worked to identify a site and um, once, once we identified it, generally, you know, in this location, um, you know, we set out to, to meet the community, right? And so, you know, our process, which I've outlined here, um, you know, is generally consists of meeting with as many folks as we possibly can. And we, we generally break that down into these three steps. So one, we have this outreach process. We're gonna meet with community stakeholders and local agencies. So when we say community stakeholders, you know, we, we describe a stakeholder as anyone who has an opinion about our project. Well, we know there's a lot of stakeholders in this process, right? And so, um, you know, we held community meetings uh, pretty early on. So uh, we've held three up to this point. Uh, I suspect that we may yet again hold another uh, community type of meeting, you know, as kind of between planning commission and city council. Um, but, you know, we, we've held three to, to this point and really great attendance, I think, from all, uh, you know, all three of those, um, you know, as can be expected. We, we, again, we do this all over the country. Um, you know, the first one's really well attended. People want to know what's going on. The second meeting uh, has a lot of people, but fewer than the first one. And the third meeting, by the time you have the third one, you have a lot fewer people that show up to that third one. Um, so, you know, generally, I think what that means for us is that people, um, you know, were, had a lot of questions and got a lot of answers out of those uh, initial uh, meetings. <clears throat> so, you know, step two really here is when we have those meetings is really just to listen, right? So we say we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? It's really to listen and understand what the concerns are about the project. And then coming away from that, how can we, we respond to it? So, or, you know, what we have here are plan revisions possible, and we'll go through some of those tonight uh, that we heard from, from the community meetings that we were talking about. Uh, and can we find solutions to any of those current issues? And we have, and so first and foremost, I would tell you one of the things that we heard from I believe largely in the second community meeting was, I believe this planning commission meeting was originally supposed to be virtual uh, on March the 8th. <clears throat> and we heard a lot of feedback at that community meeting to say, why is it virtual? I can't, I can't attend virtually. So can you have it in person? Well, we, we have no control over how the meeting is held, but we can strongly encourage that we, we postpone it and do it uh, you know, in person. And so, uh, staff uh, and uh, and uh, our team worked together to uh, to continue the case from March the 8th to, to this evening uh, and so that we could hold a planning commission uh, in person so that people would have an opportunity uh, to come and speak. Um, things on the left side uh, that we heard was generally just the proximity of the project to the Little Blue Trace Trail. So the Little Blue Trace Trail is very important. Uh, asset to uh, to the valley and to the people that uh, the users of that trail and rightfully so it's a great trail system um, so we had you know some buildings that were pretty close to that trail now we felt like we could buffer them um, and we'll go through how we buffer some buildings and and you know logically there's just some places where it just didn't make sense you know we weren't going to be able to buffer it the way we wanted to buffer it so we just simply lost the building so we'll walk through that as well um, development around Horseshoe Lake. So uh, I, I guess it's called Horseshoe Lake um, adjacent to our demise. Um, there's a, actually a, a couple of Horseshoe Lakes, and I think when we get into this about 
Um, one of the environmental concerns and wildlife concerns was a, a bald eagle's nest that was in a tree at uh, Horseshoe Lake. As it turns out, that's how we knew there's a second Horseshoe Lake. Um, the Horseshoe Lake at our demise road did not have an eagle's nest. Our consultants go out and do these environmental reports. Uh, and field studies, and they did find the eagle's nest, and we'll show you where that location's at at a different horseshoe lake uh, on Jackson County Parks property. Um, we heard traffic congestion uh, at Jackson Drive and Little Blue Parkway. And uh, we heard protection of green space and creation of both active and passive recreation uses. Like, so that, that's the feedback that we got. Um, and then again, those environmental concerns. So we'll kind of, we'll walk through, um, you know, kind of the best way to demonstrate these responses, I think really is to begin kind of at the south end, uh, at the BP plan, adjacent to uh, Necessary Road and uh, north of our demise. Um, so, you know, in summary, uh, about 150 acres here uh, that contains uh, about 30 buildings in a mix of sizes and uses. And so, uh, as uh, Mr. Borders pointed out, that um, you can see that there's a number of different types of uses in here. So it's zoned BP, or we're asking for uh, a rezoning to BP, um, but it really is a mixed use plan. <clears throat> so, you know, we do have a retail center that essentially is, um, you know, kind of uh, that wedge that's, um, you know, just south of the traffic signal at, at Necessary and Little Blue Parkway. Uh, ideally, that would contain a grocery store, um, you know, some other type of, you know, sit-down restaurant or drive-through use. That's the feedback that we got through our community meetings that, you know, folks would really love to see a grocery store here. So, you know, we know that um, that's not diametrically opposed to what our tenants want. So our tenants, um, when they develop a park, uh, when we develop a park and those tenants move in, um, they're looking for uh, these types of services to support the people that work there. So we know that generally people will shop either close to home or shop close to work. So you're more inclined to go to the grocery store right as, as soon as you get out of work and then drive home or just wait till you get all the way home and go to your local grocery store. Sometimes those grocery options aren't really readily available in some of the uh, places where, you know, some of the employee labor is going to and where they live. And so we know that from a tenant's perspective, having a grocery store, having a, a bank, having a drive-through, those are, those are important to a tenant. And so that's the success, important to the success of the, uh, the project itself. <clears throat> We have uh, 83 acres of open space uh, within this plan. So, you know, that's about 56%, uh, which under BP is, you know, exceeds that 40% uh, requirement by code. Um, so the proposed uh, business park zoning uh, following the amended ordinance, so that was recently amended. I think you had a, a couple of folks speak to that. Um, so as that business park, uh, zoning has been amended. Uh, this plan generally is in conformance with that, but for the, the items that Mr. Borders represented, um, and that is largely for uses. So uh, there were certain uses that were limited in size. Sit-down restaurants couldn't be greater than 5,000 square feet. So we've asked that, you know, we have some flexibility to be able to, you know, develop a pad for someone that needs 6,500 square feet, that that use would not be eliminated uh, from this business park plan. Um, same way for a grocery store. Grocery stores weren't allowed in a business park plan, so we've asked that those uses be allowed specifically in this plan. <clears throat> um, so generally what we're trying to accomplish here is, um, you know, pushing these kind of more warehouse uses that you see on the plan, the little bit larger buildings. So pushing those to the north and off of the parkway as much as possible, but still having a buffering opportunity to uh, the trail as it backs up to it. So as a, from a sense of scale, um, the, the distance from the trail uh, to, you know, kind of what I would describe as the truck court to those buildings, um, you know, that's, that's a couple hundred feet. And so uh, what that allows us to do is to build a berm um, to be able to screen that and, uh, and landscape that berm. And so that berm height, 
would generally be about you know 12 to 14 foot tall. Um, we have enough room in there to be able to meander and make it look you know really nice, uh, as opposed to you know just kind of an upside down detention basin that sometimes gets built uh, adjacent to the trail. So we've been working with Jackson County Parks and Rec. Have another follow up meeting with them uh, later this week as well to kind of continue that dialogue about uh, the specific screening adjacent to the trail. <clears throat> um, as you can see, that um, you know the plan. I think uh, Mr. Pratt referenced this is really the the opportunity to uh, transition these uses from the single family that's essentially over on Jackson Drive. Um, to, you know, ultimately go from single family into maybe some other denser, you know, residential type of use. But that's a, that's a logical transformation or a translation from, you know, single family, a less dense use into, you know, a commercial area or, or an industrial area. Um, so using that green space behind it to buffer from other uh, residential uses further to the east, um, and then using the parkway and some other transitional uses on the west side of the parkway as, as a, a good planning tool uh, for siting uh, these two particular buildings that you see there. Um, I will say that those types of buildings, um, you know, we'll get into this when we get into the industrial, the I-1 zoning, you'll see bigger uh, types of buildings. So there's kind of two general types of buildings that we built. One is what we call a rear load building. So that's really what's in this BP plan here. So that building is narrower and a little bit longer. It has some truck dock capability on the back side of the building. So that's screened really well. Uh, the front sides of the buildings and the short ends um, are, you know, uh, car parked basically. So a parking lot that make it really look like an office front type of building. So. Um, you know, the, kind of the best example I can uh, give you, and we'll have some photos here, but um, I would recommend anyone uh, drive to our park at Horizons uh, in Riverside. Uh, there's some great examples of uh, those types of buildings that have two-story glass on the corners, uh, kind of mid-entry bump outs and things like that that really give it a, a feel that's, you know, a little bit more than just a, a regular industrial building. So that's really the goal to meet the BP design requirements and design guidelines that you all have established through uh, neighbor input. Uh, and uh, so that's what this plan does. <clears throat> um, so several plan changes, I think I hinted to this uh, as we had the... Uh, the neighborhood meeting. Um, so the original plan you can see on the left and our current plan that's in front of you is an application tonight. Um, so on the left, you can see that, you know, the scale of the buildings was a, a little bit larger on the south portion of the plan, kind of between necessary and our demise. Uh, we also had proposed some development around Horseshoe Lake. Um, and so what we heard in, that, in those community meetings was Horseshoe Lake was really sensitive. Um, and we didn't have a specific user uh, for those buildings. And all of those buildings, you know, generally would be, it's a mix of uses, some sit down restaurant, um, you know, small office, things like that, that would be around Horseshoe Lake. The goal was to always keep the lake, um, but since you know, we, we want to be specific and intentional about how we develop around that. We thought best to, um, you know, take the application forward by pulling it back away from Horseshoe Lake for now, um, and then come back in the future uh, with a very specific plan for a specific user that might want that uh, development around Horseshoe Lake. Um, again, you know, some of the feedback that we got was, you know, this warehouse use uh, which in BP is limited in square footage to less than 50% of the total square footage of the BP plan. Um, so that's what we've ab abided by here. Um, but you can see that there was a warehouse building that we had intended to use um, for you know, some smaller types of tenants um, just to the uh, west of uh, the football fields um, on that south Artemis, uh piece of property. And, you know, that building has now uh, been removed and replaced with uh, two smaller scale buildings um, that, you know, would be specific for uh, individual tenants. So those would be build to suit opportunities for someone who wants 25 or 30,000 square feet, doesn't need, 
you know, 50,000 square feet and doesn't want to co-locate with other tenants. Um, so that was really, you know, kind of the change in the scale of these buildings. And you notice on the south side and the R demise uh, uh, piece that's just between Horseshoe Lake and Necessary Road, that just generally the scale of those buildings has decreased quite a bit, especially those buildings that were adjacent to Little Blue Parkway. So again, that's the feedback that we got through the community meetings. <clears throat> So moving uh, further north up to um, the Truman Road area, 78 and uh, Truman Road. Um, so really here we have an area with two cases that are uh, kind of combined into this one graphic. So as Mr. Boyer has uh, pointed out that, you know, the area on the east side of Little Blue Parkway on both sides of Truman Road, uh, and then the area on the north side of Truman Road, kind of in between 78 Highway and Truman on the west side of Little Blue Parkway, that's the BP uh, business park plant. Um, the other three buildings are in a proposed uh, industrial I-1. And <clears throat> so we were really intentional about that um, because Truman Road being one of the access points into uh, Newtown and to uh, residential development that would potentially uh, occur in kind of the, what we would call the East Valley. Um, so, you know, we were very intentional about what types of uses and things that we can put there uh, as kind of an entrance into uh, that East Valley area. Um, so, you know, limited industrial uses there. Again, it's a BP plan. So, you know, the portion of the 50% of warehouse space that we can do, uh, we moved over to uh, the west side of the parkway uh, adjacent to you know, the power plant and Barber Concrete. Uh, a lot of those uses that you can see, you know, on the north side of 78 and on the west side of this particular site, um, those are already zoned I-1 industrial uses. Um, Barber Concrete, as an example, has significant uh, outdoor storage. And, you know, and so, you know, our philosophy was to really use our buildings to screen a lot of that from the parkway. Uh, and so, you know, that's important to us. So you can kind of see how we've staggered the buildings to be able to kind of create the screen as you drive up and down the parkway and, and not look back across that field and, and um, you know, and see the training facility or the concrete supplier. And, uh, you know, we all love uh, power generation smokestacks, but, um, you know, we tried to uh, screen that as much as we possibly could. <clears throat> Um, so, you know, this is a 180-acre site, um, 1.4 million square feet of uh, industrial space, as I described, generally on the west side of Little Blue Parkway, and then about 320,000 square feet or so of those other mixed uses, commercial uses, office, uh, drive-through, other things that, uh, that Mr. Borders explained. So, you know, 102 acres of open space, 56%, again, exceeding the 40% required by code. Uh, largely, we do that as, you know, for a couple of different reasons. This particular site has some floodplain on it, but not a lot. Um, but we do uh, have some off-site drainage that we want to accommodate. And um, so, you know, a lot of open space really dedicated to, um, you know, to accommodate some of that drainage that might be coming through. Um, from Spring Branch and some other uh, adjacent water bodies and creeks. Um, so one thing that I would point out <clears throat> on this particular slide is, again, that, you know, the sense of, uh, that from the community meeting was more open space. We'd really love to preserve as much open space as possible. And so what we did on the east side of Little Blue Parkway, you see the area kind of in between Little Blue Parkway, um, you know, kind of starts you know, where it says former sewer treatment site. So if you go onto the east side of the parkway at that location, you can kind of see that dashed line represents the, uh, the little blue trace trail. Um, so that is property generally between Little Blue Parkway and Jackson County uh, Parks and Rec um, that is available for development. So as part of this proposal and this, this plan, uh, we would set that aside as dedicated open space. So that's a conversation that still is ongoing with Jackson County, um, you know, to whether or not we would donate that to Jackson County as part of the uh, trail system and that corridor, 
or if that you know we hold that as open space those are all conversations that continue to uh, mature as we work through that uh, but we are dedicating that as additional open space and buffer along the little blue trace trail <clears throat> so generally i would describe um, you know as we had these community meetings this area really was one of the areas that had little feedback. Um, we didn't really get a lot of feedback except for those buildings that were adjacent to the trail. Um, so I think here's probably the best comparison of the original plan that we had on the left again and the proposed plan that we have on the, on the right in front of you this evening. So you can see that the scale of the buildings at Little Blue Parkway and 78 Highway has really dramatically changed between the two plans. So the buildings that are on the east side of uh, Little Blue Parkway have gotten much smaller in scale. So that was some of the feedback that we got. Uh, and then we also received feedback about just the proximity of that longer rear load building. Um, you can see it on the left and then it disappears on the right. Uh, that's because we have given that building up and we will not develop a building in that location because of its proximity to the trail. So again, another area that we would uh, look to work with Jackson County Parks to see if we can donate that property, uh, create a lake is uh, some feature along there that you know we have intention to do. So a wetland area, some other critical habitat uh, you know, for migrating birds and things that we heard were really important to folks. That mean, but okay, on these pictures here, you're showing green. Is that the other pictures I saw? They were blue. So is the green water or is the green grass? Yeah. So the the green is generally going to be uh, the darker green is you know wetland areas and things like that. That I would describe it as more you know it's not going to be a, a lake. Okay, so it's not going to be like, not going to be water detention or anything? And so those are all details that we have to work through from an engineering perspective. Okay. We're going to make as many of those uh, areas wet uh, ponds as possible, um, but those are all the things that we'll work on as we move into kind of this, you know, this next iteration of engineering that we do. Okay, so I was just curious. I, I remember seeing blue in other pictures, now I'm seeing green, so I was wondering yeah. sure. <clears throat> So that brings us to the area largely along uh, 78 Highway. Um, and so, you know, this area is 475 acres, um, about 3.7 million square feet of uh, Class A industrial space. And so, you know, w when we talk about the types of buildings, we have some photos of those. You know, they're durable assets that we talked about previously, uh, clear heights that are um, you know, 36 to 40 foot clear. So on the rear load building, so the building, you know, adjacent to Little Blue Parkway as an example, is that rear load building that only has docks on one side of it. So we purposefully uh, put that facing Little Blue Parkway. Uh, we set those buildings back off of the parkway by, you know, probably the closest to the parkway uh, that building is, is about 500 feet. Um, so generally greater than 500 feet as, you know, the parkway curves out and the building stays as a straight line there. Um, so significant setback uh, off of the parkway. Uh, that you'll then see, uh, Commissioner, that um, we do have some ability to build some lakes in, in that, this portion of the plan, uh, and that's what we're proposing here. So, you know, we'll um, try to we will uh, maintain as much of the, um, you know, kind of the riparian corridor as possible. So what's important is that, you know, these development areas that you see on this plan are really just agricultural farm fields today. Um, so we don't intend to take any of the riparian uh, areas out uh, to develop any of these areas. And so if you look at the south side of 78 Highway, you again see, you know, large green mass uh, there on the south side of 78 between uh, the highway and the Little Blue Trace Trail. Uh, that again is an area that we would set aside for uh, green space preservation. Um, those are some areas in there that have some trees uh, that we want to preserve and, and maintain. We heard that was important. And right there in the middle, just uh, below the word lake, um, you can see uh, that green is kind of carved out around that that's an oxbow, so that's the other horseshoe lake. So that is the location where the uh, bald eagle nest is. So that's actually on uh, Jackson County property, and um, our property had gone around it. So again, in uh, you know, a desire to preserve that area, 
uh, in that nesting tree, then you know we uh, dedicated open space around that area as well. So um, the closest these buildings are, um, you can see at the north side uh, from a residential structure is 1,250 feet. So on the south side, um, you know, kind of uh, going down towards uh, Newtown um, to get to a res you know, a, a future residential lot or uh, area uh, adjacent to Jackson County Parks, it's about 1,300 feet. And <clears throat> the reason why, you know, that's important is, um, you know, we'll, we'll hear a lot maybe from folks about uh, air quality. And, you know, and generally there's a lot of air quality uh, documentation out that says if you can uh, build a distribution center uh, at least 500 feet away from a residential structure that, you know, the air quality generally is, you know, pretty good by the time you get to, to you know, the, use that 500 feet as that buffer distance. We look at California uh, Air Quality Board and they suggest a thousand feet. Um, so they know, they've done enough studies to know that by the time you go a thousand feet, you buffer it, uh, that you've dropped 80% of the pollutants out of the air by the time it gets uh, past a thousand feet. So, you know, when we look at this, we say, you know, let's keep the building at least, you know, 1,250 feet away from the nearest residential structure there and 1,300 feet away from any proposed development at Newtown. <clears throat> um, So the one thing that I would, uh, again, call your attention to is on the south side of uh, 78 Highway, you see where we proposed a trailhead dog park and lake. So, you know, that's really, again, an area that's adjacent to Little Blue Trace Trail. Um, people ask for both passive and active recreation spaces. So we had offered up to Jackson County Parks and Rec to be able to build them another trailhead. Um, and we'll, we'll do probably a couple of trailheads, one at Truman Road and another here, uh, adjacent to uh, what we would build out as a dog park. Um, so again, in conversations with them, so nothing's uh, solidified in terms of who would uh, own and maintain that dog park, um, but that's a commitment that we're willing to make to uh, build a, a lake around the dog park and a parking lot for people to come in and use, and then use that as a jumping off point to uh, get onto the trail system as well. Um, so, you know, the reason why um, we talked earlier about this specific area, um, this specific area largely was zone C2, uh, is zone C2, uh, mixed use, and uh, someone referenced earlier, you know, 4,000 apartment units and the 4 million square feet of, of in, uh, retail uses in that area, and that's, that's exactly right. Um, and the reason why we propose to bring the comp plan back to industrial is because if you look at all of the area uh, between Lake City and um, and the Little Blue Trace Trail, it's already zoned I-1. So that area is, uh, already has significant I-1 zoning um, with Lake City being I-2, heavy manufacturing. Uh, then if you look at the west side of this piece of property, again with um, the IPL site, um, and Barber Concrete, you know, large areas over here on the west side that are already zoned I-1 as well. So you had a piece of property, several hundred acres, that was sandwiched well between two I-1 zoning districts. So, you know, and, and those are, you know, Lake City is in use today, and, and the IPL site and Barber Concrete are in use today, and there's other businesses that are over there uh, adjacent to Jackson and other streets that are well in use today that have those industrial uses. So, you know, we thought um, that that was the original intent was to bring this back to uh, I-1. That was the intent in 1993, was the intent in 2006, uh, and then in 2007, as we discussed, that, that plan changed. <clears throat> so I just want to point out the adjacency of both of those uh, zoning districts. So again, uh, quickly, you can see that there's not a whole lot different between this plan, uh, the original plan that we made the application with and we went to the community and had a discussion with um, versus the plan on the right, but for uh, the loss of about 700,000 uh, square feet of buildings on the south side of, of 78 Highway. So again, that's an impact uh, to the overall project performance, and we'll talk about you know why that's an impact here shortly, but 
Um, but we felt like that was, you know, something that we heard very strongly from the community that these buildings um, were really close to the trail and um, and we felt like there wasn't a really great way to buffer, especially that east, easternmost building. Um, so we elected to uh, give that up and protect that space as a dedicated open space. <clears throat> yes, you are. We're here all night. <laughs> I will try to... <laughs> yeah, I apologize. It's a it's a billion dollar investment for us, so um, you know I do apologize for taking a little bit longer to make the presentation. But I think it's important that you know the process that we've been through and how the plan has been affected. Yeah, please don't, don't apologize. It, it's important for us to hear. Um, so, other feedback uh, that we received was the need for preserved open space along the trail corridor. Um, you know, which you can see here. So, you know, generally what's in this, you know, more vivid uh, aerial photograph is, you know, the Jackson County Parks uh, property that goes up through uh, the valley. Um, that's about, you know, from uh, between our demise and Bunshu, uh, that's about uh, 715 acres of, of protected open space that's uh, controlled largely by uh, Jackson County Parks and Rec. Um, as in addition to that, um, what you can see uh, bounded in orange is the additional areas that we're proposing to dedicate as uh, uh, open space and preserve that. So whether we do that through a conservation easement or we dedicate it to, again, to Jackson County Parks. Um, but a lot of these are uh, riparian areas that you know, we want to see preserved. Um, so we would dedicate those over. That, that makes up another 255 acres of green space that we would dedicate um, along the Little Blue Trace Trail and that corridor uh, for, you know, protection of open space, which again is something that we heard pretty overwhelmingly from, from, the, from the folks uh, that attended our community meetings. Um, so in total, you're looking at close to a thousand acres of protected open space adjacent to the trail um, in that uh, our demise road to Bunchu uh, corridor. <clears throat> Um, that's pretty consistent. It's kind of trailing off the page here, but you see on the bottom of the page, that's really the top part of Burr Oak uh, Woods uh, conservation area. So that area is about a thousand acres. So there's significant conservation ground uh, within the valley itself. And, you know, we're happy that we can add another 255 acres to that as well. So traffic of course, was, you know, one of the other kind of big topics that we heard a, a lot about. Um, and, you know, what I think uh, was referenced was that you have a traffic study um, that was conducted in conformance with the City of Independence and MoDOT scope. And, uh, and it was done in, in conformance with uh, Institute of Transportation Engineer Standards and recommend Recommendations. So ITE, for short, is kind of the gold standard uh, for traffic engineers to say, you know, this is what this land use generates in terms of traffic, and they have uh, a, a big volume of uh, all of these general, you know, kind of land use traffic generation rates. and. Um, so, you know, we know a lot about the traffic that gets generated from our particular site, from our uh, project. So we have 122 million square feet. So we've analyzed a big uh, portion of that. So about 12 to 14 million square feet, we've gone back and we've taken traffic studies again and we set up video cameras and we know the types of trucks and how many trucks and how many cars. And, and so what we know and what we've learned from that is that, you know, our trip generation rate is pretty consistent with, um, you know, and below uh, ITE's trip generation rate for what they call an ITE 154. So that's, you know, warehousing use. Um, so we've, we feel confident that, um, you know, that other significant portion of um, our portfolio that we've looked at matches up well with ITE. So, you know, we talk about coming back and looking at a traffic study in the future, and we're more than fine with that, um, but we feel really confident in those preliminary numbers as well. So one of the things that we did, because traffic has to work for us, again, we're a long-term holder of this property, 
Um, so if traffic doesn't work for the city, it doesn't work for us. And it definitely doesn't work for tenants. And so the last thing we want to do is get off at uh, I-70 at Little Blue Parkway and have some traffic issues at Jackson Drive. Um, the tenant pretty quickly is going to say, yeah, I've seen enough, turn around, we won't even make it to the site. So, you know, that's why it's important for us, again, as a long-term holder to know that um, we have to come up with a, a, a traffic solution to the issue that is, exists today. Um, and you can see that on this exhibit that, you know, in the inset, you can see that, um, you know, generally what our, our traffic consultant did is they looked at um, a corridor that's about eight miles long. So they started at 24 Highway and they followed the Little Blue uh, parkway all the way down to I-70. So that's kind of the area in blue, uh, obviously the little blue parkway. It comes down to I-70, but they looked at all of those intersections that are circled in yellow um, and, and performed an analysis on them to determine what the level of service is for each and every one of those intersections. And then we projected our traffic onto that to know, do you have a problem today? If you don't have a problem today, as we phase our project in, at what point do we need to make certain improvements so that we, you know, mitigate for that traffic impact? Um, so, you know, we, we uh, had them take a look at it, and the thing they came up with, which is very consistent to what we heard in any of the stakeholder meetings that we had in the community meeting, is that, you know, traffic's really bad at Jackson and, and Little Blue Parkway and at I-70. Um, and that was consistent with the traffic study that we got back and, you know, while it's not uh, detrimental from, you know, MoDOT's perspective that, you know, it, it operates at a level of service C and, you know, these things operate from a, think of it as a, a report card, essentially, uh, level of service A is the best, B, C, D, E, and F. So you would think, well, D is really not good, but D is actually an acceptable level of service to uh, ITE and to any of uh, the DOTs. Um, and, you know, once you get to E, uh, you really want to be looking at mitigation uh, that you can do to improve the traffic. Uh, and then also, obviously, once you get to F, it's a failing intersection. So, you know, we looked at these and, and we found a lot of level of service Cs. So, um, not horrible, but not great. So, how can we improve that? And so, one of the solutions is, you know, if you're getting off at I-70 and you're getting on to Little Blue Parkway and you're heading north on the parkway, people say, well, it backs up all the time there. Sure enough, it does. Um, and the reason why is because there's only a single left turn lane. If you're going to Buffalo Wild Wings, there's only a single left turn lane to be able to turn into that uh, whole commercial area there. And, and so the, our traffic engineer said, well, there needs to be two left turn lanes. The cycle time, the light time, is not long enough for cars to be able to get through. And then those cars drag out outside of the queue where they can be in that left turn lane. And now they're holding up everybody who wants to go north on the parkway because they can't get through. So, <clears throat> so they suggested that a dual left turn lane be installed there. Um, and then likewise, if you're heading south, on Little Blue Parkway, and you're getting close to that Jackson Drive intersection, and go figure in the AM is the worst, uh, people turning left to go to Quick Trip. Um, so that same thing happens there, that the queue is just not long enough, um, the cars back out, and so there needs to be a longer left turn queue there, or a, a second left turn lane. Um, and then on the ramps themselves, you know, this is no surprise, MoDOT has long uh, had some issues on the ramps. Uh, they they want to widen, you know, the westbound off ramp uh, to to have a dedicated left turn and a dedicated right. Um, they want to widen the uh, on ramp to go westbound on I-70 to have kind of this through right movement. Uh, the bridge they need dual lefts on the bridge. The bridge gets really backed up uh, during heavy traffic times, um, and so they have a plan in place to how to approach that. Uh, but clearly they don't have any funding to implement that plan. And uh, so um, what we have proposed is to take all of these improvements and uh, begin working with MoDOT and the City of Independence and partner in what that solution could look like, right? And so, um, you know, we'll we're going to, you know, really review what uh, the cost of these improvements are and step up as uh, a major contributor to fix that problem today so that long-term, when we need to utilize it, 
uh, five years from now or six years from now that that traffic's really moving really well. Uh, when we take tenants through, um, that it's not gonna be an issue from their perspective, that traffic's gonna, gonna function fine. Um, so those are some significant improvements that generally need to be done at, I would describe between Jackson and I-70, largely by adding a lane uh, to Little Blue Parkway is how you accomplish most of it. Um, and again, we're working with the city staff and MoDOT to try to come up with you know, some cost sharing. Uh, so MoDOT does have maybe some funds that they can put to it, um, but they need, a, they need a matching partner, right? So they need someone who's gonna put in matching dollars, and that's where we would step in and say, you know, we'll work with MoDOT, put matching dollars in, leverage our money to be able to get MoDOT money to come in here and fix this issue. <clears throat> So here's uh, real quickly some photos of some of the buildings that um, you know that, that exist in you know yeah, Riverside. I have a question. I have a question. Hey, I know you looked at the little blue parkway. Did you look at 78 Highway? That's mowed out there, correct? Yeah, that's mowed out 78 did Highway. Did you look at that? Because that's probably going to be an access road for you guys to go down through. We did. Yeah. So the nice thing about Little Blue Parkway and 78 Highway is generally there are four lane road sections. So they have enough capacity in and of themselves to operate with additional traffic, um, you know, much more traffic than we're going to, um, you know, put on those roads based on this plan. Um, and so it really comes down to the intersections themselves. Can the intersections function? Mm -hmm. My apologies, I thought you were talking about the area within our park. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and so what we know is that uh, about 40% of the car traffic, the employee traffic will go uh, that direction. That's what we're forecasting. So, you know, there will be some trucks that go that direction, but very few. Largely, the trucks will want to get back to I-70, and so uh, they'll be working to come back down the parkway and get to I-70, which is why that Jackson uh, intersection, 39th Street intersection, and those intersections are really important to that endeavor. Um, <clears throat> so mostly car traffic going uh, west out of the, out of the site. Um, and, you know, it, um, and, and generally, I would say, like, we analyze those intersections and no issue with any of the intersections at Truman Road or, um, you know, at, at that particular location. Um, and then we look at the corridor itself and say, um, you know, is that suitable for another, you know, 3,000 trips or 2,000 car trips, you know, per day? Um, and, you know, we'll, we can get into the weeds in, in terms of, you know, how... Yeah, it, it, it has been uh, analyzed and it's in our traffic study. And so, um, and again, I would say that we believe most of the trucks um, are going to head back to I-70. So there's going to be some trucks that go north, um, but, you know, it's very small percentage compared to the number of trucks that will go south. And there's also a big distinction between, you know, trucks for ITE. So, you know, we, we sit and we'll hear this probably tonight about, you know, trucks, you know, big trucks all the time, all the time. And that's, that's really not the case for distribution centers like this. So there is uh, truck traffic that are combination diesel trucks that are longer trucks that we're used to seeing. That makes up about 40% of all the quote unquote truck trips um, that we would see in and out of our park. Um, the other 60% is gonna be uh, panel uh, trucks, you know, single unit trucks, UPS, FedEx, um, even, you know, so anything over a certain gross vehicle weight uh, constitutes a truck in terms of ITE. And so, you know, even the uh, Sprinter vans and things like that will, you know, if we had a last mile facility would be considered, that would be considered truck traffic. So, <clears throat> so I think, you know, before we, because I understand the traffic is a, is a big issue, 
Um, you know, and it's something that um, I think if we go back here just a second, that you know, when you look at this land use and you say, you know, it's 10 million square feet of industrial buildings that are up in that area, I think what's important is to understand kind of how ITE looks at the trip generation rate, the number of trucks or the number of cars that go in and out of a building like that. And so, you know, for this type of land use, um, as I described, it's about 1.4 total trips uh, per thousand square feet. So if you look at the number of square footage that we have on this land site, that's, you know, 1,100 acres or so, um, that's about 14 trips per acre. Um, so if we compare that as an example to office, office generates about 10 trips per thousand. Uh, per thousand square feet, or about 150 trips per, per acre. So our 14 versus 150 for office, so it's very significant. Multifamily, uh, as an example, if you just use a lower kind of 10 dwelling units per acre, um, would generate 40 to 50 trips per acre. Um, you know, again, versus our 14. And single family, uh, we had a lot of folks say, you know, well, maybe we should just make the whole thing single family. Well, we've talked about floods and, you know, other reasons why it's maybe not a great single family site. But even if you did and you got a low density that was 2.75 or 3 dwelling units per acre, which, you know, some of you know is like very low density residential, um, that's still going to generate about 30 trips per acre. So, you know, probably two to three times as much traffic as we're proposing to put on here. So this is why when we say the parkway was built for this type of traffic. Look at our plan. Uh, the traffic study is very clear, even with the retail uses, that we'll generate about 37,000 trips per day. Um, the Harmony plan, the one that, you know, we were making great strides to uh, post-2007, uh, <clears throat> that would have generated 75 to 125,000 trips per day. So 37,000 versus, at the low end, 75,000 uh, trips per day. So, you know, the parkway was built for this purpose. Now, we're going you know, to hear some feedback that it's, you know, never was built for that reason. But it's a four-lane divided road uh, that has great capacity, has great speed limit, um, and it was built to support that 75 to 125,000 trips per day, uh, at least, right? And what we're proposing is a fraction of that. Mm -hmm. So, in the interest of time, and I know it's getting late, I'm going to bypass some, what the buildings look like. If anyone has spe specific questions about them, I'm glad to come back to them. Uh, you know, someone, uh, these are some interior building uh, shots some, some, from some of our tenants. And, you know, what I do want to just call your attention to is, um, you know, just how these tenants use the space for office space, right? So we office in one of our warehouse buildings in Riverside. So um, if you look at the top right uh, corner picture, uh, you can see that walkway up above. Um, that area um, is actually a mezzanine, so they really use the space, that 36-foot clear or the 40-foot clear that we talk about, to, to be able to build a two-story office model inside. So that's how our office is set up. So we put two-story glass on the corners of the buildings and in different places in support of that effort as well. So that's what makes our buildings a little bit different than, than most of our competition. Um, but, you know, someone drew the, uh, you know, there was a comment earlier about, you know, all of these $17, $18 an hour jobs. Well, they're absolutely right. There's going to be, um, you know, we know there's probably five to seven percent of this total square footage is going to be dedicated to office jobs and office uses. And that's the types of finishes that you see on this page. Um, so five to seven percent of that 10 million square feet is a pretty significant office park if we came here and said we would have office jobs for, you know, that, that you know, amount of square footage. Um, I think would be well received. And so that is ultimately what you get out of a project like this as well. So this really was a slide uh, intended in support of the comp plan amendment. Uh, so, um, you know, if you look at on the left side, you know, the 1968 
uh, comp plan really identified this area, the same area we're, we're proposing to take back to industrial. It identified it as an industrial area. Um, in 1993, the comp plan did the same thing, but this time it identified the Little Blue Expressway as the key for industrial development opportunities. And we heard people here tonight talk about, you know, why that's important and getting on a bus and going and getting the money uh, to be able to fund this. Uh, in 1999, uh, the I-1 zoning still remained uh, in the area that we're asking you to take back to industrial zoning tonight. Um, in 2005, as that same area is zoned industrial, uh, the, the Little Blue Parkway received its federal funding, you know, 31 to $32 million from the federal government to be able to build the parkway. It was then not until 2007 uh, that the Harmony Plan took place. Um, which then had the three to four million square feet of retail, 500,000 square feet of office, and 5,000 or so apartment units in that plan area. So again, you know, we talk about traffic and the benefits of taking our plan back to industrial. Um, and so from 2007 to 2022 to today, it's essentially 15 years that we had an opportunity to develop uh, this piece of property in a mixed use or a single family or a multifamily way. And it and it simply didn't happen. Um, by my count, there's about 56 units that got constructed in Newtown over that period of time. And, uh, you know, when we look at this and we say, in the last 10 years, we built 122 million square feet across the country. We built 20 million square feet in Kansas City alone. So that's the, that, when somebody says, we don't believe that you can build this over the next 10 or 12 or 13 years, well, that's, you know, the proof is, is in the past, right, and what we've been able to accomplish today. Um, so, you know, I think that's really the impact that, you know, we wanted to, uh, to talk about in terms of, you know, the, the benefit of uh, going to industrial. So to recap, you know, we really had two kind of main points of concern, right? We had the environmental impacts and the traffic impacts. Um, and so we've worked to address those concerns through the neighborhood meetings um, and going through, um, you know, these things, the use of the natural streams, buffers, uh, in compliance fully with the stormwater regulations. We work with Jackson County Parks and Rec um, on stormwater adjacent to their trails. So all of those dialogue, uh, that conversation is ongoing. Um, no trucks will utilize residential streets as we have the plan. So those trucks are focused on 78 Highway and onto Little Blue Parkway, which is really what the function of those two arterial roads is, are for. Um, <clears throat> and further, I would say, you know, we had some feedback from the community that said, well, why don't you if, limit trucks on our demise? If, you're, if you don't care if trucks are on Jackson or trucks are on our demise, why don't you why don't you limit them? Well, we don't have the power to limit that, but I will tell you that as the applicant, we fully support signing Jackson Drive and anything west of Little Blue Parkway on our demise as no trucks. Um, we have no issue with that. Our trucks should not be going down our demise. Um, they shouldn't be going up Jackson Avenue. So, you know, we fully support that effort. <clears throat> um, significant green space, we talked about the addition of 250 acres. Um, into the, the trail corridor. And, you know, generally, I would say, to kind of wrap this up, um, we're investing millions of dollars to solve the traffic issues that, will, that currently exist at Jackson and I-70. We're proposing to do that, millions of dollars that we will invest. You can't do that, nor has, would the previous applicant ever agreed to do that without a project of scale. So you can't say, why don't you just build three buildings? Well, you don't have the ability, the revenue off of three buildings to be able to step up as a partner and to be able to dedicate significant open space and to be able to invest in you know, career development centers and things like that that are impactful for the school district um, or to be able to you know, front traffic improvements that need to be done today that are generally a benefit to the community at large. So, Tried to get through as fast as possible, but um, if you have any questions, I'd be uh, glad to answer any. Sorry, my mic was off. Sorry, I know. 
Five minute, five minute break. Okay, everyone, we're going to start, and I do want to thank, this has been, you guys are amazing, honestly. I know that you're all very anxious to talk about this. This is a big project. It's, um, it's a big project, so I appreciate your patience. I know this is hard, um, but I do appreciate it. You have all been amazing, so thank you very much. Okay, with that, what we would like to do is go ahead and, and get to the comments um, so that we can get into the meat of this. So what we will do, I'm going to remind you that we're going to time. You get five minutes to talk. Please don't repeat what the person before you said for just time's sake and respect. Just kind of acknowledge that, yeah, I agree with that statement. That will help a lot. Um, so with that... We will start with anyone who is in favor of the project. And we do that just to be consistent, and so it's, it's the same thing every time, and that's what I kind of have memorized, so. Ms. Chairman, did we sign up, I was forced to sign up for this tonight to speak? Are we gonna go by that list, or are we just gonna go by the board? I do have the list. So what kind of um, messed me up a little bit was who is going to speak to which part and so now we're, we're past that, so we're good. Okay, thank you though. So all those in, anyone in favor of speaking about the rezoning, um, I have Eric Knipp is next on the list. Good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Knipp, 900 South Main Street, here in Independence, um, been there for been in Independence 30 years. My wife's a lifelong resident. I'm also a small business owner in Independence in the, uh, in Blue Ridge, at the Blue Ridge Bank building. So I'm very close to the project. And tonight I'm just speaking on behalf of the Independence Chamber of Commerce um, as representative of the Board of Directors. We are a 700 member strong organization of uh, business leaders in this community. And at our last board meeting, uh, we voted unanimous, unanimously in support of a resolution in support of this project. We think this project will bring uh, jobs, as was mentioned before. Um, it will bring support to our school districts, and we believe that this is a win for independence. Uh, workforce development um, is a hot topic in not only the chamber world, but also in Jefferson City at the Capitol. I was down there last week. Uh, we had an opportunity to listen to the governor, and if, if you've had that opportunity any time in the past, his main concern is workforce development. And we believe this project brings that to independence. Our school districts are working very hard to prepare the next generation of leaders in our community. And we have to have the jobs to support those. And I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. I'm Dan O'Neill. Once again, I live at 2700 Coachman. Uh, I'm a, a board member of the Economic Development Council, and uh, we are totally in favor of this uh, pr project development. Um, it's probably, for me, living here as long as I have in this community, it's the most exciting thing that I've actually seen happen uh, in that 65 years that I've lived here. So I would speak highly in favor of it. Uh, please adjust the zoning so that we can do this. Thank you. Sorry, next on the list, I have Beth Franklin. This unmute mute, I'm going to get the hang of it, I swear. <laughs> I uh, wrote out my comments so I won't forget anything. Name and address. <clears throat> My name is Beth Franklin. I live at 1945 South Lake Drive here in Independence. Um, I am speaking in support of this project. I have no financial interest in this development. My property does not abut to Little Blue Parkway. I have no special interest or self-interest in this project except 
I'm a resident of the city of Independence, and I want it to grow and thrive and be a great place to work and live for everyone who chooses to call it home. <clears throat> the Little Blue Parkway was developed specifically to attract development just like this. If the road needs to be repaired now, it will be repaired. If it needs more repair because there's more traffic and more truck traffic, it will be repaired. If traffic gets clogged up at I-70, they'll figure that out and they'll reconfigure the, the interchange. That's how progress works. It's change. This is a development we've been looking for for 30 years. That the developer is a local company with a great track record of building and operating developments like this all over the country is icing on the cake. Because we are in an election cycle, I hear a lot about what independence needs. I hear that we need more police, we need fewer homeless people, we need less blight and lower utility bills. I hear very few solutions. This development is a solution. This development will benefit everyone in the city by bringing good jobs to independence. Over time, good jobs and bright futures reduce crime, it reduces blight, it brings additional resources to help homeless people, and more commercial customers for IPL will reduce our utility costs. Independence needs good jobs here. We need them for our residents now and our children and our grandchildren in the future. I'm a real estate broker and home values increase, will increase when people want to live and work in independence. That goes for homes close to this development and homes across town. 50 years ago, independence built its economy on retail, and it was good while it lasted, but retail started changing well before the pandemic, and I don't believe it's gonna change back. We need to work with what's coming next. This project will be good for independence. I hope you will give thoughtful consideration to how it affects all of independence and not be swayed by those who are here because of their own self-interest or short-term short thinking. Thank you. Sorry, Orville Fisher. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Orville Fisher. I live at 22722 East 28th Street Court in Stone Ridge, that part of Independence that has a Blue Springs post office. Um, I have lived there for about 25 years. It's a little bit east and a little bit of south of what we're talking about. Um, I'm out on the uh, Little Blue Trail walking or riding my bike lots including yesterday, where I walked right past what we're talking about. Highly supportive of this because I think it will do the things that have been in the plans for a long time and excited about the prospects. I would urge you to vote in favor. Thank you. John Sheehy. Madam Chairman, John Sheehy, 25101 East Strode, uh, Blue Springs, Missouri. Like Orville, it's a uh, Blue Springs uh, mailing address, but I live in Independence. Um, I live in, in I, I live there on Strode Road, very close to the project. My office and business is on Seven Highway. Um, very familiar going through the area, and I'm in complete support of this for the future growth of independence. That's all. Thank you. Okay, that is who I have signed up to speak in favor of the rezoning. Is there anyone else who has come in that would like to speak in favor? Sir? Oh, have you been sworn in? Then, come on up here. Okay. 
Okay, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth in front of this commission? Say yes. I do. Thank you. Okay. Feel free to say your name and address for us, please. My name is Steve Kellogg. I live at 1820 South Ann Court in Independence, 64057, which is in the Remington subdivision just up the hill from the um, Metropolitan Community College is there at uh, Jackson and uh, 78 Highway. Okay. And uh, so I overlook the valley, and I'm supportive of this project. I think it'll do great things for us. Thank you. Are you sworn in? Yes, I'm sworn in. I think I was on the list that says I was for it. Um, I'm Damon Miles. I live here in Independence, 19305 East 5th Terrace Court North. Um, I'm exactly two miles from the location of this site, so when I say it's in my backyard, it's in my backyard there at Jones Road in Salisbury. Um, I'm for this project as long as we do it right. And that's the message I want to send tonight, so I don't know if I should have checked the wrong list or the right list, for list or against. I know this is zoning, so some of the things I'm going to bring up might not fall in the category of zoning, but I've noticed everybody else is talking about good jobs and good finance and what it's going to do and what it's going to bring to the community. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. If we're going to do this project, we need to do it right. I had a foreman who used to tell me all the time, he said, do it right the first time because we don't have time to do it twice. And in independence, we don't have time to do it twice and we don't, won't have the ability to do it twice. We need development in independence and we need money in independence. And everybody knows that, city council knows that, you guys know that. But what we need is developers to do it right. What developers are doing across Kansas City to let you know is they're, they're coming in, they're getting the opportunity, and then they're doing it as cheap as they can. And I know North Point sometimes does it right, and sometimes they do it cheap. I'll be the first one to say, I've heard a lot of people say good things about them, heard a lot of people say bad things about them. The fact is that they will do it right if they're forced to do it right or they're told to do it right. So what we need is we need North Point to come to the table and talk to the Kansas City Greater Building Trades and come up with an agreement to do this right, using local people to build. There's a developer in North Kansas City that literally brings 15 passenger van full of individuals in to do the job. If somebody gets hurt, they drop them off at the emergency room, that's their workman comp program, and then they leave. It's hard to believe that developers would do that, but the fact is, in, on what, some of the biggest projects there is here in the United States, this has happened. Here's a picture of right here, Hard Rock Casino down in Louisiana, where the building collapsed. And how they tried to solve the problem, these developers tried to solve the problem, is they're gonna deport the people that were working on the job. That way they wouldn't be able to testify against them in the court. So what I'm saying is if we're gonna do this job, we're gonna do it right. We're gonna do it with local contractors. We're gonna have agreements that says, hey, we're gonna use local contractors. We're gonna use local workforce. We're gonna pay the right amount of money. We're gonna pay a living wage. In this situation with the highways and the roads and everything, and uh, they're talking about tax abatements and all other types of things, they need to do a prevailing wage. Prevailing wage is just simply the minimum wage for a construction worker for the type of work we do. They, they manage the hours, it's, a, it's an average of what they do. They need to have contractors that provide health insurance. They need to have contractors that give retirement benefits. Madam Chair. Three minutes. While I appreciate the uh, gentleman's comments, they really don't get to rezoning of the property. We, our role as the Planning Commission is whether or not to rezone property from the current zoning to, oh, shoot, I should have paused this, sorry. Um, our, our role as the Planning Commission is to make a recommendation to the City Council whether to take zoning from one type to another. That's the application. There are three applications in front of the, the Commission this evening. This Commission has no authority, no ability to do anything at all about 
the type of workers that would be put on a particular job, what whether prevailing wage would be applied or anything like that. That's outside of our realm and it's not relevant to our conversation this evening. It does need to stay focused towards the issue of should it be rezoned or not. Okay, thank you, Councillor. I agree, but everybody else talked about jobs, zoning, and the amount of money that's gonna bring into the community, which all had to do with jobs, creating jobs, giving jobs to our high school students, give a job for everybody. That's the only reason I brought it up. I'll finish with one last point and sit down. Thank you guys for working hard. North Point has signed agreements to make these jobs right in the past before they bring it to city council where they do have a say. North Point needs to sit down with the Greater Kansas City Building and Trades and the construction workers in local Kansas City and make a deal. Thank you. Don't make me use this, unless you're gonna be here till 1 a.m. No offense, I, I enjoy applause. Um, okay, is there anyone else who wants to speak? No. <laughs> um, where was I? Is there anyone else who would like to speak for this project, the rezoning, passing the rezoning? Okay, we are ready to go to, is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition of this case? And first I have Mark Thatcher. Mark Thatcher, 19501 East Missouri 78 Highway, Independence 64057. Thank you. My house is on Missouri 78 Highway, just west of Holkey Road and I speak in opposition, strong opposition, to North Point's development rezoning request for the proposed Eastgate Commerce Center. Both my wife and I were born in and have always lived in the city of Independence, and in addition, we were both raised within two miles of this proposed development. I say all this to emphasize that we are intimately familiar with the area. As stated already, much of this land was originally part of the Harmony development, whose rezoning was approved by the, this commission back in 2007, however, what was approved then is markedly different from what is being proposed now. Beforehand, it was a mixture of residential, office, and commercial space in order to cultivate more of a small community atmosphere. These new rezoning requests are for a mixture of manufacturing, transportation, and wholesale activities, office and research facilities, industrial warehouse buildings with semi-truck trailer parking, retail, and services. The Planning Commission staff has stated in the documentation for this evening, that industrial land use, quote, may encompass a broad range of intensities and activities, including uses with outdoor activities and the potential for external impacts, such as odor, noise, and vibration during all parts of the day and night. I attended North Point, North Point Development's open house on March 1st and listened to their presentations. One question was asked if there was any tenants already expressing interest in occupying any of these proposed buildings, to which the answer was no, but they expected to have them. In other words, there's absolutely no guarantee that if they build it, they will come. Related to this, how many employment opportunities do we regularly see in our city right now in the surrounding area? Nearly every business has a now hiring sign posted prominently, yet how many of these positions still remain vacant? Unfilled positions limit basic services now, let alone for additional business growth right now. My wife and I recently drove a small sample of roadways in Independence to quantify the magnitude of empty or abandoned buildings. On a short stretch of US 40 Highway and then Noland Road, we noted nearly 40 empty buildings or groups of buildings. Independence does not need any more empty buildings as these buildings could likely become. In these requests, North Point Development expects semi-truck traffic to primarily use Little Blue Parkway and expects personal traffic, personal vehicular traffic to primarily use Missouri 78 Highway. Missouri 78 Highway was presented as being a four-lane roadway, but that's only east of Truman Road. West of Truman Road, it is a two-lane roadway for a distance of two and a quarter miles. This portion is where my and other residents' driveways are. 
ask anyone living there how busy and dangerous it is now, let alone what it would be like in the future if this development is allowed to go forward. The proposed area for this development is in a floodplain. It is described as having a low-lying nature for a significant portion of the area and that innovative earthwork and hydrology practices will be needed to effectively deal with these challenges. Everyone knows this who lives or has lived in the vicinity because it regularly floods. After any substantial rain, necessary road is always covered with water. The overarching question should be, why add more concrete surfaces to an existing floodplain than have to expend efforts to mitigate the problem which was aggravated by the additional concrete? It just doesn't make sense. The Little Blue Trace Trail is truly a gem for the area. I've used the trail several times where it winds between fields and the Little Blue River. It's a calming experience apart from traffic and other distractions that surround our everyday world. If this development is allowed to move forward, One portions, of this trail, yeah, portions of this trail will no longer be a welcome escape and it will nearly be reduced to an alleyway next to buildings even after the changes that North Point has already made. Because of these considerations I've listed, I request the Planning Commission to deny the multiple rezoning requests of North Point development for the Eastgate Commerce Center. One of the comprehensive plan guiding principles for this commission is to, quote, provide sufficient opportunities for industrial development sites within the community and promote, promote diversification of the city's commercial industrial base, unquote. If you vote to approve these rezonings, in my opinion, you might as well amend it to say, to the detriment of the citizens of Independence, Missouri. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list, list is Kenneth Love. Good evening, Chairman, Vice Chairman, Commission members. Thank you all for being awake and being here this long. I didn't know which State your name and address. My name is Kenneth Love. Thank you. I live at 16808 East George Franklin Drive, Independence 64055. I really didn't know which list to sign tonight. <laughs> so what I have to say might jump a little back and forth, and I hope it's allowed. Fine. So first off, I'm going to start off asking our chairman, if you're a member of the Community Christ Church. I am. With you or a member, I ask that you resign yourself from voting tonight. Due to the fact most of this property is owned by the Community Trice Church. That as, is the reason I'm asking. As Move. I understand it, it's not a conflict, but I will yield to the counselor to... I'm a member also. You're a member also. What, what did you we ask We can address to do? this at the end of Mr. Love's comments. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, um, moving forward, like I said, this project has nothing good for me or nothing bad for me. I see it as some goodness for the city of Independence, and I see it for some badness of the city of Independence. I personally stand with the residents of Independence. If the residents speak up and tell y'all they don't want this, that's where I'm going to stand is with the resident. This is nothing political, but that's where I stand. He talked about hourly jobs and what type of jobs it might bring. The word might. We don't know what might means. Every place we look around the city of Independence, they're hiring. They are hiring. They cannot fill these jobs. Jobs at $15 an hour right now cannot pay a rental place that's going to be built for $1,400 a month unless you've got three people living there. How do I know that? It's because I am an investor here in the city of Independence. I own 47 units, and I know what rent and work jobs pay and what you can afford just by telling me your salary. And for someone to say... $1,400, let me tell you, that's going to be hard to fill those apartments. Very hard. Before I walk away tonight, this has already been said, 
But I stand with the brothers and sisters of the union trades, of the Teamsters Union, bricklayers, or whatever union they're in. And I believe in prevailing wage. We have a situation in the city of Independence, and shaking your head is not right, sir. Um, but anyway... Um, I think all he's do we have to stay on the rezoning issue. I am staying on it. Okay. Be due to the fact a government job came to the city of Independence that was supposed to be prevailing wage, and it still ain't being paid today. If you're union, you're union. If you're not, you're not. But I'm a union, and everybody in here, hoorah! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Is it Damon? Miles, you did, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Is there anyone... Um, who did not sign up that wishes to speak in opposition. Okay, are you sworn in? Are you sworn in? And come on up. No worries. Yes, state your name and address. My name's Bob Brackenbury. I live, live at uh, 3111. Uh, South Arrowhead Drive, Independence, Missouri, 64057. Uh, I've got a few concerns about, I, you know, the warehouse part of the project on the north end looks like a pretty good deal. You know, it's, there's not a lot of jobs, warehouse jobs, and a lot of them, if you've watched, watched anything lately, are getting automated, totally automated. And since there'll be new, new warehouses, who knows? Of course, it 70 years old, 15 years from now, I won't care one way or the other. <laughs> but uh, I'm kind of thinking about uh, the legacy we're leaving our kids 20 years down the road. And I'm thinking on the south end, the retail, there's jobs, uh, restaurant jobs off of 39th Street that uh, – aren't being filled. Do you want to pull the mic up a little closer? Okay. Thank you. There's, there's restaurant jobs on 39th Street by Independent Center and around there that aren't being filled. There's a place that was finished, a new place that was finished off of uh, Jackson and 39th Street a year ago, and it just got sold, I think, because they just finished it up. You know, the building's been finished sitting there. I don't think we need any more retail, and especially, I don't know what we're going to do with Independence Center if you throw more competition at it. Is there any plan for that? That's just a question I have. What are we going to do? I mean, it's half empty, and we're going to put in new retail? That just doesn't make any sense to me. And that's all I got to say. I, like I say, North Park, yeah, cool. The retail on the south end, I don't know. I appreciate you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? You did? Yeah. Seriously, twice? Oh, no, no, no. If you've already been sworn in. In my office, it work when you guys did it on the internet. Oh. You want me to do it live? You want to do it live? Do it live on the Bible. Okay. What's that? No, you can wear the hat. It's very handsome. Okay. We'll raise your right hand. It is. Do you promise to tell the whole truth in front of this oh, yeah. commission? I'm good about that. Thank you. I don't cupcake. All right. You are officially sworn in. And if you'll just state your name and address, that would be fantastic. My name is Keith Fuliani. I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of uh, Heart of America Pop Warner at 2801 South Necessary Road. And the only concerns we have. <clears throat> would be that road. And it's just real simple. We use it from August till November, and we use it from March to June. It is a volunteer basis. We need access to that road and our, our property at all times. It's all volunteer mowing and taking care of it. We've discussed it. 
I think at the last meeting, or the last, or uh, over Cassell and staff. So, but the concern is, is <clears throat> necessary road is a little windy and it's a straight drop off, right? You got about a six to eight foot drop off on the left and then you got our ditch, which is, it, it's just horrible. So the concern is, is they're putting about three more entrances in on that, that road <clears throat> and it's a two lane and it's straight. <clears throat> What's that mean? Oh, you have, you've spoken for one minute. You get five. Oh, okay. You're only at one, so keep going. <laughs> oh, all right, cool. I mean, I, that'll work. So the concern is, is the traffic. Okay. Saturdays, we'll end up with 15 to 3,000 cars. Every hour and a half to two hours, there's 400, 500 cars pulling in and out, getting their little kids there. Remember, we're all, we're all about the youth. I don't care about big business. I don't care about your politics, nothing else. I care about the kids of Independence, making sure we got a good place for them to play. We've been here for over 50 years. Don Rammel started this league. So I just want to make sure that road is always going to be, I mean, I don't know how they're going to do I, I would assume if you're going to do work on that road, it's got to have to be between Thanksgiving to March. And that's it. So if there's a tear out or anything like that, I'm giving you your time. So that's what you tell them. Thank you. It is a it's question we will ask. I can give my time to somebody else. I've seen that before. Can you do that? Sure. So whoever wants to waste I my think time that's can take it. Different venue, but <laughs> thank All you. All right. I just want to make sure that's done. I appreciate it. Thank you. Is there, <laughs> is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition of this case? Come on up. Okay, this wonderful woman first, and then you may go after her. Okay, are you sworn in, sir? Come on up. We'll swear you both in at the same time. No, and I won't make you laugh, because that's miserable. Okay, raise your right hand, please. Do you um, promise to tell the truth before this commission? If so, say yes. Thank you. Hi, my name's Teresa Tweedy. I live at 3111 South Arrowhead Drive, Independence, Missouri. 64057, I'm a retired nurse. Thank you. For 37 years. <clears throat> um, I just don't understand, I'm not a zoning person that knows all that, but I don't understand how we could consider rezoning anything at this point when traffic seems to be such a big issue. And I've heard two or three times from the other side, yeah, that's something we got to look into. Yeah, that's something we should check out. And being concerned, I mean, I'm happy that the CEO of HCA, I'm happy that they're in favor of it, but maybe the other thousands of people that work there wouldn't be. My concern is the traffic coming off, off of I-70 coming down there is going to be right in front of the hospital. What if you have a sick child or, or a, an ambulance that needs to get through from a heart attack and I, you've got all this traffic backed up? Well, that seems to be something they want to look into. I think they should look into it and have an answer for us before we talk about rezoning anything. Thank you. Thank you very much. State your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Jason Shue. I live at 3017 Bryn Mawr, uh, Artie Mize in Bryn Mawr. And we have enough trouble over there as it is. I don't, I, I don't want this, and I don't think it's good for this city either. We can't fill the residential or industrial stuff we have now. What's going to happen when we build more? You, you say it's going to create jobs. How do you know it's going to create jobs for independent citizens? You can't even staff the bars, restaurants, and companies that we already have in independence. The traffic over there is a nightmare. They use Artie Mize as a drag strip. We don't have enough cops to patrol this. We don't have enough cops to deal with the crime it's going to bring. The people that are going to bring that it's going to bring in that we don't want over there. It's going to ruin the beautiful side of Independence. That's the only thing left in the city that isn't trashed or torn up is that side of town. And you put these industrial companies in there, and that's what's going to happen. 
So I, I just I have no faith. I, I don't see it. It doesn't make any sense. And I hope you guys have voted down. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the truth in front of this commission? Thank you. State your name and address, please. My name is Mary Hoff, and I live at 400 North Bly Road. And I've lived there, Howard and I have lived there for 26, 26 years now. Um, I grew up, went to Fort Osage, graduated from the fort, and, and I wish I could show you the pictures from my driveway of the cornfield and the so soybean fields that we look at now. You know, when you, when you come up from off of 78 Highway and you're heading north on Bly, I am the second house right there, two-story brick home. And the view we have right now is just amazing. And we do see eagles. And there is an eagle's nest across 78 Highway there from, from where we live. We've seen them. And uh, we just, we weren't even aware of any of the meetings that they had. So I don't know, that by the time we saw the sign, the meetings were done. So we don't even know what all the plans were gonna, gonna be. So we don't know if they're gonna try to want, run city sewers then up our street, because we're all on septic. So does that mean that's gonna cost us money? And how is that gonna affect our property value there? You know, our homes, because all of us have acreage. My next door neighbor that just moved in in the end of October paid $435,000 for his home on 10 acres. And he is right there, he's the first house past the bridge. So how does that affect our homes there? You know, our value, you know, that's part of my retirement plan our home to eventually have it all fixed and sell it for Howard and I to retire with, you know? And I'm sure a lot of the other neighbors up the street feel the same way. There's a lot of old timers there that have lived there longer than I have. But I like to see development, but not that close to our homes. If, if they could stay on the south side of 78, that would be so much better. Because like I said, right there, we were always told there was going to be a park across the street when we went to the meetings back in 07. You know, and I thought that'd be great, you know, to have parkland over there. And we love the farmland. I don't mind the farmers coming in now. We love that. But to have huge buildings as my view from my home, we'll have to move. We'll have to try to sell. And then am I going to get the money out of my home that, that is worth? You know, we don't think we will. And it's not just me, and I, and I don't know why my other neighbors aren't here. They should be, a lot of them still work. But yeah, that's our biggest fear, is, is to lose the value on our property. And like I said, that'll be my view out of my, my living room window, is looking right at those buildings. And I know none of you would want that, you know, when you've been used to looking at corn and soybean, you know, for 26 years like we have. You know, we grew up there. I, I've lived in Independence my whole life, 63 years, and in this area, you know. And, but if that would happen, Howard and we would, we'd have to leave Jackson County. We'd have to move out because we're, we still feel like we're kind of in the country, right, where we're at, but we're in the city, you know. But it, we won't have that country kind of feeling anymore with these big buildings going in right down the street from us. And like I said, if we have to, everybody on our street has to hook into sewers, I don't know what kind of money that is. You know, we're not wealthy families by all means on that street to where some people may have to move because they couldn't even afford to hook into the sewer. So, you know, that's, that's just our opinion, you know, and I'm speaking for a lot of my neighbors. There's, there's not many houses on our street. What is there, honey? Maybe 10? Maybe 80. Yeah, I don't know, but thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? I'll take off my glasses so I make sure I don't miss anybody. Okay, seeing none, I'm going to declare the, no, 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 what? Give the uh, applicant a chance 
Oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> the applicant, would you please come up and respond? Yeah, so um, in, in response to, um, you know, the speculative nature of the buildings, um, I think, you know, I tried to cover that well in the presentation that, you know, of the 20 million square feet that we built in the Kansas City area, probably 17 to 18 million square feet of that is, uh, was speculative when we built it. And um, it's, you know, it's the reality of the economy that we're in. Uh, that you build a speculative building to get a tenant in and to be successful. So I think one of the big issues here that, um, you know, maybe is, you know, I perceive it to, you know, that I know the, the plan really well, so I, I know this, but um, for people seeing it, you know, for the first time or, or, you know, maybe for the second or third time after some of our community meetings, and that is, you know, this is not, 10 million square feet of industrial buildings that are that's going up overnight. So, you know, we'll start with one to two buildings as a phase one, um, and we'll start uh, one of those buildings uh, south. Um, we'll start one of those buildings south uh, at the uh, business park plan, um, you know, just north of uh, uh, Necessary Road intersection. So, you know, one of those uh, buildings would suit a different type of tenant than the larger format building that you see, you know, on the, uh, as we get up closer to uh, Truman Road. And so that second building that we would start, you know, kind of two at the same time would be that larger building, um, you know, circled in red there on the, on the left side, uh, just south of Truman Road, kind of sandwiched between Little Blue Parkway and, and 78 Highway. So yeah, the idea. Left. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, uh, so the idea here is really that um, you know once a building gets leased 80 percent, we would start the next building. So and we really approach this to say let's start uh, up against all of the existing I-1 zoning, and move east. So stay away from the trail as long as possible. We believe we're gonna be fully successful over the next decade to build this park out. But if we're not, you, you don't have buildings up against the trail as a phase one. You have buildings that are generally adjacent to Barbara Concrete and, and uh, Independence Power and Light as a phase one. And so, you know, the approach here is to build one or two buildings every year uh, as on demand for the next, you know, 12, 13 years. So it is a phased project for, in that regard, which also allows us to control, you know, and, and review continually the traffic issue. And in response to, um, you know, the traffic that comes off of I-70, this is exactly why we did an extensive traffic study to, to identify those issues. And to say that we're putting that off and not looking at it yet, we, we certainly haven't put it off. We paid for an extensive traffic study to review those issues, and we're stepping up to say, if that's a three or four million dollar improvement, we're gonna help with that. And so we're continuing to work with MoDOT and figure out how we can leverage our money to, to come up with a solution here quickly on, on that existing traffic issue. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, houses that are built uh, overlooking the valley, I would say that if the Harmony plan was built with all of the mixed use, you would lose your view of the cornfields and, and that as well. Um, but, you know, I, I, in, in terms of, you know, home values, I would, I would say look at, um, you know, our park at Horizons. But that park has been fully developed um, and then uh, a real estate developer came in for single family and built houses overlooking our park, uh, right adjacent to the highway. Um, they look down, generally have the same views, and those houses felt, sell for seven to $800,000 today. So, you know, we don't perceive that to be uh, a, an issue, which is exactly why we use environmental policy documents to stay 1,200, 1,300 feet away from uh, existing houses so that we aren't, uh, uh, you know, impactful to in that regard. Um, I think I've covered that. The other comment was regarding portions of the trail that are unusable due to the location of the buildings. So, again, we, 
you know, the portions of the plan that we've tried to stay, you know, 450 to 500 feet away from the trail when buildings couldn't, uh, you know, in those areas adjacent to 78 Highway, we got rid of the building. So we've lost square footage, uh, still purchasing the ground and have the cost into it. Um, but we've lost that square footage and that coverage um, in order to make the trail more usable and to dedicate more open space, um, you know, that 250 plus acres that we talk about. Area E, obviously north of 78, east of Little Blue. I'm, I'm looking at Area E as it exists presently and as it would exist in the proposed plan, I think phase two. Talk about that. Uh, the, the aesthetics, uh, it appear to be quite a bit of lakes in that area. Um, yeah. And yet we do have coming out of the northern part of uh, that development is Bly Road. Mm -hmm. Talk about that for me. Yeah. So, you know, uh, um, this really goes back to the environmental policy that I spoke about, you know, the 1,200 to 1,300 feet away that we want to be. Um, we do that for a number of different reasons, one of which is air quality. The other is for sound mitigation so that we know that you know, the sound generated by a site like that, you know, by the time you go 500 feet that that sound level has dropped down to, a, you know, a, essentially a residential standard. So by doubling that distance again, 1,000 or 1,200 feet, it really, really minimizes the amount of um, sound that comes uh, from these buildings. And, you know, and so there's a lot of um, that pre-planning that goes into it. And so when we look at a site like that area that you're referencing adjacent to Bly Road, we say, you know, there's floodplain in some of those areas. So you talk about creative uh, soil management. Well, you know, the, the creative part of the soil management is really to over excavate in some of these areas and create lakes and create larger, uh, you know, bodies of water like that where you can use the soil and build up the building pad itself. And so there's a period of time where that building will need to settle and there's other structural things that you can do for a building like this. Um, but our goal has been to take all of that volume that we want to mitigate. So essentially for every cubic foot of dirt that you, you know, put into the floodplain, you take a cubic foot of dirt out. So you have equivalent volumes in that same area. So, you know, that's a practice that we work with FEMA regularly on. Um, and so what we did is we took all of those flood compensation areas and we pushed them to the north adjacent to where that limited, where that residential was that, you know, that's 1,200 and 1,300 feet away from us. So, you know, those are just good planning principles as opposed to pushing the buildings further north and doing flood compensation somewhere else. We kind of look at, you know, how can we achieve, you know, all the results that we need to achieve, but then still apply those good planning principles. I'm confident that you'll be able to answer this because you talked about Spring Branch, which is a very small creek. So tell me about the water quality in these lakes in and about the warehousing, what utilities and accommodations to residents that these bodies of water will offer, if any. Yeah, so, you know, the accommodation that those uh, water bodies offer, so when we approach stormwater, and we had this conversation with Jackson County Parks and Rec as well, so they're very interested in how stormwater is managed mm -hmm. adjacent to their trail. Um, so we apply what's commonly referred to as kind of a treatment train. Um, so the stormwater that runs off of our building and off of our truck court goes into like a bioswale and filters and some other things that you can apply uh, adjacent to the truck court. Um, that's really largely for water quality aspects, so to filter, our, filter out some of the pollutants that might be on any parking lot, shopping center, uh, you know, industrial building, whatever the case may be. And so that stormwater comes off of that area, runs through those filters, and then eventually makes its way into um, these larger pond areas. And so that allows additional sediments to fall out. 
um, you know, other kind of wetland plant material uh, work to clean up the water as well. And so the larger water bodies actually serve a couple of purposes. One, they clean up uh, the stormwater as we were talking about, and two, they control the volume of stormwater. And so part of the storm drainage study that has been submitted is really to focus on water quality. That's a big uh, component of this plan overall. Um, and then accommodate the flood volume, um, you know, kind of uh, cubic foot for cubic foot to make sure that we haven't lost any flood volume for uh, downstream properties. So the nice thing is that this particular project is very close to the Missouri River. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, close in that regard in the sense that you don't have a lot of adjacent properties. Most of uh, the property that the, the creek goes through or the Blue River goes through is all owned by Jackson County uh, Parks and Rec. So this is why we continue to dialogue with them about the project and the stormwater concepts. Um, and, and, you know, so in the end, it's an extensive stormwater plan that will need to be uh, developed on a building by building basis. And, but we know generally that these are the components by which that plan will will be achieved, and so we incorporate them into the planning effort up front. Tell me about the water quality. Yeah. And impediments to public access and public usage. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of impediments to public access and public usage, um, you know, I, I would say that what we've offered here is lakes and wetland areas and things adjacent to uh, the Little Blue Trail that offer additional public access and public usage. Um, so, you know, our goal is in, uh, adjacent to the dog park um, and that area adjacent to Little Blue Trace Trail is to actually create a lake there, um, you know, with plant materials around it and make it, you know, real natural. Um, that, you know, people can use and walk around. That would be, again, part of, hopefully, part of Jackson County Park and Rec's, uh, uh, you know, trail system. Um, but that ultimately, that's a passive recreation use that we would create with this project. We had one speaker who was speaking on behalf of this project talk about somewhere in Texas, his open fields that were lost. We have a lady who is speaking in opposition who talks about the loss of a soybean field or a corn field. Tell me your thoughts visually. Yeah. Tell me the story of what we lose and what we gain. Sure. Well, just, you know, in terms of stormwater and water quality, I would tell you that generally farm fields um, are have a lot of pesticide usage and things on them. Um, and there's no water quality basins that capture that runoff from a site today uh, before it goes into the Little Blue. Um, that's a, a big difference between what exists today versus what you know would exist with a development like this. There's a, there's a thought out stormwater approach to a planned project like this that doesn't exist today. In addition, I would tell you that uh, Jackson County Parks and Rec, when we had our initial meeting with them, the, one of their biggest concerns is the nutrients that come off of the farm field today, it's uncontrollable, the erosion and sedimentation that goes into a little blue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and they were, um, you know, supportive of our approach. We walked through that stormwater approach with them. So again, you know, more to dialogue with them about later this week and, and ongoing. Um, but, you know, they, they have a vested interest in how stormwater is managed adjacent to their trail in that corridor. And, um, you know, we, we have started that conversation. It's gone really well so far in terms of how we would approach it. And they've been, uh, I believe, on the same page with us. Final one. Wildlife, ducks, geese, will they survive in that water? Yeah, they, they will. So, um, you know, someone brought up uh, the American bald eagle and, um, you know, and I would just say, if you drive, uh, I've seen it, I go to our park at uh, 210 Highway and 291, there's many uh, lakes there as well, um, you know, kind of for a different purpose, uh, volume control there as well, but um, many geese, uh, you know, migratory birds, uh, eagles, um, we see lots of bald eagles uh, in that whole area. So, you know, the use of or having buildings in that valley 
um, doesn't detour those migratory birds and, and birds of prey from uh, using it. In fact, I would argue that if we see it there, and you know, and that's adjacent to an intermodal facility, um, you know, providing this thousand acre corridor, um, you know, and adding to that thousand acre corridor um, by you know the ponds and wetlands and things that we'll create with this project, uh, only further the the fact that we'll see migratory birds and other wildlife using it. I mean, you know, just the north end of our project alone is probably 200, uh, probably 150 to 200 acres of ponds and wetlands that we'll create adjacent to, uh, in, adjacent to uh, the existing rail corridor that goes uh, on the north side right now. So, I lied. One final question. <laughs> and sorry about that. There are times when the impossible happens and use, residential use, is simply in spite of very best efforts and the bigger picture. There is no coexistence simply for whatever reason. What would you do? We got, let's say we got, hypothetically, this is a hypothetical question, of course. We got eight or 10 houses that, for whatever reason, simply cannot work there in that blight road segment. What do we do? What? The city councilman is getting phone calls. They don't like that. Mm -hmm. Mayor's getting phone calls. Planning Commission staff's getting phone calls. Yeah. It's a mess. It's just whatever reason the coexistence is not working. How do we fix it? <clears throat> well, you know, I would say, one, we're, we're positing that the coexistence can't work. Um, you know, w we feel very strongly that we have a lot of neighborhoods that are a whole lot closer than 1,200, 1,300 feet away um, where that coexistence works just fine. Um, and, you know, when it, uh, I certainly am going to introduce myself tonight to make sure that, you know, we can have an ongoing dialogue about that and what we can do to work with them. I mean, that's part of really being a community stakeholder and a good neighbor here. Um, and so, you know, that's not the issue. Like, we'll continue to work with our adjacent neighbors. We do that um, in many communities all over um, to, you know, find out what the, what the specific issue is that we need to try to solve and come up with a, a solution. Um, so, you know, I think we would just ask to give it time to, to see that, you know, the fact that we've dedicated so much open space between us and them, um, the addition of, a, you know, a trail system that we're putting in along the rail corridor, um, all of those types of things that just kind of go to, you know, keep that whole area a little bit more natural. Um, I think is a is an opportunity uh, for us to coexist there and use that buffer uh, between us and the, the single family residential. Um, but we, you know, we certainly our commitment as a neighbor is to continue to have conversations about that. And you know, and um, we've we're, we actually got uh, you know uh, criticized for the large signs that we put up advertising the neighborhood meetings. Um, because they were too large, but, you know, I think that, you know, our goal was to try to broadcast it to as many people as we possibly could to get them to one of the three uh, community meetings, and we'll sit down specifically and dialogue with the people on Blair Road. And I believe you'll do the right thing. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there anyone else who has questions or concerns? Madam Chair, I got some questions here. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, notes I wrote down. Uh, any type of tax abatement going on that we're gonna need to know about or is that something we need to worry about? I mean. Mm -hmm. That would be irrelevant That'd for be tonight's perfect. meeting. Okay. It would be addressed um, at other meetings. Okay, then it's on, be back to the city planning guys here. I know 78 Highway is not our road, but is there any plans of widening it to four lanes all the way that we know of? Uh, not for widening per se, but we do have as part of their um, corridor plan, uh, when you start looking at phase four, there are some potential impacts to turning lane movements. Um, and as you go into phase three and four, 
we see that along Missouri 78 and up the 7 Highway. Um, and then, but again, this is, these are phase projects. So we have to be focused as to what phase we're looking at immediately versus the final build out, which could be 10, 15 years from now. <clears throat> Part of that also, we, when our traffic crew looked at, uh, looked at their plan, um, part of in phase three, for example, 78 highway and, and, or, and seven highway, uh, looking at some left and right turn lane movements, uh, improvements for there. And obviously 78 is a state highway, so MoDOT would have to be involved in the approval of those as well. But as we see phase four happening um, and we look at the area, what I'm gonna call the south portion or the portion down by Artie Mize and necessary road, and then the portion of the middle portion uh, near Truman Road and 78 Highway. When that BP finally gets built out, let's say in a phase four, there would have to be some turning lane movements, uh, improvements and signal improvements at 78 and Truman Road. Okay, so that's basically gonna be left up to MoDOT that we'll have to push them to do that, correct? Uh, anything on 78 would eventually be approved by MoDOT, yes. Okay, then let's go to Necessary Road, like what the gentleman brought up about where they're gonna have a bunch of cars, that's, that's in the first phase, would that we be able to work around their time frame with all the cars? Yeah, so specifically why we pick the building we do is we would do that, that building on the north uh, side away from the Pop Warner fields. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, and that allows Pop Warner to continue to get their access um, off of Artie Mize Road. But, you know, we'll sit with them and specifically work through a plan. I think what our goal would be is to, um, you know, obviously we would maintain access to them, uh, no problem. Um, but if we can build the intersection at uh, Necessary and Little Blue Parkway and extend that road in and give them a place where uh, they have two points of access, then when the time comes where we have to do some improvement to necessary road when we develop on that portion of the site. Um, then at that point, we can talk about how do we divert some of their traffic to be able to get back to the signal that we would install with our first, or uh, the intersection that we have with our first building, and then work on road improvements with okay. them. Okay, as long as you, you guys will work with them, that sounds great to me. Yeah. My next question is gonna be probably back to the city again. What kind of price, tax price, is this gonna cost our taxes for electric and sewer upgrades out there since there's probably not enough power out there to do all this? So when we had discussions with all the utility departments, um, and that included IPL as well as water and sewer, um, there would definitely have to be some transmission line improvements. Um, and I believe uh, the CIP, they kind of point out about potentially $4 million worth of um, improvements. Now understand, those uh, build-outs would be um, placed on the development as those projects progress, and um, as well as water and sewer. So there is capacity. Um, a substation, from what I understand, from IPL would have to be built out in that general area. Um, and then there is some transmission lines that are currently out there, and the applicant's aware of, uh, of those locations as well. Um, to maybe, does so that answer your question on that? tax dollars that we'll have to spend, or is that part of his? Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, I would just say, I know that wasn't a question directly for from, nah. from me, but you know, this is part and parcel of why we start where we start and we uh -huh. phase the development in. And so, you know, we start here at 78 and Truman Road in that area south of Truman Road on the west side because uh -huh. that's where the utility infrastructure is today. Right. So as we develop and we move east, we pull that infrastructure with us. So that's really what he's talking okay, so about. Okay, you guys that's, basically, okay. That's Tony, right. That's why I was wanting that answer because yeah. I wasn't So we sure. extend water mains, we extend sewers, we extend Well, because I saw something that we are going to have to pay for $8 million of stuff out there, and I was trying to figure out, is that taxes or is that, well, it's got to be taxes if it's part of $8 million on our part for substations and stuff. Uh, or you, you might be referring to the capital improvement yeah, capital project. Improvement yeah, project. that was yeah. like, I think it was 4.5 or 4.6 million, um, but understand that those improvements would end up the, the costs would be bared by the development as it continues out in that direction. Okay, I just want to make sure of that then. 
I think that's it for right now. Thanks. Yes. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, I'll just get a little bit more granular here. Um, in uh, Commissioner uh, comments and as it relates to Pop Warner specifically, and I think this relates to sort of the, the larger area in general. You talked about 14,000 trips a day generated by a park. I believe that's the right figure. Um, I think overall, yeah. including the retail, I think it was 36 or 37,000. 30, okay, 37. Yeah. So yeah. <clears throat> how much, knowing the tenants that you have in most of your parks, how does that split between Monday through Friday and Saturday and Sunday when something like Pop Warner might be going on? Yeah, obviously the retail portion of those groups, <coughs> you know, will fall in line with, you know, weekend uh, travel. But the bulk of those trips that we look at on the industrial. So, you know, again, we, we survey all of our tenants. Um, we did that 12 to 14 million square foot. Uh, portfolio analysis from a traffic perspective. So we know that, um, you know, maybe 15% to 20% of our tenants um, will actually work on the weekends. Most do not. So if you come to our park um, during the week, uh, during the weekend, it's it's essentially vacant. There's no traffic down there. We have one or two tenants that, that do work. Um, and so the, the peak hours for a generator, you know, building uh, use, versus the peak hours for you know people coming home from work or going to work in the mornings, those are offset uh, specifically. And we know that by doing our analysis, but we know it just by talking to tenants. Tenants specifically want that offset. So they want their staff to be able to come in and out um, without being in rush hour traffic. And then they also stage their deliveries and truck traffic kind of even before that so that they have an opportunity so that those trucks aren't coming in during shift change. So we know that, you know, a typical peak hour on a roadway like um, at I-70 and, and Jackson in the PM peak is probably 445 to 545 is a typical peak hour. Um, the peak hour for our generators is usually 230 to 330, so it's offset significantly from that. So the effects of our traffic on, on that rush hour is, you know, usually pretty minimal, and this is why people will say like, well, I, I leave work um, every day at, you know, 5 30, 6 o'clock. I, I see no uh, major traffic getting in and out, no trucks or anything like that. And, you know, and we don't have a traffic signal uh, at our main entrance. We, it's, it's essentially stopped controlled. The parkway goes all the way through. And, you know, we have yet to meet warrants with, you know, this, the park built out on both sides, which is effectively about 10 million square feet. Um, we have yet to meet the traffic signal warrants. So, you know, that's a positive in that regard because that means that peak hour, people coming to work or going, you know, in the morning or going home at night are completely missing the peak traffic from our use. So those are staggered by several hours pretty typically. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Go ahead. A uh, question for City. Uh, when was the last time that you guys have been aware of a company that would be willing to invest $1 billion in independence? I haven't had that experience. <laughs> okay, thank I you. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask Dr. Snodgrass to come back to the podium. Can we do that? You're in your question and answer portion, so certainly okay. the commission can bring someone back. Welcome back. Thank you, doctor. Several commenters have mentioned labor, labor shortage, what labor pool is going to be available. I know you and Dr. Earl talk regularly, and you have some idea about what comes from independent school district and what will come forth from Fort Osage. Talk about the availability of a workforce and, and what the stream is in your mind in meeting the needs, the existing and future. Thank you, Absolutely. Doctor. We have an a initiative at Fort Osage School District called Real World Learning Opportunities. So what we're trying to do is make sure every student who walks across that stage at Community Christ Auditorium walks out and has an opportunity um, to succeed. So we have different opportunities for students, whether it's college-bound students who take dual credit courses in high school that preps them for college or AP courses, or whether it's our Career and Technology Center where we offer 18 programs, 
or, and we continue to add uh, programming. This year we added HVAC, um, we added um, welding a few years ago. And so we're making sure that we're providing opportunities for students to join the workforce. I think the biggest piece of the puzzle is just making sure um, that what, the, what I've seen in the conversations I've had is there are a lot of folks who are driving right past that side as we speak and traveling beyond the, the uh, city limits of independence going to other locations. So we're not only talking about students, we're also talking about parents and folks who live in our school district. Um, and so I don't know if I answered your question, but um, ultimately the way I see it, it would be on the tax revenue that we look to uh, receive as a school district. More importantly, I believe we're providing additional opportunities for jobs for students as well as they um, enter the, as they graduate. The other thing I mentioned originally also is we have, um, we wanna provide opportunities for students to partner with industry. And so with that, we have an internship opportunity for students to partner with the companies that might come in, those tenants, and provide those uh, spaces for them to partner and um, create opportunities for those kids. Can you also, sorry if I interrupted, can you also repeat again what the benefit to the school district is? And it's Independence, Fort Osage, and does Blue Springs benefit? It is Blue Springs, um, Independence, and Fort Osage School District. Okay, can you, do you know the, I know you know your numbers. I don't know, um, I know that Fort Osage School District has approximately half the square footage. Okay. Um, I believe Independence is um, the next square footage wise in Blue Springs looks to have the least amount of square footage, but I do not know their um, complete tax um, exactly like, like I do ours. And what was yours again? $32 million. We currently receive $3,250 on that, on the property in Fort Osage School District. And so if you do the math out um, over that time, you're looking over 100, just over $100,000 over 33 years, 107,000. You're all, so you're looking at over $32 million over 33 years. Madam Chair, if I could yes. just, I have a question myself on the relevance of this to the rezoning my question would be is are we talking about the idea here that with the rezoning we are looking to provide uh, a, a source for community members to work on i guess I'm, I'm i'm missing what the relevance of the questions on the education to the rezoning is if we do not have a sufficiency in labor force this whole project is gonna collapse because there's not enough workers. Not their level of education, and that's not my real question. My real question, bottom line, is will there be a, in your estimate, will there be a sufficiency in labor force to meet the need? Yeah, we, you know, we have approximately 380 students graduate every year. And so we find that most students um, stay in this area. They live in this area, they grow up in this area. It is not uncommon for most of the folks who have students in our school district, graduated from Fort Osage School District or uh, local districts, and so they look to stay in this area. And so through this opportunity, I believe that this would create just a, a better opportunity for those folks to have a work, um, a, a work opportunity. In other words, the labor that is coming forth each year and those who would work closer to home, we should not have a problem in terms of meeting the demand. That, that's a, you know, that's a challenging question. Yeah. I wish I had a crystal ball, um, but I... You are um, a doctor, aren't you? <laughs> well, we only have to rezone this, so. <laughs> I would not think so, but I don't have a crystal ball on that. Thank you, doctor. You bet. Thank you, thank you. Are there any other questions from commissioners of city or the North Point? Okay, I would entertain a motion. Uh, Madam Chairman, at this point you should close the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Okay.
Any more discussion? Uh, Sorry about that. Uh, Just a reminder, we have three motions and three votes, right. well, actually, starting with in, in the industrial. Okay. If, if I could, Madam Chairman, so one of the speakers did raise an issue that needs to be addressed before there's deliberation or vote on, on this issue. Okay. So it, that speaker indicated that there were at least, I think we, we understood that there were two members of the Community of Christ Church that are on the commission. Is that correct? Is there anyone else? Okay. I'm going to start with uh, Commissioner Ferguson. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson, you are a member of the Community of Christ Church. Okay. Are, uh, do you have any other roles with the church? Uh, is there any reason that you personally would benefit if the church were to sell property? Do you get any money or get any specific benefit to yourself in any way? Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, I'm going to ask you the same questions. Uh, are, are you a member of Community of Christ Church? Yes. Okay, do you have any other roles at the church? I'm a pastor. You're a pastor. Are you paid for that role? No. You're not paid. No. Uh, would you have any reason that if the church were to sell any property uh, in relation to this, that you would get or your family would get any sort of you know specific monetary benefit to you? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Based on the information provided, there's no conflict of interest with respect to these commissioners uh, deliberating and voting on this matter. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any discussion between us? Any Madam thoughts? Chair. Yes, sir. Well, the way I see it, it looks like the long range plan was always to do industrial down here. I do see where we tried to put some residential back into the area, but it never did happen. So, I mean, they seem to be asking, answering all the questions we give them. Uh, if they follow through with it, it's the next thing, but we can't decide that, and we don't know that, because that is in the future. We just have to go by his word that he will follow up with what we've asked him and what people have asked him. And they seem to have the correct answers for a lot of this stuff, so I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I think uh, our esteemed... Commissioner, Mr. Preston kind of put our commission, uh, our commission's purpose to the forefront because um, there were points that were brought up by, you know, pros and people for it and people against it, but, um, you know, just they are a local company. Um, I obviously would love to see local workers, but, like, those things aren't up to us. And I would say that tonight was amazing and it was fun, but you know what is going to be more fun is the city council meeting when they actually have to decide these things. And so it was kind of, tonight was kind of practice for everyone because that's when things really get determined. Um, but I think with a company like this having 200 million square feet in the Kansas City area, I doubt that independence is going to be uh, is going to be the one that doesn't work out for them. But um, as far as so, as far as rezoning and the things that we get to determine, uh, I'm glad we get to do it, and I hope that all made sense. I'm two and a half hours past my bedtime, and I haven't had dinner, so I'm having Taco Bell. If anybody wants to go with me, Mad Madam Chair. Yes, sir. I think Dr. Snodgrass said it perfectly. We don't have a crystal ball, but I was on this commission when we previously entertained um, a potential business park or industrial park. What I've seen tonight has been an incredible preparation, an incredible commitment to interfacing with the residents, albeit not everyone saw the oversized sign. I, I think what we've got here is an opportunity of a lifetime. I have to say that, otherwise I would feel I failed to do what I should have done. There is a partnership here that is in evidence. It is a partnership of city management and this incredible planning commission staff. I honestly believe if one is willing to commit $1 billion, there's probably going to be some follow through. I believe that. I honestly and sincerely believe that. I just want to applaud the incredible work to get this project to this point. And obviously it has the attention of the city council because at least four council persons are here tonight, even at this hour. 
in incredible kudos to the city, to the staff, and I confess, even to uh, the city attorney. Even the city attorney. I yield back, Madam Chair. He knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll, go ahead. I, I, will, I will be more succinct um, in refocusing back to the purpose of approving this rezoning. I think what we're approving here is an opportunity for the city and the city's residents to advance ourselves. Um, that is the focus of our work here tonight, uh, is the rezoning, and I think we are setting ourselves up for success and pushing the city forward. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yeah, let me wait. One, unless you're gonna make another comment. No, no, come in. No, I just, I, I think for me, it's always green space and protecting the nature, because that is an important thing to me, but I feel like my questions got answered. I'm really, really impressed with the green space with the thought that's gone into the filtration, the thought that's gone into the, the floodplain areas. I'm, I'm really happy because I too like to go right on the bike path and take my grandkids to the river. And I am, the Pop Warner field is very sentimental to me. And uh, so I am glad that that's um, gonna get some attention. And I, I also have confidence that they will think about that. We'll be watching. Madam but, Chair, yes. before I make a motion, we have to applaud the residents of Independence. I mean, absolutely incredible. The number of people are in this chamber post midnight building a vision for this city. It's incredible. It is. We applaud you. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. In the matter of case number 22-100-03, rezoning of Little Blue and 78 Highway and surrounding areas from single family residential plan unit development to C2 general commercial and to uh, industrial one industrial I move for approval is there a second I second thank you Commissioner Wiley okay we are ready for a vote <clears throat> this is for the I-1 zoning part <clears throat> Commissioner Ferguson yes Commissioner Michelle yes Commissioner Nesbitt yes Commissioner Wiley yes Commissioner Young yes Commissioner Preston? Yes. Chairman Klein. Yes. Klein. Case number 22-100-03, rezoning Little Blue Parkway slash M78 Highway is approved. Okay. Next case. Next case. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. In the matter of case number 22-125, Dash zero two rezoning from R six and C one to BP PUD and approve. Remove for approval as presented. With conditions. With the stipulations as recommended by the Planning Commission staff without mods. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Commissioner Ferguson. And we're ready for a vote. Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. And Chair McLean? Yes. Case number 22-125-02, rezoning at 220226. Artie Mize Road and approximately 2411 South Little Blue Parkway has been approved with recommendations. Next case, 2512503. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair. Yes, sir. In the matter of case 22-125-03, rezoning uh, from C2 plan unit development to business park plan unit development and approval of a preliminary development plan for properties at Little Blue Parkway, Truman Road, and M78 highway intersections. 
Uh, I move for approval with the recommendations as made by staff in the report. Is there a second? Second, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for a vote. <laughs> Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? Yes. Commissioner Preston? Yes. Chair McLean? Yes. Case 22-125-03, rezoning East Truman Road slash M78 Highway, Little Boo Parkway, with city recommendations has passed. Thank you, everybody. Okay, other business. We are not done. <laughs> Whose idea we... was this? <laughs> Madam Capital Ch improvements. Rick? Madam Chair, I would uh, ask the commission if uh, there would be a motion to accept the CIP as presented. I'd be able to answer so any moved, questions Madam you Chair. may have. We have a motion to approve. Is there second. a second? <laughs> and did you catch that, Paul Michelle? Second. I have comments. So, okay. <laughs> I have a couple of them I'd like to have taken off. Capital improvements. Let me find them. Uh, Nolan Road and Lynn's Court intersection, 112302. I'd like to have that removed. Do I have to make a motion for that or what? Yep. So I'd like, so I'd like, so what do we need to do here? Because I'd like to have that removed. Uh, make a motion. Okay, Madam Chair, then I make a motion. I mean, I'm, we're in the middle of something, so I didn't know what we need. Right. To so, so there was a motion and a second to uh, approve I know. as submitted. You're essentially amending the motion, amending the motion to yes. uh, uh, to modify that in order to take an item off. Correct. And so, so then the the yeah. question to the to the rest of the commission would be is whether they want to take that item off. I mean, we're looking at an intersection that is, they want to straighten out that is really part of a, it's not even part of the city, which is what I don't understand why we are doing this. I mean, because that Lynn Court, basically, I don't know if anybody knows what this is. They're basically, we're down at Nolan Road down there where they built the new Andes. And basically, they want to straighten the road out, which has been that way for 30 years since Kmart was there and the development company. It's a privately owned company that owns that property. And we're wanting us to pay, well, almost $800,000 for something on, on there to straighten it out. And that's not the total cost, which I can't understand why we're doing something like that. Um, nobody's, I mean, I don't know where this came from, but I like to get it taken off. Um. I, I can kind of answer briefly a little bit about the history of that project. When Andes came in to the city, uh, municipal services um, discussed with them the abilities to realign that intersection. If you look across Nolan Road, obviously it's offset. One of the problems that MoDOT has had with that particular location is when vehicles come off of I-70, uh, they can't time the signals in such a way without creating a little bit more of a backup onto the bridge over, over I-70. And so when Andes came in, uh, there was a negotiation for some right of way to be able to eventually line that up with the intersection across the road um, to help better facilitate that um, traffic movement. And so that is the, the purpose of that project. Yeah, but like say, that is on the owners. The owners should be doing that, not us. I can see maybe the street lights be straightened out, but why would we have to pay for the pavement over there on that side? Because you're not going to do the other side because it's already there. That's, why, that's what bothers me is why we were going to spend millions of dollars down there to do something that's on somebody else's property. If they wanted it done, they should have did it on their dime, Rick, not I've our dime. Rick, I've got a question. Go ahead. So you said that they deeded part of their property to the city they Correct. granted to the city is right away correct so we we were enriched by that additional property and 
and ultimately, do you feel that this project is improving the public safety of the citizens of Independence? That was the original intent for asking um, Andy's when they came in to do so, yes. Thank you. But Andy's doesn't own it, don't they? Do they own it or do they rent it? No. So part of Lynn Court is actually part of that development um, that's there with the old Kmart. And uh -huh. so one of the things that municipal services has been um, trying to do is negotiate that portion of Lynn Court to be able to make those improvements. So you're saying that we own it now? No, not yet. So we do not own it. So why are we spending money on it then? That's uh, what again, they have that in their capital plan for next year. Um, one of the things about the capital improvement program is that it is fluid. There is an anticipation to be able to do that project next year. Um, that may or may not happen. It could change. Uh, that is one of the things about um, the capital improvements program, when they start looking at their budgeting, they want to make sure that whatever, any of the projects that are in this document um, are essentially proposed for those particular years. Um, at any given time, they may have to change. Um, but so they may not be able to do it next year, but it is in there as being proposed for next year. That's, I'd still like to have it taken off. I mean, that's my opinion because. So, so you so, moved something. Yeah, I moved that right. way. So well, is there I a say, second to the amendment? Second? Right. I apologize. I'm not as sharp as I would have been maybe six or eight hours ago. Uh, when we have a motion, we need to have a second before we have the discussion. Once you've had, it, so because if it dies for lack of a second, then it's not something that will be brought forward to the to the body. If it's something that is seconded, then it can be brought forward to the body for discussion, and then you can vote on it at that point. So I, uh, okay. <laughs> I made a procedural mistake there. Sorry. Is, is so it, at this point, we do need a second before we really would continue at any point on on on, the on Commission Member Nesbitt's motion. Okay. Is there a second? Oh, okay. Before we go any no. further, who made the original motion? I, I made Nesbitt. the motion. Oh, the they original made, original no. or Nes the amendment? No. He made the original. I seconded. Okay. Seconded. Yeah. Okay. Then I'm say an amendment to it. Sorry. Question, staff. Is it your recommendation that we approve it? Yes. And I think that recommendation is yes. Yes, it is, actually. Yes. And you've reviewed it, and you've found it worthy of, of the investment? Um, when talking with municipal services, that is yes. But what reservations do you have that we would pull it back? Uh, I, I have none. Then my, my motion stands. Yep. The second stand. I mean, it's a, well, he, he's made a motion. I made a motion to table that. <coughs> to amend. So, so we had a motion and a second to approve as submitted. As submitted. Before that was voted on, we have a second motion to remove one of the items, which essentially would be an amendment to yeah. the motion that you approved you approve it as submitted. Okay, so at this point, there's a, there's a motion on the floor to make an amendment, essentially to remove one of the items. Yeah. And the question is whether there's another commissioner that wants to second that amendment to take that out. No. I guess not. Madam Chair, hearing none, then hearing that would none. die for lack of a second. So that remove, that takes us back to, we have in front of the, the commission, we have a motion and a second to approve the CIP plan as submitted. Okay. Now. Now, Commissioner, <laughs> pa pardon me for jumping in. No, here, I'm so glad. Commissioner Nesbitt, yes. if you have a list of other items that you would like I to have, have discussed, more. you have one more? Yes. Okay, then same situation. Right. Make your motion. We'll see if there's a second. Okay. I make a motion that we look at the square streetscape phase one and have it removed from the item. Madam Chair, just call for a second on that. Is there a second? Do we, do we, so, what, so do the we question, your why he the, wants to do that? That's, or? that's for the discussion. So you, so if, you, if somebody wants to hear the reason why you second it, you have your discussion and then you vote on whether or not to do the removal. Given that it's 12, 18, <laughs> I would love to hear your reason in about one minute or less. I need a second. Is that a second? No, second? You have to second it. You got to second it. I got to second it. Oh, you got to second it to hear the reason? No. Yeah. 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 To hear the reason. <laughs> oh. Then he, I retract, sir. Oh, okay. All you have to do is second it, and all we, all we got to do is vote on it. 
The, is there all a the second, second? All, all the second does is bring it up for discussion. You then, you then would vote on whether you want to remove it or not, if, if, if it's before the body. Yeah, so if you want to talk about it, you can second it. I'll just say that I've been waiting for the streetscape improvements to happen for a long, long time. I'll leave it at that. There's no second. Hearing none, okay. we're going to go back to the original motion and the original second. May, we're ready for a vote. Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? No. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Preston? Yes. Chair McLean? Yes. Capital Improvements Program for fiscal years 2022 to 2028 has been approved. Okay. Next meeting is April 22nd. Is there anything else for the greater good anybody wants to tell anybody? Who's left in the room? Where's the cut? Did we have to put the minutes from the... We, we did, did that. It. We did it. Yeah, where was our... We did it. Up top, it's consent. <laughs> that was a long time ago. April 22nd, the month off. All right. If April 22nd is too soon. April 22nd is too soon. All right. If there... <laughs> and we're having it here, right? Yes, we are back in. When is the next one? April 22nd. No, April 12th. April 12th. I was going to say, I didn't April think 22nd seemed a little long. Oh, sorry. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. April 12th. April 12th. Thank my glasses aren't even working anymore. Okay. This meeting is adjourned. Uh -huh.